Hello and welcome to the Formula Pro Series on R Factor 2 and it's the final round and what a season it's been. We are going to begin here at Silverstone as always live. I am joined by and for the very last time as well yeah. the, by the very lovely and he's nodding Lewis McGlade. Lewis I hello. I lovely. You are lovely. You. <laughs> um, we are at Laguna Seca for our final round but we've been in Spa, Monza, Daytona, Donington, Circuit d'Azur and obviously here at Laguna Seca. Um, what a season it has been. I wasn't here for the last round but we had Jeffrey Reitfeld who was our first repeat victor of the season so I missed I missed a good race. Yeah. What's been your favourite race? this season Ooh, uh, maybe Monza I mean I, I've, to be fair I've really enjoyed uh, quite a few of the ones mm. that we, we've had this season Monza was a, was a classic Daytona was one that could have delivered a little bit more obviously with the wet weather coming in but it's been a great season uh, so far this final race has a lot to go for it we've got strategy that's up in the air we've got a championship that realistically is a seven way fight for the drivers championship and a two way fight on the team side of things really so there's a little bit of a chance for a third but it's most likely between the top two of Team Redline and Oracle Red Bull Racing. It's been a great season. It all builds up to this. Also, we'll have a little bit of something special uh, after uh, this as well with the relegation to see which new teams are going to join us uh, in Formula Pro for 2023. Yes, yeah, so when we finish um, our, our, our race this evening, please don't go anywhere because we have the relegation race. Now, uh, Lewis, obviously, we will be talking about it as the, uh, as the uh, show goes on, but explain uh, very briefly to us what is the relegation race? Yeah, so uh, obviously we've got 12 teams uh, mm. in Formula Pro. Now, uh, the bottom two in the championship will head off to relegation. Uh, and then the top three from Formula Challenge, which has already been decided, we've already got our champion in Christian Mikel, uh, will be allowed to bring along a teammate and they'll all go head to head over three races uh, a bit later on. Uh, and basically it's like a, a championship, a mini championship in it. And the top two teams from that will join us on the grid next year. It could be the two that go down, uh, that are in the bottom two of the championship, they can still fight their way back in. That's mm -hmm. the exciting bit from them. But also we could see our, uh, our new teams as well join the grid and it's gonna be very thrilling. And no firm favorites. Which is what I like. No, oh, oh. no, 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 yeah, no, 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 comment, no okay, comment. Okay, okay, no that's comment. good, that's good. Well, <laughs> um, let's have a quick look at the calendar. Um, as I said, well, six races, this marks six races uh, today. We started uh, back in May um, and it's flown by. So let's have a quick look. So, um, yes, well, we started off, like I said, um, at Spa, um, all those, I'll say all those months ago, a few months ago, then we head over to um, Monza, which was a very exciting race. Daytona was in the 6th of June, Donington Park, um, Circuit de Zor, which saw Jeffrey Reitfield, as I mentioned, uh, take the crown in the first repeat victor um, this season and ending with Laguna Seca and Lewis Laguna Seca. You are, well, we spoke earlier, very excited about this circuit because you said it's quite hard on the tires. Oh yeah, she oh. eats tires. Uh, it's 3.6 <laughs> uh, kilometers in length. It's a very, very short circuit. It'd be the shortest lap time we deal with uh, all season. They are under a minute uh, around here. It is an extremely difficult circuit at the best of times and strategy is wide open. I really can't wait. Well, we've got the format explainer now, so let's uh, take a look. Formula Pro 2022 Explained, featuring 12 of the very best teams on the R Factor 2 platform battling it out for the championship. Six rounds across our season as we venture to some of the greatest tracks on the planet as they battle for a $50,000 prize pool. We visit Spa-Francorchamps, we visit Monza, we then head to the Daytona Road Course before going to the brand new Donington Park Grand Prix, then the Circuit d'Azur and our season finale at Laguna Seca. Relegation at the end of the season will play two cars against the Formula Challenge champions. Every round features a mandatory pit stop with the required use of two different compounds to the running of the race and success ballast will be dished out to the top three drivers in the championship at the increments of 10, 7 and 4 kilograms. Push to pass is also available in the race for 60 seconds to give a boost of around 55 brake horsepower. Cars will enter Park Ferme after qualifying with limited changes being allowed to the setup. Drivers will also start the race on the same compound as their fastest lap in qualifying and race control will monitor the racing action. 
So there we go, that's Formula Pro explained for you there. Um, and we've got so much more still to come. It's going to be an incredibly exciting final round. I feel we're going to see racing that we haven't seen before. I think uh, it's, it, there's an excitement in the air for Sean, especially it being at Laguna Seca. So we, we've spoken uh, about the race. So let's have a quick look at the teams and drivers. Um, and also, I want to ask you, when we have the teams and drivers up, who surprised you the most? Well, I mean, from, from the team side of things, Oracle Rail Racing Esports have really mm. uh, performed this season. Uh, now, from that side, they've done such a good job to keep themselves within championship contention. They've got both drivers in Dennis Jordan and Alex Siebel also mm. uh, right up there in championship contention. From the disappointing side of things, though, I think that's another thing to, to really look at is that Williams Esports are much further down than realistically they should be. Uh, they're down actually in that relegation battle. And also uh, the uh, Mercedes-AMG Petronas Esports yeah. team, considering that they were from a, a driver side of things, they were the champions last season. Uh, Risto Cap is looking very smart today there uh, in the bottom right. We can see our drivers that will be racing. You've got Ibrahim Khan with his interesting uh, set up there in the middle bottom <laughs> of your screen. You've got your, uh, where is your series champion of last year in the form uh, of Bonner House. I don't actually see him. No. Maybe I am. Oh, just... yeah. Oh, yeah. No, he's not there. Oh, yeah. I can see his... Oh, yeah, he's not there. there. That's, that's, that's why. That is yeah, why. He, that's why he's gone off to the loo. Uh, Yone Simicic, of course, the driver who's uh, battling for the championship, just a single point off in the uh, top and uh, one away from the right-hand side. Dennis Jordan, another one who's uh, in contention for that title. Also, a couple of uh, new drivers on there. Jan Wojnitsa, who will be joining from the NetRex Grand Prix team uh, as well, replacing Laurent Kearsmakers, uh, along with uh, Colin Spork, as well as the return of Erhan Yovsky. It's going to be very exciting. Well, um, let's have a little recap of what happened last time out. One hour of racing ahead. It's going to be breathless action as the penultimate round of the Formula Pro Series 2022 is about to get underway. Already smoking on the grid as that was a poor launch from Ibrahim Khan from third. He's going to be attacked by Kevin Siggy who'll race his way around the outside for turn one. A big send from a couple of the burst drivers on the inside at Saint Devot as we head up Beau Rivage towards Massenet. It was a good launch though from our pole sitter. This is on board with Dennis Jordan. You've got uh, Bonnerhouse there on the right hand side. Ooh, that is a naughty squeeze from Bonnerhouse. They are risking the wrath of race control as well because it's quite distracting and now he's looking oh my god David Marocek that move was never on not in a million years directly ahead of David Ooh. Marocek and that's why because he's getting around the outside of Marcel Chinchik oh my goodness me you say you can't overtake around the streets of Circuit Azure but they're both proving this wrong up towards the back Marocek around the outside into the barrier he's still going though there's going to be a lot of damage and he just cuts across the nose of Marcel Chinchik and they are all in the fence behind yeah I think Chinchik lifted Marocek didn't leave enough room yeah and, I, I don't yeah. know what Marocek I get it, because it's a tricky section, but I don't know what Marocek was really thinking. And, uh, Rocket Sinsports cars in there again, and a lovely, absolutely delightful slow-mo. It's very serene until you realise that there is a lot of contact happening here. They're battling, especially when it's for a championship. There is going to be... Oh, big mistake from Jernay Simicic. My goodness, Dennis Jordan nearly uh, clouted the rear end. Of that. that was a bit of a dramatic moment with Dennis Jordan as well. Colin Sport is very aggressive, it's and it's it. going to be a move down the inside of the Novell chicane. It's a big send, but Colin Sport has been able to make it sticky. He tried that a few times yesterday, but after some moves in the breaking zone, wasn't able to do it uh, on Michi Hoyer. But that attempt did work on first try today. This is Paige, and this will be why he's retired. So he's coming now towards the last engine? Is that engine failure? Yeah, it looks oh, like it's it. Not, yeah, but it's not box? smoking. Oh, no, it's smoking. Never oh, mind. Yeah. I'll cancel that opinion. Ooh. Oh, my God, mate, please escape. Because he, he's not in that relegation battle at all. So, yeah, it's an interesting dynamic. It'll be down to Patel whether he wants Ooh. to make that move as Dennis Jordan gets so close to his team Redline rival and it's fair to say this is the championship at the line here. There is going to be no new winner here today. Jeffrey Rietveld becomes the first repeat winner of 2022. Jeffrey Rietveld is on top once again and he snatches the championship lead with it. Jeffrey Rietveld on top once again in the Formula Pro Series. And he takes the win ahead of Alex Siebel and Bonner House. A completely dominant performance from Rietveld. Well, that was last time out at Circuit de Zool, and it really does show that the smallest mistake at that particular circuit can make a whole world of, of difference to, yeah. to the uh, race results. Um, I missed a good end there. I really did. There was a lot of drama. Yeah. I mean, for, uh, for a race around uh, you know, Circuit de Zool, which we mm. all know, street circuit, tight one, once you've done with uh, qualifying, you've got pole position, it's like goodbye, it's a boring race. And it kind yeah. of was for Jeffrey Rietveld. He took pole position and then just disappeared off. He, he was 20 seconds easy. ahead. Textbook. But everything behind was, to be honest, a bit chaotic yeah yeah absolutely brilliant uh well let's have a quick look at the championship standings 
Yes, indeed. Jeffrey Rietveld on top, and this is what I'm talking about with this seven-way fight. There's 36 points for a race victory. Jeffrey Rietveld holding the top of the championship at 139, with Yone Simicic just a single point behind. Bonner House a few further points back. Now, Kevin Siggy, who's fourth in the championship, is expected to potentially even be the favourite. Despite being seven points off, he has no ballast in his car. Dennis Jordan and Alex Siebel also just about within contention. And Marcel Cinchik, who had a poor round with a retirement in the previous race, is 35 points off the race win, uh, after the championship lead, rather. Uh, he still has a mathematical chance of taking that title. It's just a very, very long shot, but still seven in it after six races. That's so exciting. So it's all for the win. Yeah, absolutely incredible. We'll look at some of the drivers a bit further down who uh, maybe haven't had the greatest season. Gianmarco Fedici and Nuno Pinto, they'll be battling to uh, keep themselves in. The Bicolos Burst uh, eSports team, David Morocek had a poor round last time, got involved in an awful lot of contact. Ibrahim Khan, though, with a super qualifying uh, last time, could see what he can do. 13th in the championship, Marco Pejic, uh, who's looked quite fast in practice after rejoining us here uh, in Formula Pro, obviously, during the previous season. And now we can see the team's championship. Now, realistically, it's between the top two. Team Redline and Oracle Red Bull Racing Esports separated by just 20 points. And of course, Oracle Red Bull Racing Esports with zero ballast between either uh, of their drivers, if memory serves. And Jeffrey Rietveld right up there as we can see the race circuit uh, that we'll be racing here today. Of course, it is Laguna Seca, 3.6 kilometers in length, 2.2 miles over the 11 turns. But there are some crackers uh, on here. You've got the one coming down into Andretti, that one being turn two. Of course, you've got seven, eight, and uh, 8A if you really want to be fully up to date with the American race circuits uh, and that one being the corkscrew and number nine being the rainy curves a great move coming down into T11 uh, that's a great overtaking opportunity as we'll head to live pictures from Laguna Seca for our season finale our final qualifying session of the season as we'll see Kevin Siggy he's on his time lap he's coming around turn five now and up towards turn six turn six on this circuit is absolutely pinned if you get the right line it's just about right you can see there, Siggy picking it up nicely. No ballast uh, on this car as he races his way towards the corkscrew. Really throws it in as they head down the hill towards Rainy Curve. What time is this going to be from Kevin Siggy as he's got two more corners to tick off and they are fast ones. Turn 10, got to watch out for that sausage curve on the right-hand side and then into the heavy braking zone at the final corner as they punch it out towards the line. It's going to be a sub-minute lap time from Kevin Siggy as he races his way up. But it's going to be a 58. What is a 58.298? The first lap time of this session. He's ahead of Dennis Jordan by nearly half a second. John Monroe joins me in the commentary booth. This is going to be thrilling. It absolutely is, Lewis. And I am absolutely delighted to be sat here in the commentary box for this one because we have got an exciting race uh, up ahead of us here. I think jeopardy for me is the main word with Laguna. So many corners that can catch you out. Difficult overtaking opportunities, but the drivers are going to be desperate tonight. So I think we're going to see some very interesting stuff. I believe so. As David Morocek has a bit of a moment on the exit uh, of the corkscrew, he'll rejoin. He was 1.2 seconds down after the first sector, and I don't think he's going to go particularly fast on this lap uh, as Jeffrey Rietveld, half a second off uh, of the pole, 0.494 uh, off of his teammate on his first time lap. There is Ibrahim Khan. You can see the poor first sector means that he is going to be returning to pit lane uh, after a super qualifying session uh, in the previous round. Was He He was third on the grid, wasn't he? It was, it was in second or third. I think it might have actually been second for the BS competition team. Again, incredible. Stuff. Yeah, and, and that's been a kind of theme of Ibrahim's season, really. I mean, he's been he's been really quick in qualifying. He's showing his potential. He's slipping backwards in the races. But to be fair, he did a really good job last time out until the pit stop. That's when it all went wrong for Ibrahim Khan. So speaking of pit stops, in he comes. And we jump to Marco Pech instead, who is just on his outlap at the moment, lining himself up for a good one. Mercedes AMG, of course, he came in halfway through the season after a very disappointing first half for Jarno Otmir, which was a real shame for everyone watching, because I know that everyone wanted to see Jarno doing well. But Marco's filled the boot as well. He's come in and scored some points, which is what needed to happen in that second Mercedes seat. Unfortunately, though, it's far too late for them when it comes to the team standings, and that was a lovely slide out of turn one. Yeah, like I say, and the, the issue, the irritation potentially with the uh, Mercedes AMG Fraternity Esports team is that they won the championship last year, and you know, there was a lot of frustration uh, in the camp at the start of the year that they've not been performing to the level that we would expect uh, from such a prestigious team and from our team's champions. Of course, it was Bonner House and Marco Pejic that took 
the chequered flag and the top honours, uh, of course, in the team's standings, which is what pays out the prize money. That's what you need to be aiming for. It's not the driver's side of things. All of that is dealt with over the team side. It's why when we caught up with Jeffrey Rietveld after that victory, he said, well, I don't really care about the driver's championship. I'm only talking about the money. Well, uh, yeah, the initial response to that was surprise because, you know, drivers are normally pretty, you know, they're pretty selfish. They want to win, go to win the driver's championship, but... As you say, in this kind of situation, as we see David Morocek continuing the form of uh, Cote d'Azur, unfortunately, with a spin in qualifying, um, but he will continue and hopefully no harm done. But yeah, yeah, as you say, it's, it's strange to hear a driver talking about the team championship, but that is what the money is at stake for. And it's a lot of money, it has to be said as well, for these sim racers. This is, you know, th this is their life, this is their career, and they're, they're going to want to make as much as possible, so it really does matter to them. And of course, Redline are in a great position for both teams and drivers. Yes, indeed. Well, Adam Maguire, who's had a pretty decent season thus far, has qualified in the top 10 three times with a second at Spa, a seventh and an eighth uh, at Monza and Donington, respectively. He moves up into seventh position uh, at the moment but with a time that's 1.2 seconds off uh, over a lap time that is just 58 seconds long. I can tell you for free that is not competitive. Bonner House, one of our championship rivals down in sixth position. As we look at Yerne Simoncic, the driver with seven kilos uh, on board as he races his way up towards uh, the corkscrew and look how much it drops down. Yeah, and he just bounces perfectly from one curb to the other. Really, really good commitment from Simoncic. Very neat and tidy as well. Uh, I can't believe how quick the lap times are. It's looking really fast. He dipped a couple of wheels on the exit, though, coming through T10. But this is actually looking like a very decent time for someone with that success bar. Jan Vojnitsa uh, on his debut goes up into seventh position in the number 44. And Yone Simoncic a couple of tenths off of the pole with Marcel Cincic gone up to second position. Yone Simoncic goes in to third. Alex Siebel up towards the line. Really good first and final. Disappointing though in that second sector but still manages to make his way up to third position. Yeah, it's going to be so close as well with the lap times this, you know, um, short. Sorry to cough a second. Well, <laughs> sorry about that. Yes. So, yeah, the, the, the lap being this short and obviously the lap times being this quick, uh, you know, it's going to keep things really, really close because obviously you've got less time to actually make a difference. You know, like we see at likes of Spa, you've got lots of corners where you can gain or lose a bit of time. Around here, there's really not much. It's a bit like watching an Austrian Grand Prix qualifying session, for example, where pretty much any driver can get to the top. And as we see, Erhan Jofsky, now we had some problems in practice, Lewis. We saw him struggling with that curb and, uh, yeah, it didn't seem to go well for him that time. Now, remember, he's got to get back to pit lane uh, as of well. Course. They can't just escape out on circuit, so hopefully it did look like uh, both the uh, front wheels were intact, so he might be able to drag his way back. But this is the return uh, for Erhan Jofsky. They did actually have a big uh, big chat with him uh, on, uh, on Friday uh, morning uh, in London, and he was saying that, you know, he's had some struggles with, with sim racing generally and stuff, but uh, he's making his return. Uh, was originally supposed to be, was originally slated to be off for the for this race as well as the previous race at Circuit this year, but making a return. Um, we'll keep our fingers crossed that it'll be a hefty return, because I remember in the final race of last season, I guess it was at Monza, but he put on an absolutely stunning performance, uh, racing very hard uh, against Jeffrey Rietveld and against this man here, Bonnerhaus, the number one. Is this going to be the last time that we see him in the number one? Are we going to see him in the number one next? season. We'll have to wait and see because Bonnerhaus is going to race his way towards the line and start a lap, John. It, I mean, it's still possible. He's sitting P3 in the standings right now with 134 points. So miraculously, he's only five points off championship leader Jeffrey Rietveld, despite having never won a race. And this is crazy because obviously Bono took the title last year winning every race. It's totally feasible that Bono could win the title today, having not won any of the races. So that would be remarkable. You can see full commitment there through the opening section of the lap, through towards turn five. Slight banking on this one, but he hits the curve perfectly, got on the power early, let the car drag the way all the way out. He's only less than a tenth down. And this corner here is absolutely flat out in these cars. There's so much downforce at this speed. They can carry the speed. Obviously, that's what makes the sausage curve on the inside so dangerous as Bono now heads yeah. through the corkscrew. Yeah, like I say, they're, uh, they're pinned through there. They might not be, though, through the race, because I think we're going to be talking of tyre safety. Uh, as well through the running of the 60-minute race uh, a bit later on. Decent in the second sector there. Bonnerhaus is coming up towards the final corner again with him being third. And the champion means he's got four kilos uh, on board as he races his way towards the line. And you can see as wow. he heads up to it, decent final sector. Good enough for third position uh, at the moment on the grid, but still a long way behind Kevin Siggy, the teammate of this man here, the driver that's on maximum ballast, the two-time race winner in 2022. 
two, it's Jeffrey Rietveld, and he's racing his way through the second sector. Yeah, it's very strange to be going into the champ, and he's lost it all, actually, in the second sector there. Oh, and he's gone over the curb. Hopefully keeps out the wall so we can get back to the pit lane as he will. He seems fairly calm. Uh, Bono definitely looked a bit frustrated when he crossed the line. Yeah. Um, but yes, it's interesting. I mean, with the, the weight, obviously, coming into the final round of the championship, normally you'd want to be the leader. Uh, however, and there is Jovski. I think he's had to return he's to garage, out. hasn't he? So he is out of this qualifying session, is our hand, which is a real shame. Um, but yeah, you know, with going into the championship finale with the championship lead, normally a good thing. With the ballast, you arguably don't want to be doing that. You know, that's why Kevin Siggy, who currently sits on pole position, is in such a good position. He's only seven points off the lead, but he's fourth, and it's the perfect slot, arguably, to go into this finale. Well, Colin Sporks just a single position ahead of his teammate uh, who's debuting this round of Jan Wojnitsa. Uh, but there is uh, a decent gap of four hundredths of a second between the two of them. This is Michael Romanidis who will be coming through the uh, the middle sector now. And uh, Romanidis has been one that's been a bit uh, up and down. Obviously having to get used to this championship being thrown in uh, at the deep end, 17th on the grid. He's not done super well in qualifying, but still trying to, to at least savour something from the final round because they are in that relegation uh, battle. Exactly. And oh, Maguire. Oh, up yeah. Third. Great, great lap from Adam Maguire. We have seen like little sparks of genius from Adam Maguire throughout the season. And there's another one, another team in the relegation battle, of course, Wolves. But yeah, speaking of Romanides and Williams, he had a big lock up into the corkscrew. He'll be feeling the pressure, Lewis, because Williams have kind of been carried this season by Petter Burlak in that first car. But they're right in the scrap. You know, they're on 96 points, only three points ahead of the danger zone, which currently is held at 11th position by Rocket. Uh, they've got to get it right tonight, and they're, I mean, Romanidis definitely going to be feeling the pressure. He's got to try and perform, especially with the likes of Maguire up in third place at this stage. Well, here's a driver we should really keep an eye on. Uh, Alex Siebel, who was super impressive in the previous round at the Circuit de Azur, one of the Netrex Grand Prix cars, gets out of the way. Big moment there, <laughs> and that is the lap done immediately from Alex Siebel. You can see the frustration, and he'll be communicating that over to Dennis Jordan, his teammate. That one is already gone. Yeah, he was frustrated, but you could see a little smile there, which I quite like. So clearly he's feeling quite, I know he still looks frustrated, but I think he's feeling quite relaxed about this, um, judging by that. But yeah, it's a real burger because now he's got to get back to the pits, get the new tyres on, get back out. He might struggle to get another lap in, so he will be very frustrated. Well, he's behind uh, Marco Pejic, who's in fifth position, but he is ahead of one of his championship rivals in Yerne Sirancic, and of course his teammate in Dennis Jordan, who's only in eighth position. And trust me, when the strategy is all over the place like it is on a day like this, that is a team that I would be a little bit fearful of. Here comes Kevin Siggy, though. Of course, not only battling for the Drivers' Championship, but also for the team's championship. His teammate is down in ninth position. Kevin Siggy's about to start another lap. He's done a 58.298 to get that provisional pole position. What can he do this time by? Yeah, let's find out. Ice cool as always, Kevin Siggy. He just looks so calm behind the wheel. You can see how much he's straining, though, with the steering wheel, fighting with it. He's obviously got the force feed back up nice and high. A little bit of a slide through turn three. Now through the fast right-hander, look at that perfect commitment. Maybe slightly wide on the exit, touch the gravel. Probably not going to lose too much, using all of the curb again under braking on entry to turn five. Beautiful apex, just absolutely sensational to watch this from Kevin. He is almost a tenth down on the first sector, and look how much of this track he used there. That is pretty much perfect. Yeah, super commitment as well. Look at how much he balances it over the curb in the braking zone, coming down through the corkscrew. What's the second sector going to be? He's lost out a little bit in the first, but he's keeping on pushing on this lap, so I'm assuming there might be a bit more time into it, and that is exactly what has happened. He's found a tenth of a second. That is to himself in the middle sector. He's on provisional bowl, and he's looking to move the benchmark a little bit further away. Eleventh corner and done. He's a little bit too wide, though, and I don't think that's going to count, but is it? It is across the line. It is a 58.252. For me, that was definitely exceeding track limits on the final corner, but it's all done by the in-game cuts and Kevin Siggy takes it. Yeah, and I can't, you could see the energy just release as soon as he came out of that final corner. He'd done all the hard work and there was just an explosion Ooh. of energy from Kevin as we see engine. an ex engine explosion for Ferris Stanley down in 15th for Rocket, one of the relegation contenders, of course. So that's a shame for them and it will end his session. But yes, yeah, Siggy, wow, incredible. And you could just see the pent up, you know, emotion. He was so calm and committed on the lap, so precise and relaxed. And then as soon as he comes out the last corner, there's the explosion of emotion. And it looks good at the moment. He's got over a tenth, almost two tenths of a second to Marcel Chinchik, and we see a Williams car missing a front wing as it well. certainly was uh, lacking the, the downforce in the front end. Here's Jan Wojnitsa into the final sector as he's a 
about to start his lap. You can see a little bit of tyre warming. Uh, Wojnitsa is no, uh, whilst he's a rookie to the, the season, he's no slouch in his car. He's no rookie to this car. He has raced it time and time again, uh, be it in the Formula Sim Racing World Championship or elsewhere in Sim Racing. Jan Wojnitsa is someone who does know uh, this car like the back of his hand, and he's a good teammate with Colin Sport elsewhere uh, in the Sim Racing World. And he'll take over from Noah Roivers and Laurent Kearsmakers, who's been uh, in this car. Of course, Noah Roivers is off to do his studies, and Laurent Kearsmakers is not able to make this round. Jan Wojnitsa out a little bit wide through turn three as he's pushing on in his Netrex car. Yeah, he's sitting quite low there. You can see the steering wheel up near his kind of chin in terms of positioning, but he's actually purple really in sector one. Two hundredths of a second up on pole sitter Kevin Siggy. So let's definitely keep an eye on this lap. That would be a sensational result, wouldn't it? If we saw Jan anywhere near the top three. Looks pretty good there, heading up towards corkscrew. His face is maybe suggesting otherwise, but he's still concentrating. Let's see what the second sector is. Through the corkscrew, big step of oversteer. You saw him fighting the wheel as the main camera cut away. Let's see. I think he's going to have lost a few tenths to Lewis, and he has. He's yeah. lost half a second. I was going to say, didn't look super great through T5. So this will be the final lap for Jan Wojnitsa as we're 30 seconds away from the checkered flag being pulled in the session. Jan Wojnitsa will depart the final corner. He's currently in 18th position in the Netrex Grand Prix team that's looking to escape relegation. He does improve up into 11th position. So a great lap time there from uh, Wojnitsa. It puts him uh, well clear of his teammate as we'll see what happened to Peter Boyack as he runs down towards the first corner. Well, that might... I think that's the blown engine, potentially. I was going to say, uh, that would explain what's happened with the rocket car of, uh, of Ferris Stanley. Well, why did he pull off the road yeah, earlier? Exactly. Yeah, if you've got a engine damage heading into turn one, you're going to block one of your big rivals in the braking zone. That is really, really not good, um, yeah, whatever's yeah. happened there. So maybe a bit of a lack of awareness from the rocket driver. But uh, yeah, we'll see what happens with that one. Marcel Chichik uh, will return his way into the pit lane, second uh, at the moment, and his qualifyings this season have been very, very good, uh, has Marcel Chichik. Unfortunately for some of the races, I mean, he's kept himself in championship contention, but it's not been quite uh, what he's wanted. He's qualified in third position twice in the opening couple of races of the season. Uh, he qualified on pole position, of course, on way to victory uh, at Donington Park, and is one of the four drivers that's qualified in the top ten in every single race uh, this season season. The other ones being, uh, of course, you wouldn't be too shocked to know that it's Kevin Siggy and Jeffrey Rietveld uh, and Alex Seaborg, sorry, Alex Seaborg, Dennis Jordan uh, as well, who I believe find themselves all inside the top 10 with Kevin Siggy taking pole position. And we talk about weight making a difference. Uh, championship leader Jeffrey Rietveld has qualified 10th as we see a replay now into turn one. Uh, oh, no, it looks like that's just a general shot anyway. But yeah, sorry, Rietveld, 10th uh, on the grid with full weight. You've got Simon Chich, sixth on the grid with the second most weight and Bono House fourth on the grid. So the less the weight, the higher up the qualifying position. So I think it is making a difference. And of course, Kevin Siggy, first driver without any weight, is on pole position. And Siggy is the driver that, because of that lack of ballast, he's the one where the permutations might be almost a little bit against him. But the fact that he's got no weight, the expectation is that he was going to get pole position today and that he was going to run away with it uh, and win today. But what, uh, what does he need to do to, to win, really? I think he's got to get his strategy right. He's got to stay calm. And we've seen him do that several times as we now have the grid order coming up, which I'll let you run through, Lewis. Yes, Kevin Siggy will start from pole position for the second time in his Formula Pro career with Marcel Cinchik on the front row, I think for his first time actually, with Adam Maguire in third. Another great qualifying uh, from the Irishman. Bonahouse, our series champion, will start from fourth alongside his teammate in Marco Pejic. Super effort from the Mercedes AMG Petronas Esports team with Yerne Simoncic starting from sixth, the driver that's second in the standings. Alex Siebel and Dennis Jordan look to try and take the team's title. They'll have to do that from seventh and eighth position with Ibrahim Khan inside the top ten against the championship leader in Jeffrey Rietveld for Team Redline. Behind that in 11th position is Jan Wojnitsa on his debut ahead of the duo of David Morocek and Damian Skovron who are just a little bit outside of the relegation battle ball. If they do make a big mistake then they might be within it. Danny Kish, Michi Hoyer will start from 14th and 15th with Colin Spork in 16th. Fair way behind his teammate Mohamed Patel, Ferris Stanley, Daniel Brewer and Michael Ramanidis down in 20th position 1.6 seconds off of the pole. Three drivers weren't setting a lap time in that session. Erhan Yovsky, Peter Belyak, and Gianmarco Faducci. One driver missing, and that will be the Team Fordzilla driver, I believe, of Nuno Pinto, uh, definitely confirming them as being relegated. Or they'll be in the relegation battle rather this evening. Well, it's interesting to see because they were definitely the team that were most likely not to get through. So I do wonder, Lewis, if they've decided 
to sit this one out now. If they're sitting right at the back, maybe they're actually going to have a better chance of saving themselves in the relegation battle rather than in the Formula Pro race. So maybe they're going to go and prepare for that. Now, we'll very quickly speak of relegation because we always like to bring our uh, fans, our audience, and sometimes a little bit of the competitors uh, into this as well because we'll have three relegation races uh, to deal with. Now, two of them have already been set as to which circuit they'll be on. We'll go racing at India, oh, sorry, Imola, uh, and then at Silverstone. But there will be a vote open that will be over the duration of the final race here at Laguna Seca where you can vote between not only uh, Indianapolis but also Sebring as well, two very historic American race circuits. And that will be the third and final double points race a little bit later on. It's going to be very exciting indeed. So obviously the drivers are going to have to try and tackle three different circuits, three different styles of driving, maybe three different setups as well. And they're going to have to jump into the final race without even knowing what track it's going to be yet. It might be Indianapolis Road Course might be Sebring, very different in characteristics too. So I wonder if they've been trying to learn both of them, prepare as much as possible. But I mean, the teams like Fordzilla, like maybe Rocket or other teams that are in the battle, uh, maybe, you know, they'll, they'll have been trying to split their practice between Formula Pro race, this finale, to try and stay out of the relegation battle. And maybe they'll have been practicing the actual relegation circuits themselves. So it's pretty tricky, isn't it, Rachel? Yeah, it really is. And you could tell um, with the drivers right now that they really are fighting for everything in this particular final round. Of, um, of, the, of the race, of the season. Um, I feel like they were attacking that so much more aggressively. And that's just qualies. I don't know. I, I'm not quite sure what to expect for when the race begins. Yeah, it's going to be a, a tight battle. I mean, you could see it from Kevin Siggy, mm -hmm. how pumped he was to grab yep. that uh, final pole position uh, of the season. It's his second one. The last time he had pole position was at Daytona, where he took victory. And I think he's going to be feeling pretty pumped for the uh, title. Yeah, and I think, you know, on a track that's difficult to overtake, on at the best of times. Siggy's won before, he's calm, he's shown pace throughout the season and he's got no ballast. So I think he's got to be in the driving seat at the minute and I'd put him down as the bookie's favourite. Yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth and I was going to ask you about overtaking um, on this particular track. So, you know, if he plays his cards right, if conditions stay the same, then it could be a foregone conclusion. I know you can never say that when it comes to racing, but his odds are looking very good. I mean, strategy is going to be the king today. Whilst we're talking of running away with the victory, the expectation is this is going to be a two-stop race with it being you know, soft, mediums and hards. We don't think the hards are going to be used at all, uh, but those softs and mediums, it is a high, high, high tyre wear circuit. It's not a very long pit lane as well. So two stops, probably the strategy, but it does mean that there is an element of risk if you put a little bit too early. Exactly. You know, and we've seen most of the races this year have been one-stop strategies quite clearly. So it really does throw a spanner in the works for this last round. They're going to have to think of something different. And obviously, you know, if you're Siggy, you're going to be wanting to play the strategy to your strongest race pace. But maybe someone further down might take a gamble, might try and do it on a one-stop, and then they're going to be in the way, and it's going to be difficult to get past. So it's going to be a question of track position versus ultimate race time. And honestly, nothing is a foregone conclusion around the Laguna Seca. I literally can't wait. I really can't wait. And, you know, I guess you mentioned before that it plays havoc on tyres. And is that really going to be the main worry going into this race for all the teams? I think so. I think so. I mean, mm. this is, you know, California uh, after all. It's pretty hot. It's, uh, it's, it's a pretty abrasive race circuit as well. And uh, so it is a, a bit of a tyre chomper. It's exactly what we saw in Formula Challenge uh, last week as well. We went on to go and crown Christian Mikel as the series champion. We'll see him out in action uh, a little bit later on those relegation mm. races alongside uh, Risto Capit. Uh, that's going to be a bit thrilling uh, as well to see all of those battling once again. But in Formula Challenge, it's almost always been a no-stop race throughout the season. And what we saw last week is it was a one-stop race for the first time. We saw all of the, the top lot in the championship coming into the pit lane because they had to. Yeah, exactly. Mm. You know, quite often we've seen a variation in strategy. Uh, there was no variation. It was everyone had to make a stop. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to come into it big time, I think, overtaking pit stop strategy with the tyres. But also, I mean, looking at the qualifying, the track track is so intense because you're just going from corner to corner. It's only 58 second lap, but there's still quite a lot of corners to think about. So trying to have the brain capacity to deal mm -hmm. with managing your tires, watching your mirrors and hitting your apexes without hitting any sausage curbs. That is a lot of very, very difficult things to try and balance. Well, talk about different cool things trying to balance. So let's have a look at the ballast. And um, I just want to ask, how much of a difference has the ballast made, do you think, if 
any at all. I think it has made a difference. Mm. I don't think the thing is that the, the ballast that we've got here, you know, anyone who sees ballast in a lot of motorsport, you tend to see it in things like British touring cars where it is quite substantial. You're talking like 70 kilos at one point. Uh, this, you can see Jeffrey Rietveld on 10, Yone Simicic on 7, Bonner House on 4, and that is it. He's just the top three. But that 10, 7, and 4 in a car like this, it only weighs 600 kilos. It's uh, a, a substantial percentage, but it's enough to kind of not try and false results. You can win on 10 kilos if you get the strategy right. I, th I guarantee Jeffrey Rebell would have won at Circuit de Azure on maximum ballast had he had it. But it's just, it's kind of one of those ones that we, 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 we potentially would see different winners on and keep the championship wide and open and keep seven different teams, or seven different cars rather, uh, in the championship contention. Yeah, I think, you know, in most championships, that kind of weight will not really make much difference because the gaps are a little bit bigger. But when it's this competitive, everyone is so closely matched, one tenth, two tenths of a second makes the difference between pole and maybe P10 on the grid. And that weight will make a difference. As Lewis said, the car doesn't weigh much, so the percentage is quite high. And, you know, you can see it in the qualifying, you know, Jeffrey. Rietveld, 10th on the grid with the most ballast. Kevin Siggy, 4th in the championship, no ballast. He's on pole position. It's a complete reverse of the championship order. So I would say it definitely does matter based on the evidence. Yeah, it really does. Well, I feel it's going to be one of the most challenging races we have seen. Um, so let's begin. This is the final round of the Formula Pro Series. Enjoy. Well, thank you to Rachel Downey. We'll catch up with her a little bit later on in the evening where we'll have to talk to whoever is going to win the championship and win this race. Wow. It's amazing to think that in 60 minutes, we will be able to see which teams are going to go into relegation. We'll see which teams are crowned as our series champion and which driver will take top honours in the second season of Formula Pro. Yeah, the season has flown by. You know, it's been quite a while since the start of the season, but it doesn't feel like it. There's been so many action-packed races, some slightly less action-packed races, but I think this is definitely going to be one that throws in a few surprises and a lot of excitement. So I'm very much looking forward to it, as I'm sure you are, as we take a look at the starting grid. Yes, indeed. Kevin Siggy will start from pole position alongside Marcel Chinchik, Adam Maguire and Bonner House will start on the second row of the grid in third and fourth. We might all be saying goodbye to our champion, but he might well keep the number one. He's got a long road ahead of him to do so. Marco Pejic will start from fifth with Jernay Simicic. He's had 10 kilos in the previous three races. He has seven for this one alongside uh, Alex Siebel and Dennis Jordan on row number eight. Ibrahim Khan inside the top 10 again and Jeffrey Rietveld keeping up his 100% top 10 record in 2022 will start from 10th. Jan Wojnitzer and David Morocek start from 11th and 12th. Morocek after after a poor round last time out, ahead of his teammate Damian Skovron, Danny Kish will start from 14th, ahead of Michi Hoyer, who struggled in qualifying again. Colin Spork in 16th position. The final few rows of the grid will see Mohamed Patel, Ferris Stanley, Daniel Brewer and Michael Romanidis. Two more rows as those drivers struggled to get their qualifying uh, out onto the board. We'll have Erhan Yovsky, Petr Belyak and Michael Romanidis uh, back down the order. As Kevin Siggy will bring us round, you can see here it's going to be a rolling start. Very last final quick prediction, who's winning this race? I'm going to be really boring and say Kevin Siggy, but honestly, it's so hard to call. Well, here we go then. After a long three-month wait, we come to Laguna Seca and we get ready for the final race of 2022 here in the R Factor 2 Formula Pro Series. Kevin Siggy from pole position looking for a championship. Look at Bonner House, who's gone straight to the outside of the Mercedes AMG Petronas Esports team. He's trying to take second position. He's trying to take the race lead. He's had a bit of a lock-up, though, coming down to the Andretti hairpin. Marcel Jinchik makes contact with him, and that sent him out wide. Adam Maguire takes over second position. It's a good hold shot from Kevin Siggy, who's hanging on to the race lead. It's a dream start for Kevin Siggy. His championship rivals have tangled with each other. Chinchik making contact with Bono on the outside of turn one. Not much Bono could have done there. He left a lot of room. Just a little bit of a nudge. And look at this. Adam Maguire in P2 in the Wolves car punching above his weight. He is going to throw a spanner in the works. But a dream start for Kevin Siggy. Oh, but a bad one, though, from Dennis Jordan because he's got Jeffrey Rietveld as well directly behind him. He's dropped one position down to 11th because Jan Wojnitsa has made up a great start up from 11th to 9th. There's, there's a bit of contact as Jernay Simicic trying to get past Bonner House at the moment. He's in fifth position, Bonner House in fourth. He's got Marco Pejic directly behind as well. And Yone Simicic, he might have seven kilos on board, but he is on a charge. Yeah, and it's not a great start for Jeffrey Rietveld, our championship leader, because he's actually dropped a position down to P11. He has got it all to do. An incredible uphill battle with seven people in this championship fight. It's going to be so, so tough from there. Yeah, push to pass, you can see being used. They've got 60 seconds of it as Dennis Jordan's trying to get past Jan Wojnitsa straight away, looking to the inside as they head down towards the Andretti hairpin up towards turn three now, and certainly not 
an opportunity for the German to try and make a move on the Polish driver of Jan Wojnitsa, who, uh, despite being brand new to Formula Pro, he is not scared of it one bit. Already into the pit lane uh, was one of the drivers. I think it might have been Danny Kish. It was indeed, yeah, and that's big for the relegation battle, Lewis, because Rocket are right in the thick of it, and with one driver in the pits this early, okay, it's a two-stopper. He might be able to turn it into a one-stopper now, but that is really, really bad for their race, and he's going to come out the pits. Rocket being consistent this season, but not quite at the pace. This is not a good start. Yeah, they are down in 11th in the championship. And remember, it's the bottom two teams, 11th and 12th in the championship on the team side of things that will be uh, joining the relegation battle uh, alongside the Predator R8 G team, but alongside Need Racing and PMK Sim Racing a bit later on uh, this evening. Adam Maguire going on the attack. Now, remember, when we saw the Wolves GR Esports team going on the attack, that was back in Monza. They were on a two-stop strategy comparatively to everyone else's one-stop. We're expecting the two-stop today, but Maguire seems to have the pace. He's going on the attack. He is, and this is great to see. Of course, Wolves, one of the teams also in the relegation battle, so all he needs to do is secure a big points haul, and the team are safe, but he's going to want the glory. He's going to want to go for the win. Siggy's got all the pressure on him, so will Siggy fight this one too hard? I'm not sure. One thing to make very clear straight away, Lewis, no Fordzilla. We've only got 22 cars in the grid, so Fordzilla are not taking part. I do wonder then if they are fully going to throw their eggs into the relegation battle basket, because for them, that's it now. So Fordzilla are one of the two teams to go down. Maybe instantly starting to practice on the third and final circuit, which you can be voting for. It's in the YouTube chat here on Traction.gg, as we'll see Adam Maguire all over the rear end of Kevin Siggy. I mean, this is a tense moment as a bit of push to pass is used. Kevin Siggy realistically doesn't need to beat Adam Maguire. Adam Maguire is not in the championship hunt with him. He just needs to beat the likes of Marcel Cincic, of Bonahouse, of Jernay Simoncic, of Alex Siebel, of Dennis Jordan, and of his teammate Jeffrey Rietveld. That's a lot of good names, and <laughs> he's definitely doing the job at the moment. Two seconds clear of Cincic, three seconds clear of Bono after contact early on, which wouldn't have helped his tyre wear either, it's worth mentioning. Obviously, we know how bad the tyre wear could be today. But yeah, Adam Maguire, this is much like he's started the season. He was really, really strong at Spa. They had a bit of a dip, did Wolves, and a few mistakes in terms of strategy, but ending the season so strong. And to be honest, at Spa, he managed to carry that pace through the whole race. He was really strong at the end of the race as well. So, uh, yeah, this, this is definitely, you know, on for the win here. And Maguire has got, as you say, nothing really to lose in terms of going for the win. He does yeah. have the points to lose for the relegation battle, but I think they're looking good. So let's just see how this one plays out. Yeah, and uh, Anthony Nitzpon, who's doing the strategy for the Wolves GR Esports team, will be running the numbers, crunching them at the moment, seeing how they can find a way past Kevin Siggy. Yone Simicic, who we're focused on now. Well, it's Cameron Roger, who's pumping the numbers for the Burst Esports team that are presently sat in fifth position in this race. Bonnerhaus about a second off the rear end of Marcel Cincic. Now, there is no, uh, you know, like in DRS with uh, Formula One, like, there's no requirement being one second of the car ahead to be able to use the button. You use that button whenever you want, but you only have 60 seconds of it. Yeah, and I think Maguire's using it early to try and pile the pressure on Kevin and stay with him, which makes sense. You know, he's going to gain from that right now. Whereas the others, we haven't seen too much use of it, especially from the championship contenders. Uh, they're just going to try and settle into the rhythm, save their tires while the fuel loads are high and the tire wear is going to be high as well. Don't get too much heat in them, just loop after them. And it's much easier said than done. Um, but yeah, we're interested to see how it affects the race later on. Just to quickly mention as well, in terms of the championship, Siggy, he does of course need to win if he wants to really get that big points haul. He needs the main contenders, that's Jeffrey Rietveld, Jurnia Simoncic, he needs them to finish fourth or lower. At the moment, Simoncic is fifth. Whoa. So if Simoncic picks up fourth, as we see side by side between Dan Brewer in 18th, and that's Mitchie Hoyer for burst in P17. But yeah, as I say, um, all it needs is Simoncic to pick up one more place, and it's not anywhere near over in terms of the championship either. So Siggy cannot afford to let this lead slip. Yeah, indeed. Like I say, you've got to just try and hang on at the moment because, like I say, once Maguire's got through, then maybe you lose a little bit of momentum. Mitchy Hoyer has not started the race with very much momentum right now, which is on the rear end of Michael Romanidis in this fairly large train uh, down for 16th on the grid. You can see that Romanidis is leading it. Then you've got Mitchy Hoyer. Then you've got Daniel Brewer. You've got one of the Rocket Sim Sports cars uh, directly behind that one, of course, will be Ferris Stanley. You've got Petr Boyak uh, as well. Uh, and then you'll have Damien Skovron at the rear end of the Bicoles Burst eSports team. Yeah, at the moment it looks like it's between 
based on the first few laps, Rocket and Williams uh, for that second relegation spot in terms of being into the playoffs. Uh, and it looks at the moment like both of them are having a pretty poor race, uh, to be honest. I mean, it looks at the highest of them, I think, is Romanidis in P16. We've obviously had the issues for Danny Kish. Stanley's down in 19th, and Petr Berlak's not having the greatest race either. So it's looking very close between those two, but I'd say Williams just have the upper hand at the moment. I'd agree, especially considering that it's coming into this round. Uh, that the Rocket Sports team were ever so slightly behind also. Yeah, three points behind Williams, so not much in it at all. Of course, we do have points going all the way down to P24 in this race, only 22 left in it. So everyone scores points, and that means that every single position you can make up counts. It's not as if you know, you're not going to lose out by, by going for a move and having a DNF. You definitely will lose out. Got to say, things are quite calm, uh, in a sense, at the moment here at Laguna Seca in our season finale. That is not how it will last. Let's take a look then at the restart or the start of the race. As you can see, Bonahouse getting to the outside of Marcel Chinchik straight away. This is on board with Jeffrey Riefeld, who lost a couple of positions. He had Ibrahim Khan to his inside. There was a little bit of contact as well on the rear end of Michi Hoyer. Uh, I think that's Petr Boyak, who went straight on as well after contact. There was a big crash on the outside. That is what dealt with uh, Danny Kish. And this is Bonahouse. Fantastic start. Timed it beautifully as he went around the outside of Marcel Chinchik and properly sent it. A bit of a long up as well as he got onto the brakes coming down as the Adjati hairpin and then received the contact from Marcel Chinchik. This is on board with Damien Skovron who got pushed around just a touch and we'll see what happens with Danny Kish, a little bit of contact as well. Don't quite know how that Netrex front wing got flown off there as we can see. It was just as uh, I think it was Damien Skovron had a bit of a moment. Yeah, it all started with Bono House. Oh, there was goodness. more contact with Danny oh. Kish but he of course had no front wing so he, he might know. not have known. Um, so you, you know, we have to take a look at that one but basically that all started as Berlak went charged charging into turn one with the Bono incident. It was, a, it was a domino effect. Everyone got checked up on the outside and it, it resulted in Danny Kish losing his front wing. He's got a 30 second penalty, that's very harsh. I'd wonder if that's for the contact into turn three, which was the right-hander just afterwards. Yeah, and so that would, uh, the reason why it's a 30 second uh, post-race time penalty, that's essentially the same kind of thing as a uh, as a drive-through. The reason why it isn't a drive-through is because drive-throughs aren't necessarily consistent every single track we go racing. Meanwhile, a 30-second time penalty is the same time penalty here uh, as it is if we go racing at Daytona or Spa uh, so, or Monza. So yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I've just noticed something's happened to Maguire on that lap, Lewis, because he, he was actually quicker than Siggy the lap before it, but on that very lap, he's lost about three seconds. So we'll get a replay of that soon, hopefully, for Adam Maguire. So, something's happened to him. That is a big break for Kevin Siggy. Now, we're going to see a replay. Oh, Talk us through T6. it, six. It's coming up towards T6. Watch out for that sausage curb. Yeah. Boom. Oh, no, he didn't touch it, but he think he just carried in a little bit too much speed. And I thought he was going to be uh, sent to the moon. Thankfully, he managed to uh, just avoid it a touch, but was taking a little bit too much speed. Like I say, it's flat out in qualifying. You do need to lift just a touch as Jane Simicic is on the button. It shows how hard Maguire was trying, that's for sure. And he got very close to the wall on the outside, did well to keep himself composed. But oh, it's going to oh, Simicic. Simicic. What's happened to Jane Simicic? What has happened to Jane Simicic? He's dropped down to eighth position. He's got no front wing. Jane Simicic, second in the championship. The Slovenian, the three time Formula Sim Racing World champion, has no front wing, he'll have to bring it straight back into the pit lane. That was a definite crash into the corkscrew. Yeah, he was only one position off, still winning the championship. He's just made a mistake on his own. He's locked up, he's gone off, and he's going to touch the barrier on the way oh. down the hill. What a shame for Jurene Simoncic. He's led this championship for so long, and it's all coming crashing down right now. Oh, that is a painful moment. You can see Jurene Simoncic there in the bottom right of your screen and this will now be a painful round for the team that is third uh, in the team standings they are going to be losing out quite a few points to uh, to RHG who are sat in third in the race at the moment but mostly to the Mercedes AMG Petronas esports team now for third in the championship you know still prize money up for those uh, in each position you, the higher up you get the more money you get and so I think first esports with that move not only are they losing virtual money for replacing the front wing they'll be losing real money as well costly indeed and a real shame as I say he's been so so calm and composed all season. He's really taken the fight to redline. He's been leading the championship most of the way through. So it's just heartbreaking. I bet it looked like his own mistake. He just got locked up a bit late on the brakes. He, to be honest, fair play for getting out of the way and making sure he avoided the Mercedes in front because he could have taken them with him. Uh, and then obviously on the way down the hill, he could have saved it if he'd managed to just avoid the wall. But at that kind of speed on the gravel, it's very, very tricky. And that's it for Simoncic. Devastating. A big, big shame indeed. Well, when we speak of young guns in the sim racing world, we were talking about uh, Colin Spork and Ibrahim Khan in the previous round. Jan Wojnitsa also in that category, as he's on the rear end of Ibrahim Khan as well when it comes to future superstars to keep an eye on. And uh, Jan Wojnitsa, who's making his debut this round, is 
hounding the rear end of the BS competition driver right now. Ibrahim Khan not got the pace to keep up with Alex Siebel and Marco Pejic at the moment, but he does have the pace to keep this train behind. Yeah, absolutely, and it's quite a big train, actually. You do tend to see those kind of trains around Laguna Seca, but yeah, a great debut from Wojnicka. He was doing, you know, did a great job in qualifying. We saw a purple first sector, but struggled a little bit in the middle sector. Um, but we're just keeping an eye as well on the lead two in terms of pace, very, very similar. So it looks like Adam Maguire set down a little bit into his rhythm. And uh, you're seeing it the tyre graphic now. So you've got soft tyres for all the top 14, Burlac uh, on, on mediums, as is Romanita. So a little bit of variation there. So uh, obviously one of the, the, the light questions here, Yane Simicic, who's had to make a pit stop now, obviously after losing his front wing. Realistically, could he go to the end from this point? It's so high tyre wear around here, though. I think it's probably going to be a two-stop for Simic. I mean, he, if, if anyone is going to risk trying the one-stop, it's going to be someone who manages to make the tyres last longer. If he's having to pit early, he's essentially going to have to two-stop it, but he can get, it, it's almost been driven like a one-stop because he's still got 48 minutes to yeah. do. So it's going to be two very tough stints just to two-stop two it. It kind of just confirms what he's doing rather than changes the strategy in any way, I would have thought, unless he was trying in the first place to do a one-stop. I think most of the teams uh, and drivers, from what I was speaking to earlier, uh, are looking to do something like a, a soft, soft, medium, or a soft, medium, soft, uh, or even, in some cases, a medium, soft, soft, uh, by taking the, the, the three tyres over two stops. Now, with Yane Simicic pitting at that point, he could technically do a soft, medium, medium. It is not an ideal strategy, but it is one that might well see him get to the checker flag and pick up a couple of spots, which could be very important, at least in the team standings. Exactly, yeah. I think it's pretty much over in the driver's standings with how many drivers are so close, because one of them is going to have a good race. One of them is probably going to win the race, let's be honest. Um, so it's pretty much over in that sense. But the team's championship is, as we keep saying, very important to these drivers because of the prize money. Michi Hoyer's not having a great race either, it has to be said. He's struggling a little bit for pace in the bottom half, I think he's outside the top 15 as well. So not great for them, but Simoncic of course can still come back with a good drive and might potentially still score some important points and get that prize money in. Well, David Morocek, 14th position, uh, kind of got a one thing, obviously last round he put on a bit of a show, I think is the lightest way of putting it. Now they did receive post-race penalties, uh, which affect that one race. We don't have grid drops uh, in Formula Pro, so there was no grid drop applied to David Morocek. So he was able to start from this qualified position uh, around here. Got to say, you, you need to be strong mentally, right? To come back to a championship where you know at the previous round you've, you've had your struggles and to put those to one side and just continue on strong. Yeah, absolutely. It's tricky, um, and you've got to get right back into the, the you know, the, the confidence back. Forget about what just happened, and uh, he's doing a good job, has to be said so far. It does look like he's using a full uh, steering wheel as well. It, that's going to make things a bit awkward. It looks flat on the bottom too. Just looking, it's very interesting seeing what different kind of wheel rims each of the drivers are using. So these are things um, that I've he, been on that wheel. He, he looks calm, is. and there's a position for him as we see. Iovski running wide and dropping down to 14th, and there we go. Easy done. Morocek up to 13th, and I'm sure by this stage in the race, you know, we're 14 minutes in. He'll not be thinking about Quote d'Azur. He'll be fully focused on the race ahead of him, and he's doing what he needs to do right now to save by collars and keep them in the Formula Pro Championship. Yeah, now I do. I, I can't remember. This is the thing: is all, all sim racing wheels is uh, a name followed by an awful lot of letters, and I can never remember which way round they all go. Uh, but I do know the wheel. The thing is, is round rims are, are, are kind of uncommon because you want to use a, a regular sort of a Formula style rim. Uh, in when you're doing formal style racing, just because it's kind of it makes sense. I know that sounds crazy, like oh well, yeah, of course you would, but still, there are plenty of examples of people using round rims because you just kind of get uh, used to it. As we're on board with Alex Siebel at the moment on the rear end of Marco Pejic, and whilst we're watching our drivers race around, remember as well that you can vote onto YouTube and over on Twitter as well at Traction. You can vote. For, uh, for what circuit will be racing the third and final race of the relegation races that will follow the season finale here in Formula Pro. You can have your call between Indianapolis and Sebring. I believe it's Sebring that's winning at the moment. And uh, I do love me a bit of Sebring, so I'm all over that. I love me a bit of Sebring. It's quite bumpy, you know. Maybe it would be a bit more uncomfortable if you were going around there in real life. But on the sim, I absolutely love it as well. I think it flows beautifully. Uh, the gorgeous sunset bend as well. A great place to end uh, what will be a fantastic and very long night of racing it has to be said so we've got four races until tonight very exciting but the formula pro is of course the main show right now as we stay on board with alex siebel sitting in sixth position he'll be he'll be looking quite good in terms of his championship result if things kind of stay the way they are at the moment it looks like siggy is probably the favorite at this current stage with bono house lurking in fourth 
uh, would be moving up to second in the championship. But then you've got Alex Siebel, so it would be strong for him. Obviously, though, Oracle Red Bull Racing, it's unlikely they're going to take home the Drivers' Championship. They will be thinking fully of the team's championship. So it's Rietveld and Siggy that Alex Siebel and Dennis Jordan have to worry about. Now, Rietveld down in 10th, having a bit of a struggle, it has to be said, the championship leader. Uh, but Dennis Jordan is up in 8th. So, you know, Oracle Red Bull, still there. It's consistency. It's good from them. Anything happens to Siggy, it's still possible. Now, this might be crazy town. Could Kevin Siggy be one-stopping? Because he's been closed in massively by Adam Maguire, who I am 99% sure is two-stopping. Now, with all this talk of tyres, could Kevin Siggy be doing something? As Dennis Jordan and Jan Wojcicki switch over for seventh position, so I think the position has been made up finally by the German, using a little bit of push to pass as they'll race out onto... That must have been in the final sector then, based on the time between them, because that wasn't down into T1, so Dennis Jordan's found his way through at least potentially into the Panopma corner or final. Yeah, the tricky places to make moves. Probably the last corner is the most likely to get it done, unless there's maybe a bit of gravel involved, someone running wide, but obviously we have no idea because we haven't seen it, but it could be something like that. Uh, yeah, Kevin Siggy out in front doing 1 minute 1.0 on the last lap. And we have seen faster laps from Maguire. He's been consistently quick as well, doing 1 minute dead 0.8. As we now see what happened, and is it? Yeah, it's exactly that. He's going to run wide onto the gravel. And there you go, Dennis Jordan through. Uh, that's really the only way you can make a move in that penultimate corner. So it's all about making mistakes rather than forcing the move. And Dennis Jordan kept it on the road and up a position. I thought you were going to have a diva then. I'm trying to tell production what to do. Oh, you're going to get an absolute slap out of this race if you keep that up. Where's my replay? Uh, either way, Alex Siebel on the rear end still of uh, Marco Pei. It says Marocek on the rear end of the BS competition car that it belongs to Mohamed Patel. 12th position at the moment. So Marocek, after making that move courtesy of the mistake from Erhan Yovsky, yellow flag out in sector once this is ahead of what we're doing now is that a back marker i believe so it must be because no one's dropping down from inside the top 10 so i think we're safe at least when it comes to the running order and also uh, if things do finish uh, as they are kevin siggy will take the title by six points from bonner house yeah that's it's close uh, and house is just lurking there as we say anything happens to siggy bono's in there and he still hasn't won a race this season still not even on the podium as it currently stands. We've got to keep an eye, of course, on the current regulation situation as well. Uh, obviously, Fordzilla are not looking good, but it's down to the likes of Rocket, down to the likes of Williams, uh, and it looks like it's between those two at the moment still. Yeah, and we're getting word in our rear that uh, if things finish as they are at the moment, then the Williams eSports team uh, will be the one in the relegation race behind uh, Rocket, who are doing just about enough uh, to stay in, and Fordzilla as well will be joining them, but that one is a guarantee because they are not taking part in this race and they are already last in the championship. So it could be Williams eSports that have to battle to save themselves a, a spot in Formula Pro for 2023. It is a tight one at the moment, and look at this for Ferris Stan. Either side of him, he's got to worry about the uh, the onslaught of Williams Esports and the struggles for Petr Belyak and Michael Romanidis. Yeah, I'm a little unsure about that one at the moment because you've got the two uh, the rocket car split by the two Williams and then the other rocket, Daniel Kish, having a nightmare down in 22nd. And here the nightmare continues because he's now had a spin and, yeah, his race is going from bad to worse. It's really been a disaster and he's hit the, the rear wing off the wall there, so that could be more damage, but no, it looks okay for Danny Kish. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's very tight down at the bottom and none of these guys, you know, there's not one driver that's standing out from these two teams and is grabbing the big points, you know, whereas at the front, speaking of the front and the teams that are in the relegation battle, Adam Maguire for Wolves is in the pit lane, which suggests to me he was Definitely maybe low on fuel. Definite two-stop strategy for, uh, for Maguire. That doesn't mean that Kevin Siggy's not on the two-stop strategy. He might have put a little bit more fuel in to make sure that the pit stop uh, is lower. Now, they fill the car at uh, nine point something. I think it's 9.2 litres uh, a second, which is a lot. Uh, certainly more than I could drink. But uh, Adam Maguire getting that into the tank. Now, obviously, any litres that you start with a race, well, they're still going to be in the tank when you come into the pit stop. So you pit for the tyres and you only put a little bit of fuel in, meaning your pit stop is closer to sort of four or five seconds rather than seven, eight, nine. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, it, you know, those little differences in time can make a difference uh, when it comes to the outcome. A very difficult pit lane exit as well for Laguna Seca. You've got to keep it nice and tight on the first corner. And it is very tight indeed. If you get it wrong, you understeer, you're going to be going across the gravel and running out towards turn one. So be very, very careful indeed as you exit this pit lane. Entry's the same, actually, as well. It's very tight on entry. We talked about this in Formula Challenge. There is a wall running alongside that, that makes it a very tricky place to stay out the wall. We did see some incidents of drivers locking up and getting very, very 
close to it indeed. These Formula Pro cars are pretty good though when it comes to these kind of incidents yeah. as we continue to watch Ferris Stanley and this battle for relegation places. Yeah, like I say, any mistake for Williams Esports now and they could be looking to uh, to battle their way through in that, uh, that those three races a bit later on. We're on board with Ferris Stanley now. We've got a lot to look at, not only a seven-way driver fight for the championship, not only a two-way fight for the team's championship, but also in uh, in the driver's side as well, or the team side as well, to save themselves from that relegation battle, which you don't want to be in it. I'd much rather, much rather be in the 10th team, because as much as I, I love myself a bit of racing, those three races are the opposite of fun. They are incredibly stressful. There is a lot on the line. You just don't want to be a part of it. Yeah, there's a lot of hard work goes into it for something you don't want to be at, but you definitely don't. You know, especially the guys coming up from Formula Challenge have worked so hard to earn that spot in this race. It'll be a disaster if they don't make it through. Equally, guys in Formula Pro, you're not wanting to drop down a league because you know you've earned your place in the top Formula Pro league in the first place. As we see Alex Siebel now pitting for Oracle Red Bull. So more pit stops coming. We also saw Dan Brewer, the other Wolves car, in the pits, similar time to Maguire. So those guys going fairly light on fuel, I believe. Um, but yeah, yeah, lots of excitement to come up later. And of course, in the relegation race, Lewis, uh, only two of the five teams survive or, or either make it up or don't go down. So that means that we're going to have more than 50% of drivers very unhappy at the end of the night. Yes, uh, as we'll see one of the Williams Esports as well enter the pit lane. That one's Michael Romanidis, the Greek driver who'll bring himself uh, into his box for his first pit stop of expected two. Uh, this evening, there is Ferris Stanley, who's now still ahead of Burke. And you can see coming down the slip road on the exit of pit lane, that one will be Colin Spork and his Netrex Grand Prix machine. So, uh, if I say pit stops are brown, what we were expecting, but realistically, if you want to make it to the chequered flag, they're not a million miles away from the, the region of one stop. So, actually, this might well work from Kevin Siggy, and I'll have to go after all of my sources for giving me false information. Trying to throw you a red herring, maybe. Exactly. But, I mean, especially considering that all of the drivers, as we just see it in there, come up, are on on softs so that means you know you're, you're more likely to be able to do a longer stint on mediums than you would be on softs the fact that these guys are still going 37 minutes to go they're already down to you know it's not going to be the longest stint ever on mediums to keep it going so it's looking more and more like we're going to see some one stops from the front group which is going to really disadvantage the likes of wolves who've committed to the two stops we're seeing more pit stops now i'd say at this stage it's a bit touch and go whether it's going to be a one or a two stop now one other team that made or has started the process of making a two stop was alex siebel for the oracle red bull racing esports team uh, and now if he and dennis jordan make a two stop strategy this afternoon and jeffrey Riefeld and kevin Siggy can make the one stop work for team redline not only is that advantage championship-wise uh, on the driver's side of things for Kevin Siggy, but is also advantage to the team itself as they were denied last season the team's trophy. Well, they look to try and grab it this season. This is on board with Rietveld. You've got Ibrahim Khan directly ahead, but of course Rietveld on maximum ballast. This car is weighted down by an extra 10 kilos comparatively to the car directly ahead of it. And so he has to find a way through somehow. Absolutely. You know, and we're looking obviously at the championship contenders and the relegation battle. It's worth looking at some other names who are having a good event so far. You've got Marco Pech, I think, doing a very solid job for Mercedes up in fourth. Could be on his way to earning them third place in the team standings, along with his teammate Bono, who is, of course, Here doing his part as McGuire. Wire goes around the outside of um, Mohamed Patel for P8. Mohamed Patel's teammate uh, Ibrahim Khan having a good race in six as well. Is Maguire going to go for it on the inside? Oh. New retires. It's going to be close. They almost make contact side by side. It's a bit of wheel banging there, but Maguire gets the move done. Fantastic. Yeah, up towards T4. Great effort there from Adam Maguire to get himself uh, an extra position. But obviously, he is on fresher tyres uh, in comparison to Mohamed Patel as the sparks are kicked up on the exit of T5 up towards six. You've also got uh, a driver stalking in the background, Erhan Yovsky closing in on the back of Mohamed Patel, but uh, Yovsky yet to make a pit stop uh, as well as Patel. They are definitely uh, looking like they're going to aim their way towards a one-stop strategy as Dennis Jordan comes into the pit lane. The thing is, though, is Dennis Jordan's coming in at the point where if he believes that the rest of the contingent ahead of him are going to be one-stopping, then he is at the point where he can shift himself onto a one-stop. It might be a longer pit stop than he'd want, but he could shift himself onto a one-stop. There is the rule that they must take two tyre compounds, and those were softs. They were. So that means that Jordan will definitely be doing a two-stop. It's tricky to change your pit stop, I mean, especially in a round of track like this in Formula Pro. Trying to find the time to actually adjust the pit menus. We should say that as a driver, you know, you're using, whether it's buttons on your steering wheel or arrow keys in the keyboard, to try and adjust the fuel amount, to adjust the tyre compound. So trying to work all of that out, as we see Simoncic back in the pits for his second stop as well, as his race continues to fall. But yeah, it's, it's tricky to try and sort that. And Laguna Seca, maybe only the pit straight is when you have any time to actually worry about any of that stuff. So it's tricky. 
But yeah, as you say, it looks like Oracle Red Bull both going for two stops, and we haven't seen any of the red line cars in yet, which suggests at this stage they might be going for a one. Yes, indeed, as we're keeping our eyes focused on Adam Maguire, now up to Bonner House, who's closing in on Marcel Chintik. Uh, near eight and a half seconds, though, off of our race leader. I've been told to give you a live update from the Mitchie Hoyer stream. His heart rate's 162. Uh, but it is an important note that uh, heart rates are high. While sim racing is not the most physical thing uh, in the world, your heart does race just because of the concentration that it requires. So oh, 162, there you go. Absolutely, yeah. There's so much <laughs> mental capacity that's needed to do this. Your heart rate will inevitably go up. 162 is quite high. Well, that is quite high. That's, you know, that, that's, that's what happens when you're battling and the, uh, trying to get the top three of the standings. <laughs> yeah. <teams. laughs> but it's not quite going to plan, uh, unfortunately, for, for Mitchie at the moment. He's not having his best race of the season. He's been struggling a little bit for pace in comparison to his teammate, who's been doing an incredible job, Jorni Simicic. We know how competitive this is, so that's nothing against what Hoyer's been doing, but just not quite managing to, to pull out the same speed from that car as his teammate. Yeah, indeed. And it, it, it's, it's odd because he does race this car, of course, elsewhere in sim racing, whilst there are slight differences uh, here and there, but it, it's just a bit of a shock that he's not been able to, to click with it. He's good in open wheelers. We've seen that time and time again from Michi Hoyer, but for whatever reason, 2022, it's not been his. No, and he, he does spread himself quite thin. He does lots of different series, and he's competitive in pretty much everything he races in. We've seen him you know, win championships before at a very high level. So, yeah, we know what caliber of driver he is, but maybe just doing too much. But saying that, I know he's putting in a lot of effort from Formula Pro uh, as we see a replay now. So this is on board with the Netrex of Colin Spark heading into T1. He's down the inside of, of one of the rocket cars. Not sure if that was a back marker or if that was for position. I believe it'll be a back marker. But that's P13 for Spark and a really nice move, has to be said. That was uh, a bit brave, obviously right on the rear end uh, of his teammate. It was four position, it was yeah. Ferris Stanley, uh, who's now in 14th. So Colin Spork could be on the rear end of his teammate, Jan Wojnitsa, the two of them having made pit stops uh, so far. And I do wonder if Colin Spork will find his way past Jan Wojnitsa. Uh, obviously, maybe being told a little bit, maybe being pushed uh, by the team to be like, oh, I'll switch around just a little bit. Uh, as we see David Morocek now onto the rear end of the Wolves GRE Sports car that belongs to Daniel Brewer, racing up towards T6. Yeah, Brewer having not quite this as exciting a race as Adam Maguire, but he needs to do his part, and he's doing that at the moment. You know, a solid result. He came in midway through the season, always tough to do, uh, and, he, and he's been putting in a solid performance. It's nothing too spectacular, but picking up the points, and we're now back on board with Mrocek, who has been into the pit lane, I believe. Yeah, and uh, Dennis Jordan, by the way, DJ, who's Sam 11, has a bit of a wide moment there from one of the Williams eSports cars. And that's Devin Rodjek switching it up to get down the inside of Petr Beljak, who's on those medium tyres. He's had an off already this race, has the Croatian driver, and Devin Rodjek might well be able to sneak his way through. Got the up and under at the final corner. Rodjek's got fully alongside, heading through the kink of T1, down towards T2 in the Andretti hairpin. And Devin Rodjek up to 16th position. Lovely stuff. Just picking up from other drivers' uh, other drivers' mistakes. But whilst that was saying, uh, Yes, Dennis Jordan has set the fastest lap of the race at a 1 minute point 0.2. I was thinking that we might well get 61, 62 laps of the race. I think we might well just get the full 60 as Marco Pejic comes into the pit lane. He does indeed, and his teammate Bono right in the back of Chinchik. So it's been a good first stint for Mercedes. Very much looking like one stops at the moment. That was a grimace inducer, wasn't it, into the last corner from David Morocek. Great yes. move, actually, to, to try and make it happen, but it was just a bit too late and needed well to back out of it, avoid the contact and uh, they all run away happily as we see Jeffrey Rietveld, our championship leader in the pit lane. Now, we heard from him last time after taking the win at Cote d'Azur. He was more fussed about the team's championship than the driver's standings. Right now, even though it looks like his driver's standing, is, his driver's championship, I should say, is not going to happen, the team's standings are still looking very good for Redline. So I'm not sure Jeffrey Rietveld will be too upset at the moment. Yeah, unfortunately uh, for some, unfortunately for five, uh, at least the drivers that are within championship contention, it is all going to plan at the moment for Redline. They are looking very comfortable at the moment with Jeffrey Riefeld coming out in 14th position. This is Davin Morocek around the outside, though, uh, of that one will be Ferris Stanley again. So a nice little move once more from Davin Morocek, picking him off the look instantly in the background. Michi Hoy is trying to find his way past uh, Berliak into five, up towards six. It's not really good overtaking opportunity, certainly not in these cars. You're carrying so much speed, 800 brake horsepower to throw you through the corner, which is just about flat in qualifying. A bit of a lift. You can get it flat just if you are uh, if you take the right line on some fresh tyres, but realistically, you're not going to be doing that. It's too much risk. No, and especially when you're following someone else as well. The visibility is not going to be perfect. So very, very tricky indeed, and very easy to get it wrong. And this, there's some really good battling going on at this part of the as we see Michi Hoyer again having a slight look to the inside 
of the Williams of Petter Burlak. So yeah, the positions are constantly changing at this part of the, the race. And this is, of course, where it really matters for the relegation battle. So it's great to see so much action. Michi Hara now looking to the inside into turn two. Lovely stuff from Michi out yeah. of the Andretti hairpin into P17. That was textbook. Very clean, great stuff. And of course, awaiting a couple of these drivers to make pit stops around him is the old Michi Michael Hoyer, who's now up to 17th. And he'll try and find his way past as Bonnerhaus and Kevin Siggy, importantly, come into the pit lane. Thankfully, by the time that Kevin Siggy was released from his box, Bonnerhaus had already got his way past because there is contact on in the pit lane. You can see Ibrahim Khan into the pit lane directly behind. So where are these two going to show up in this battle? Alex Siebel and Dennis Jordan for the Oracle Red Bull Racing Esports team. They're on the rear end of Yajovski, who's using push to pass to defend. We're on board with Alex Siebel now. He's got to look to the outside, coming down to the Andretti Air, but he's going to send it down on the brakes, though, on much fresher tyres comparatively to the car that's on the inside. A little bit of a rub between the two of them as they leave the second corner he's got the inside though for t3 alex siebel's not going to send that one the driver that was on the podium in the previous round of the circuit that is your is not making his way to it now as the yellow flag pops out in sector three yeah that was great defense from yoyovsky on the inside just nice and calm kept his positioning spot on didn't allow alex siebel a sniff without doing anything too forceful so some great racing between those two they've you know been great all season it has to be said siebel in particular has been fantastic these last few rounds he's picked up some great results unable unfortunately to pick up a perfect result into the andretti hairpin there as we see now Marcel Chinchik into the pits as well. And uh, yeah, Kevin Siggy's timed this perfectly by running so long uh, into his first stint. He's actually avoided a lot of the dangerous traffic. He is behind Adam Maguire, though, who definitely is two stopping. Yeah. Uh, so that's, you know, that's not necessarily for the outright Whoa. lead as we see a big lockup from Erhan Yajowski into the pit lane. I said earlier, you know, we see some big lockups into that pit lane. It's a tough one to get right. And he was very fortunate to keep it out of the wall. A lot of luck, but equal amounts of skill. I don't know if you saw the, uh, the driving of the pace car from Roman Grosjean. Uh, around Laguna Seca where he went into the pit lane and completely smashed it into the barrier. That is what I thought was going to happen to Erhan uh, Yoski there, but thankfully he managed to keep himself out of it. So Adam Maguire will lead, uh, I'm pretty sure, his first laps of his Formula Pro career. Now, whilst he is doing a two-stop strategy, it's Marcel Cincic had a big moment right in front of one of the Netrex Grand Prix. Oh, wow. Jan Wojnitsa read that perfectly coming through there. That was so close. That could have been incredibly nasty. We saw a big crash at that corner in the Formula Challenge race a yes. week ago. And uh, similar circumstances, car spinning, back on the track, massive collision. But well done to everyone involved there. He kept the brake pedal on, kept himself straight, and that allowed the Netrex car to be to predict what was going to happen, avoid the incident. And that could have been a major shunt, but we thankfully didn't see it. Yeah, we did not. Now Patel's got Siebel behind, both of them using push to pass, though. Down uh, to complete another lap through T1. Is Alex Siebel going to get to the inside? Mohamed Patel defends it in the same way that Erhan and Yoski did, and this time Siebel's not going to try and force his way around the outside. He was just about trying to keep alongside as they head through T3, and Mohamed Patel uh, is going to hang on to what is third position at the moment. The two behind of Alex Siebel and Dennis Jordan uh, are going to be coming in for another pit stop at least at some point in the next 26 minutes and 30 seconds, because that is all that is left to go, not only of this race, but of the Formula Pro season of 2022 as well. Where's Alex Siebel going to find his way through? He never made a pass on Erhan Yoski. He had to wait until he came into the pit lane. Yeah, and the braking zone for the court screw is too short in these cars really to realistically make a move. I thought for a second I might have been proven wrong there by Alex Siebel, but it's going to be very tricky in there. So really the main overtaking opportunities are going to be into the final corner and into the Andretti hairpin. So let's see what Alex can do all over the back of Mohamed Patel, who's having a really solid race. BS competition in general having a great race as we see him now diving into the pit lane and releasing the Oracle Red Bull cars with the Mercedes, of course, just directly behind them. Now, I've got a nice, tasty bit of information for you because once Maguire comes in, once Siebel and Jordan uh, come in, that will put Siggy in first, that will put Bonner House in second. Now, what happens to the championship there? Well, if that happens, Kevin Siggy will still win the championship by one point. Yep. It's close. Wow. Siggy's only two points behind Bono at the moment. Um, but, of course, the gap for, for between first and second is three points. So as long as Siggy wins, he cannot be beaten by Bono. Um, but it just depends on what's going to happen. Siggy looking very good at the moment, though, Lewis. Obviously carrying no weight. He's done his pit stop late, so he's got nice tires. He's got a decent amount of fuel. Maguire definitely going to be making a second stop. So, I mean, it's Siggy's to lose at this stage, isn't it? Really is. 100% is. Uh, Kevin Siggy has control of this race, has control of this season. And what a year it's been. 
uh, for Kevin Tiggy, of course, winning the DTM Esports Championship and then uh, the, the little shootout thing they did to give him a drive, uh, I think it is, a driving DTM trophy for next year. We'll be taking to the real racetrack uh, following the pathway of the likes of Moritz Lerner and Tim Heinemann. Uh, who have taken to that championship, which for Kevin Siggy to get a, a break like that is such a fantastic effort because he's a great driver. I mean, sometimes a little bit too aggressive, but races like this, days like this, days like uh, Daytona as well, show exactly the level that Kevin Siggy operates at every single day in and out. Absolutely, and you, you need that mentality to be able to perform. You know, sometimes the moves are cutthroat. Well, it's, it, you need to be able to ride that line a lot of the time to get the results done. And, and Siggy's been incredible this season. You know, since the start, he's always been the one that stood out as, as a guarantee that he would be near the front, you know, somewhere. He's been very, very consistent, very solid. And, you know, I talked about Michy Hoyer you know, doing so many different series. Kevin Siggy's the same. Mm -hmm. He does so many different series, but he's hugely committed to his practice, puts in the effort and fully deserves, you know, the pace that he's able to show he's earned it. As Marcel Chichik, this is the instant we saw earlier, so he gets on that sausage curb, does the right thing, locks up the brakes, and that is just about what saved him from contact with the Netrex car. So well done, everyone involved there. Not great for Chinchik, who's had a nightmare these last few races. Unfortunately, it's uh, read that quite well. Did the yeah. classic sim racer thing of there is a car getting stranded and I'm going to keep my foot in, but um, each to their own. The two behind didn't exactly lift either. So, uh, you know, <laughs> read into that where you will, because Payich and Spork weren't going to uh, lift off of that. But. I've, al I've always been told that if you see an incident unfolding in front of you, aim for where the car is right yes. at that moment, because it's likely that they'll move from there. Now, obviously, that's kind of what happened there. We saw the car going off on the left and coming back to the right, so he's aimed for the left, and it's worked out for him. But obviously, if Chinchik had been a bit slower and locked up the brakes earlier, maybe we would have seen a different outcome. That's but yeah, oval racing uh, technique, that is, is yeah. you aim for where the car is, which sometimes works when there's a big, uh, <laughs> the big one at Daytona, you yeah. ain't getting around that. It works got until to it doesn't. Hope. <laughs> yeah. But you're absolutely right, yes. Uh, although, if you try and explain that one for race control as to why did you keep your foot pinned and then uh, add it to the instant and you said, well, I was aiming for the car. <laughs> well, I don't think Jimmy Allison and race control will look at that too happily. Yane Simicic then uh, into the pit lane, out on the soft tyres for the next 22 minutes and 40 seconds. It has been a dismal day for Yane Simicic and he has gone a lap down. Yeah, not did not expect to be saying that. That's, of course, his third stop of the day. So Simoncic, complete and utter nightmare. And, of course, it's not great for Burst either in terms of the points. So, uh, yeah, real disaster for those guys. Bono's still looking good. It looks like he's going to just fall short in the championship. But, I mean, he's so close. And considering he hasn't quite had that outright lap pace, his consistency, Lewis, has been mighty impressive. And, yeah, it's not going to be a championship for Bono, but we've seen this relentless, consistent side from him, a little bit like what we're seeing from Mercedes in Formula 1 right now. You know, they're consistently there. They don't quite have the outright pace, but able to maximise points at every opportunity is not going to be quite enough, but a great result nonetheless. Like I say, to get through the entire season without a victory will be a painful uh, moment for the likes of Bono House and the mercedes MG Petronas Esports team. But either way, uh, they'll still be aiming for something. Dennis Jordan and Alex Siebel have switched over position then Dennis Jordan uh, taking over uh, third spot at the moment and actually we're dropping down now to fourth as Bonner House will be dragging his way back up to it and Jordan and Siebel will be coming under pressure because they've got to pit again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's going to be, it's going to change. The race is going to change for them very soon, shall we say, as we continue to watch this uh, rocket sandwich with the two Williams cars, Petter Burlak in 20th and Romanidis, of course, in 18th. I think this this really does suit Williams because you know they've got the rocket cars where they want them. Obviously, Danny Kish is having a nightmare down in 22nd position. So as long as things stay like this, I believe provisionally it should be okay for Williams because they are three yes. points ahead of Rocket as it stands. And like I say, either side of this and with the poor round from Danny Kish so far, Williams Esports will be escaping relegation, I do believe, going into that relegation battle later on this evening once this race has uh, finished. It will be Rocket, Sim Sports and Team Fordzilla uh, jumping in again with the Predator uh, RHG Esports team with PFK Sim Racing and with NeedRacing.com and their uh, newly signed series champion of Formula Challenge in Christian Mikel. And of course, you again can vote on whether will be racing for the final race uh, over over the relegation battle that is done uh, on Twitter and in the YouTube chat as well. The vote will be going on until the end of this race, until our season is properly finalised, uh, in a sense, at least uh, provisionally. We'll have to wait for race control to get over all those results. But at the moment, yes, things are not looking good 
Rockets in spot. Yeah, speaking of race control, they're going to have many eyes on this race, trying to work out as quickly as possible the uh, any post-race penalties, anything like that. As we see a pit stop, actually, for uh, Romanidis in the Williams car, so that opens up Ferris Stanley, although he's not really going to have any break because he's obviously got Petto Berlak right on the back of him still. Got um, McGuire in as well. Yeah, yeah, of course, that's leader in, and that is the stop we knew was coming, and he pretty much hits the 20-minute mark, so it's three 20-minute stints, very consistent from Wolves. I, I think we'll see Dan Brewer in the next lap as well, and that's going to drop him back, but, but Maguire's going to have really good pace, Lewis, yes. at the end of this race, and it's got to be said, yes, okay, the guys around him are making the one-stop work, but Maguire is still doing a great job. It may be a two-stop, but he's going to come out the pits in a decent enough position here with good pace, and he could still pick up some great points. I think, you know, he's not... I would say that removing him from the idea of being on the podium is actually would be a mistake. I think he can uh, potentially do it. He's obviously going to close in on Colin Spork. Spork, uh, Wojnitsa, Siebel and Jordan are all uh, expected to pit once again, which means that the, really the podium battle will betwe be between Bonner House and Marco Pejic, who are presently sat in fourth and sixth. They'll be expected to go up to second or third, which, by the way, for Marco Pejic, what a round uh, so far when the Mercedes AMG Patron and Z-Sports team need him the most to back up something. I mean, he is there. Absolutely. I mean, he was in a tough position coming in when he did. He was replacing, obviously, all the hype that surrounded the Jarno Otmir appearance, and then Jarno had such disaster. Marco had a pretty tricky season the year before uh, in that Mercedes second seat, so there was a lot of pressure to come back into this cauldron, into the pressure, and perform uh, in that second seat. is tough, and he's done a really, really solid job. Super. Okay, he's not been fighting for any wins, but he has done a great job, and today is probably the best drive so far for him this season, and it's oh. really going to help Mercedes in the championships. We've seen he's called Spork in the pits, and this is probably why. Maybe not a scheduled stop then for Spork. Bit of oversteer through the apex. Continuing to saw the wheel. Lovely bit of drifting there. That was, that was beautiful. I think his tyres were done. Uh, so he's <laughs> coming, in, comes into the pit lane to uh, get on some mediums. I know that was pretty much just stating the obvious, but Colin Spork will now see out the chequered flag uh, on the medium tyres. Uh, Got to say, for, for Page, by the way, if you want to speak of stats, his highest finish in Formula Pro over the entirety of last season was fifth. The fact that he can come back uh, and battle and maybe aim for uh, for a podium, at least at some point on his return, would be uh, an incredible result. And not only that, I mean, you say that he's not exactly been contending for race victories. Well, to be brutally honest, neither is his teammate. Uh, well, exactly. Considering he's won six races as Bonner House uh, in the previous season, six from six. Well, I mean, I think Payet has been doing an absolutely stunning job. Jan Wojnitsa comes into the pit lane as well to promote Payet and Maguire up another one. I think, though, Payet is going to be hard-pressed to keep Maguire at bay on those brand-new tyres. Yeah, I think so. You know, Maguire surely does have the pace today. And he, at the moment, he's in P6, but he's only going to get better for him. So, as you say, don't rule him out from uh, the podium slots. Another fun fact for you. Do you want to know who has the fastest lap? It's Dennis Jordan. It is Dennis Jordan, yeah. I was going to say, he did set it earlier on in the race, so uh, obviously that was uh, when he got these tyres on brand new. They are running lighter to cars uh, at the moment, but he needs to keep this this time on. Adam Maguire, there he is on the rear end of Payic. Tur goes through turn six in the number six. In yeah. sixth spot at the moment. It's coming on the sixes right now, but where does Adam Maguire find his position? He followed him quite closely there uh, through turn six. I was surprised because it's tricky to follow through there, but yeah, Maguire clearly got the confidence and he used all the curb. A ah, beautiful apex from him there, all the way up to the exit curb, using a bit of curb under braking as well, just placing the car wonderfully. A bit of sausage curb right Whoa. up the back of Marco Pejic through the final corner. We're now going to head down the straight. He's got the slipstream. He's going to be on the push to pass, but Pejic on the push to pass as well in defence. Maguire's going to go outside. He's going to duck to the inside. Late on the brakes, Pejic covers him off. Maguire does well to get it stopped. He's going to try and squeeze into a gap that wasn't really there, but he made it happen. Really good driving from both of them. Respectful, a little bit of door banging, or wheel banging, I should say, but that was, that was brilliant from both of them. Great defensive effort from Pejic on the older tyres, but Maguire had too much for him. Well done. Don't know what the heart rate update is, but Michi Hoyer moved himself up into 10th position at the moment. But yes, that was a lovely move uh, from Adam Maguire to get himself up into 5th. Now, once Dennis Jordan and Alex Siebel come into the pit lane, it should mean that Maguire will be up in 3rd. So, uh, again, the great drives uh, continue whilst we were talking after the first round of the season uh, at how great uh, Maguire had driven. Then the pace really kind of wasn't there for a couple of rounds, and we were saying this is a carbon copy of 2021, where they started out great at Spa and then were, to be quite honest, pretty rubbish for the rest of the season. 
Well, that's not been the case this season. Adam Maguire has been delivering time and time again for Wolves GR, and he's putting on a great show. Marcel Cinchik is going to be the next one to try and pass Marco Pejic as he'll try and get to the outside and send it in. Medium tyres versus medium tyres. Marcel Cinchik not able to pass right now, but Marco Pejic is dropping backwards. And if his tyres are struggling like this now, I fear for what they're going to look like in 15 minutes' time. We'll take a look at the replay. Yeah, it looks like Mitchy Hoyer on board. Bit of a lock-up from the BS competition car ahead. Another bit of wheel banging. Hoyer barges his way through, uh, caused by the lock-up, of course, initially, but that left the gap open, and Hoyer was going to make it even bigger. So through he went, and we now cut back to Petter Burlak in the Williams Esports car. They're almost safe, Lewis. They've just got to keep it safe, keep that rocket car firmly in the sights. I mean, these two have been following each other for the whole race, it feels. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of put onto the back foot as Alex Siebel does come into the pit lane by the way there were rocket sensors were put onto the back foot right on the first lap of the race after an issue for Danny Kish and then he had to come into the pit lane uh, also a post-race time penalty uh, as well to be dished out to Kish uh, and so unfortunately it is not going to go well uh, for them but with Danny Kish behind Michael Romanidis but with Petr Boyak directly behind rocket sensors at the moment it would still be very very close between the two of them but of course we do believe that there's going to be a couple of pit stops coming uh, in this group Michael Romanidis being the first to have already made those yeah absolutely so he'll probably um, slot back in somewhere around this group and he would probably be ahead of them and um, but then of course he's going to struggle a little bit for pace against these two later on so it's all swings and roundabouts really but they continue on and uh, yeah it's there's just not really been much happening Petter's just happy to sit behind the rocket car uh, and take home P18 and Petter you have to say is, is that a good season it's been thanks to him that Williams are looking likely to survive and make it through to Formula Pro without the relegation playoffs. So uh, he's just been very, very solid, picking up midfield points all the way through. It maybe didn't go so well for him last time out, but yeah, you have to say he's, he's really kind of dragged that Williams car forward and, and has given them the chance to, to remain in the series next season. Well, he came into the season uh, of 2022 without a top 10 in the championship. He picked up two to open up the season uh, with an eighth and a fifth place, and he currently runs 10th in the championship, although that is a position I will almost guarantee he's going to lose to Colin Spore because here comes Alex Siebel then out of the pit lane and straight on the attack as he gets past Jeffrey Rietveld in the race down into turn one. Well, that could be a decently sized move. Of course, Rietveld uh, and Team Redline battling out with Oracle Red Bull Racing Esports in the team's championship, but with a 20-point advantage for Team Redline and with Kevin Siggy out front, I don't think there was any need for Rietveld to risk that one, and he knows it. Absolutely, yep. This is not his race. He's looking at the overall positions, of course, and, and with points all the way down to last place, Rietveld cannot afford any kind of unnecessary issues. We see Jordan now making his second stop. Uh, S Siggy's got this covered. He's won this for red line uh, based on his results today because, you know, Jordan and, and Siebel are doing a great job considering it's a two-stop. Rietveld's nowhere to be seen, really, and they needed Siggy to be up there, and he is just absolutely delivering out in front. He's got a 13.2-second lead now over Bono, who's on a similar strategy, of course, and then the charging Adam Maguire already, Lewis, back up to third place. Adam could still finish second as Jajowski is missing his front oh. wing. Big shame for Erhan Jajowski on his return. In 15th position, we've seen a couple of front wing uh, issues. Oh, is this going to be at the worst place in the world for a front wing loss? It is going to be. Oh, into the final corner. Bang out into the barrier. He can't turn left to get back into pit lane, and he must complete an entire lap uh, without a front wing. That is a terrible shame for the Macedonian. He brings it into the pit lane, does Jajowski. 16th position whilst his teammate up in fifth trying to attack Pejic to go and grab himself fourth. You're absolutely right about Adam Maguire. He is close losing in uh, on Bonner House on the previous lap. I mean, there's only a tenth of a second, but I get the feeling that Maguire is, he's feeling hungry right now. And Anthony Nitzpond uh, behind the scenes, again, running the strategy for the Wolves GR Esports team, will be very happy with what he's seeing as Maguire's hunting his first podium. Absolutely, and he, you know, he fully deserves it based on the season he's had. Let's just hope things don't go wrong for him like it did at Spa. Let's hope he can keep it going and it'll be great for Wolves. And you know, what a way to confirm uh, get staying out away from the relegation battles because Wolves were towards the bottom. They were in that fight with the likes of Rocket, with Fordzilla and with Williams, of course. But this is some way to get to, to haul yourself out of that battle. And of course, it's worth remembering, guys, you can still vote on the circuit for the final relegation battle. Is it going to be Sebring or is it going to be Indianapolis Road Course? And not only that, of course, that means that that vote is for races later on this evening. So once Formula Pro has, uh, has done, once the season is complete in 10 minutes and 50 seconds, time do not go anywhere it's not just post-race interviews we'll be dealing with today but it is also relegation also that will follow immediately after Formula Pro as Marcel Cinchik gets onto the rear end of uh, Marco Pejic and trust me whilst this race 
could be classified potentially as calm. The relegation races, I promise you, will not be. There is a lot on the line. Two teams fighting out for their spot in the 2023 grid of Formula Pro, and there will be five in those relegation races, which means, as you pointed out earlier, three teams will be leaving that very, very unhappy. Yep, so much pressure, so much to lose, and, of course, a great prize to gain and the chance to fight for a lot more prize money again next season. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure it's going to be stressful for any of the drivers involved in that one. But it's going to be great to watch, Lewis, you know, seeing seeing uh, five different teams with two drivers. It'll be interesting to see the tactical element of it as well. Will they work together? Uh, will they just go for solar results? How are they going to play it? And they're going to be very intrigued. And, of course, the tyre strategy as well. The teams have to use soft, medium and hard, three different compounds, one yeah. in each of the three races. Uh, so that is going to be something worth thinking about as well. There's a lot to think about when it comes to, uh, to that race. And... I can't wait for it. I think it's going to be an absolute thrill ride from start to finish. Well, all three of those relegation races. A bit of a moment there from Peter Belyak, who hooks it up to the apex just after a bit of a snap. Of course, he's trying to find his way past one of the Rocket Supersports cars. We head back up to Marcel Chintik on the rear end of Marco Payet. Closing in, that is an ominous sight. The two Oracle Red Bull Racing eSports cars trying to get themselves inside the top five. They're charging up to the rear end of Marcel Chintik. Uh, I believe both on soft tyres and both on pretty fresh soft tyres as well. As we heading to the final nine minutes uh, of the season. The third car in this shot, by the way, so you've got Pejic, you've got Cinchik, who's in the middle, and then you've got Ohanyovsky, who's a lap down. This is Jan Wojnitsa trying to get himself inside the top ten, though, and he's got Mohamed Patel holding the door very much closed at the moment, nearly into the rear end with Jan Wojnitsa there, as he just so close to clouting the rear end uh, of Mohamed Patel. He's also got his teammate Colin Spork uh, jumping up the order to try and close in, to try and assist his teammates, to try and get them both inside the top 10 netrex. Grand Prix, one of those teams, as there is an issue, which that was Erhan Yovsky again, uh, unfortunately, for the RHG Esports team that's causing uh, a bit of an issue there. There he is with no front wing and no rear wing. The netrex Grand Prix, one of the teams that's looking to save themselves completely from relegation. They were really uh, in that battle. They were 11th position going into the circuit that is your great result from Colin Spork and a great couple of rounds for, uh, for Laurent Kearsmaker as well to, to really assist the team to boost their uh, strategy. They are brand new to the season as Danny Kish retires from the race for Rocket Sin Sport and by my money that confirms Rocket Sin Sports as going down into the relegation battle unless something dramatic happens for Williams Esports and the lone Rocket Sin Sports car uh, is able to move itself up the order just a touch. Erhan Yovsky then into the pit lane. It has been a very stressful day for the Macedonian and returns to the pit lane, not just without a front wing this time, but without a rear wing as well. Such an enormous shame. And we like to see drivers return to the championship and put on a great show, put on a great result. This for Rohan Yanyovsky is absolutely not that. Coming into T4 now, takes that sausage curb like his teammate did earlier on in the race, only that one, John, pushed him straight out to the barrier. It did, and it's been a nightmare for Yanyovsky. Um, just, just not the race he would have expected. He was looking a little shaky in practice, a little shaky in qualifying. And uh, we did see some flashes from him, but just, yeah, just one too many mistakes. And uh, it's a race for, to forget for the RHE driver. Which is such a shame. I mean, it was a race to forget for his teammate in the last round at the circuit de Azur as Marcel Cincic picked up his first retirement of the season as Jan Wojnitz is looking to pick up his first top 10 of the season in the final race, in his first race, as he looks to the outside of Patel, who, once again, defending very well. He did defend quite well uh, earlier on in the same way that Jovski did, but this one, as we close in on the final uh, few laps of this race, it's going to be even harder to try and make a pass. Yeah, it's been a great debut for him so far. It really, really has. He's, he's shone because uh, a lot of the drivers that have come in have been towards the back of the grid. Understandably, whoa, whoa. I should not have spoken, Lewis. I absolutely shouldn't have spoken. I mean, he did well there to avoid the contact, but that was that was some uh, big defending from Mohamed Patel, shall we say? He was very slow off of T5, was Patel. This is how Danny Kish retired from the race. A big snap of oversteer into T3, uh, and that is two wheels ripped straight off of that car. So, or one wheel rather, it was just the front. I thought the rear had been ripped off as well uh, but no he is out of the race Marcel Cincic has a lot to worry about though because Alex Siebel is knocking at the door this is the battle for fourth position Marco Pejic with Marcel Cincic and then the two Oracle Red Bull Racing Esports cars directly behind Alex Siebel and Dennis Jordan sixth and seventh right now a bit of a wide moment there from Dennis Jordan Marcel Cincic is going to be able to hang on as they race their way T5 the next one it's a good overtaking opportunity if you're close that to me way too far back yeah, absolutely. Uh, but it's, it's funny seeing those two menacing Oracle Red Bull cars split by barely anything, as they have been all season. 
and uh, Chinchik right in the mix. You know, these drivers have been very close all season, it has to be said. Chinchik's been a star at certain points as well, obviously taking a race win, being right up there, but it's just been a struggle this latter half. But he's doing well to hold off the two Oracle Red Bulls, obviously going for a more aggressive strategy today. Doesn't look like it's going to win them the championship. And of course, at RG haven't had a great race either with the Yeovsky's issues, so it'll be um, interesting to see where they end up in the team standings, but I don't think they're quite going to make it into third. We'll have to wait and see. Um, but yeah, two, two teams who, in general, I have to say, are probably going to be satisfied with the way their seasons have gone. Yeah, both teams and drivers' championships uh, with five minutes left to go in this race. At the moment, will be heading their way to Team Redline. Kevin Siggy with the title of the drivers by a single point over Bonner House. And then, of course, uh, the team's title would go to Team Redline. By quite a few points, they hold a 20-point advantage coming into this round. And with the positions being held with uh, a first uh, for Kevin Siggy and an eighth place for Jeffrey Rietveld, just a point uh, position behind uh, the two Oracle Rebel Racing eSports cars as Mitchie Hoyer. Oof. I mean, that was a pretty aggressive send uh, there to get down the inside of Dan Brewer. But, uh, I mean, he made it work. I, I thought it was a fantastic cutback initially to almost put through the dummy very, very close between the two of them. But Mitchie down the inside, made the, made the move late in the brakes. OK, he locked up a little bit and it did cause a little bit of uh, contact. But by that point, he was mainly ahead of him. So I'd say uh, that is a good move from Mitchie as David Mrocek practicing his drifting skills and he's going to get a little nudge from the net Rex car and P13 behind him Spork. that is Colin Spork um, but managing to hold it all together as Spork's going to look to the outside that's not an overtaking spot they'll try and force Morocek into a mistake almost does so but not quite as we see this fantastic helica helicam into the final corner looks like a, oh yeah good exit for Morocek bad exit for Spork and that position is going to stay the way it is and how aggressive was Colin Spork in the previous round with that great move down to the Val chicane he nearly tried a couple ones uh, into Lavrascas as well at Circuit de Azure that one was being uh, dubbed the Colin Spork special what does he have to do around here to find his way past uh, David Morocek it'd have to be a pretty big send because the pole is hanging on uh, from the flying Dutchman directly behind uh, right now I'm, yeah I'm a, I'm a little surprised that we haven't seen more of a of a charge between Maguire and House. I really did think that Maguire would, would come on strong. I think he burnt his tyres out trying to catch him early on. Quite, quite believable, <laughs> yeah, with 20 minutes to go as well. I mean, he's had great pace. I and mean, I think he'll be delighted, Lewis, if he, if he holds on to third place. I really do. That'll be uh, the best result of the season for Adam Maguire. And it could have been, a, you know, it could have been a really good championship position, really, uh, had he been a bit more consistent. We see a car in the pits with damage. Edis in the pit lane again. There's Damian Scoffron also in the pit lane. So this is a bit of an issue for Romanidis, but you've got to remember that Danny Kish uh, is out of this race so with the point swing at the moment it should still be the way uh, of Williams eSports right now to stay in uh, Formula Pro and Rockets going to the relegation battle as there's a defensive move from Marcel Chinchik trying to break the slipstream uh, of Alex Siebel who um, well, this is not an endurance race, we're not going to talk about it in depth, but I do know that Alex Siebel and Dennis Jordan both race without the lights on, so, um, you know, oots to the run on that. I definitely can't. No, I can't. It hurts my eyes far, yep. far too much, okay. so lights have we're to be We're old men. On. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I thought maybe we're just not good enough sim racers. Maybe, uh, maybe it doesn't make a big enough difference. <laughs> but a house on the push to pass, obviously, in second position. He's not doing anything when it comes to uh, changing a position. He's not closing down on Kevin Siggy. He is uh, just trying to burn some of it because he's not really been using it. He's been a bit alone over the second half of the race. Marcel Chinchik is trying to find his way past Mar uh, Marco Pejic, who's looking for his best result in Formula Pro. Unfortunately, it won't be a podium. And I think Alex Siebel might well be able to help, uh, or might be able to help himself past Marcel Cincic, who's trying to help Marco Pejic, really, at the moment, because the longer that Marcel Cincic hangs on, Marco Pejic's not able to get through. It's going to cause some issues. Boyak and Simoncic going side by side. I mean, this is not a position I thought I'd be talking about. These two battling, two FSR World Champions, racing over 17th position. Bit of a wide moment there from Yane Simoncic. Absolutely. And, you know, this isn't completely over yet. If Burlak has a DNF, it could still be open in terms of where these two teams are going to finish so he needs to be careful but he was careful you know Simoncic obviously not having a race to remember um, but they're very very close there and that was good to watch both giving each other a wide berth despite a lot of aggression heading into the corkscrew as we see there uh, Simoncic weaving around again in the braking zone uh, but Bur Burlak won't want to fight this too hard no I mean I'm I'm just, again, baffled to see two drivers of this stature this far down the grid. It shows that it has really not been a day. Bojak, of course, uh, didn't get a qualifying lap in and had to start from uh, the back of the grid and then was sent off down into T1 to uh, one Netrex car uh, queuing up to the back of Patel. But obviously, Marotchek there as well and Colin Spork 
also closing in. I believe on time, by the way, because of where Kevin Siggy is. This is not the final lap of the race. I think it is the penultimate uh, lap, and you can see that there, because guess who's coming round to start the final lap, not only of the race, but of the season? Kevin Siggy, way out front. It is indeed. You know, it's been a great season for him, a great season for Redline. Oh. Simicic's race just goes from bad to worse to worse again as he's off the track, going to come back on. Uh, but yeah, we want to talk about what's happening at the front. It uh, looks like at the moment it's going to be Siggy winning the championship from Bono House in second. So the one two in the race, one two in the standings, with Reitveld finishing third in the championship. And in the team standings, it looks very much like Redline are going to walk away with the title here with Red Bull or Oracle Red Bull Esports, I should say, in second position. So lots of happy drivers. The Red Bull drivers not really able to fight for the drivers championship today like they might have hoped but they will be happy i think with second in the teams but this man kevin siggy is the star of the show lewis he's dominated from the beginning of this race he's been strong throughout the season had a few small uh, ups and downs throughout but you have to say he will be fully deserving of this championship yeah all the drivers were coming up to me telling me before this round that this driver was the favorite for the crown and as he departs the final corner he is going to take it here at laguna seca kevin siggy up towards the line with not only a second win of the season but it is the championship as well by just a single point on our mats Bonner House will come across the line in second place one point behind that is going to be a painful defeat for the series champion of 2021 but Bonner House still will round out the season with a decent podium no wins onto the podium with them though Give a hand to Adam Maguire. What a super strategy it's been behind the scenes. Wolf GR Esports score a podium as it's a drag race to the line. Marco Payic just beating out Marcel Jinjic. Dennis Jordan and Alex Siebel do switch themselves around, but it's a pretty disappointing day for Oracle Red Bull Racing Esports, just sixth and seventh as they cross the checkered flag, but it will still be second in the championship. Yeah, and as a great amount of prize money for those two um, but even bigger amount of prize money for the team redline duo kevin siggy and jeffrey reitveld what a season it's been for those two and what a race it's been for siggy specifically here today at laguna and there is our champion he even managed a little smile as he crossed the line there kevin's very calm uh, normally but uh, yeah you, you saw the emotion there coming out a little bit and i'm sure he will be absolutely thrilled with that now we will just say very provisional uh, champion, although I think he did anything uh, really wrong there. And also, our maths could be completely wrong, which I wouldn't rule out. We are commentators after all, and one of my big rules as a viewer is to never trust a commentator's math. Now, not only uh, is that provisional, but also these results are as well. Provisional standings of the final race of the season. Kevin Siggy taking his second victory ahead of Bonnerhouse on the podium once again, and Adam Maguire welcoming himself to the podium for the first time in his Formula Pro career. Mark Marco Pejic with a personal best result with fourth place as well, ahead of Marcel Cincic and the two Oracle Red Bull Racing esports cars of Dennis Jordan, Alex Siebel, trying an aggressive one, so two-stop strategy. Jeffrey Rietveld came into it as the championship leader, eighth place. To be fair, I think he'll be happy with that. The team's championship should be going to Team Redline. Ibrahim Karma Mohamed Patel round out the top 10 for BS competition. David Morocek finding his way past Jan Wojnitsa on the final lap of the race, just ahead of Colin Spork. But NetRex Grand Prix should be safe uh, of relegation with a 12th and 13th spot. Mitchie Hoyer in 14th, a bad day for Burst Esports. And unfortunately, that is the highest driver of their team. Daniel Brewer in 15th with Beljak, Stanley, Yerne Simicic down the order in 18th. Michael Romanidis and Damian Skovron are down the order in 20th before we get to a couple of retirements in Erhan Yovsky and Danny Kish. And no starters for the Team Fordzilla uh, squad, meaning that they'll definitely be going into relegation. But also, they should be joined by Rocket Sim Sports as well. Rachel, it was a pretty dramatic race, that one. But Kevin Siggy looks like he's done the work. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, and you said something um, very, very true. For Kevin Siggy, it was a very calm race, wasn't it? From getting pole position, he he made it look pretty seamless. I know it was all down to strategy. And also, to keep his calm and cool, knowing that if he messed up at all, that is it. Um, so it was a great race for him, but yeah, very calm. It's kind of akin to what Jeffrey Rietveld did in the previous round, wasn't it? Where mm. he took pole position and took a, mm. an extremely dominant uh, victory. It kind of has that, uh, that, that same aura around it of just the control in the race. It's, it's almost giving that vibe of even if he had 10 kilos on board, he still probably would have won that race. He was yeah. so dominant. Yeah, you know, we talked about how much of a difference it made in qualifying with those extra few little tenths of a second. But Siggy did not win by a few tenths of a second. He dominated out mm. there. It made a big difference as well, in my opinion, lap one. You know, Maguire getting up to P2, Bono going for the lead. 
it could have been so different. If Bono had led this race early on with a small amount of ballast, we could have been looking at a very different result now, but he didn't manage to make it happen. He had contact with Chinchik, and for me, that was probably the defining moment of the race, not to take away from Siggy, because he was perfect, calm, and collected all the way through, and fully deserving of the championship. Yeah, totally agree. And also, that one point, oh. how do you think Bono is feeling? Because also, let's, uh, let's look at this. At the beginning of, of the season, Bono wasn't reaching expectations at all. He was struggling. So, I mean, it is great that he's ended the season like this, but that one point must be a killer. I think, you know, as uh, having finished runner-up in a couple of championships, nothing to, uh, of this level. I'm, I'm pretty sure you must have done at some point as well, John. Uh, uh, either way, when you finish one point, ten points, whatever it is, uh, off of the championship lead, all you do is you sit there after the season and you think, hang on a sec. Where did I lose just one point? Yeah. And you, you, you think of all these examples where you, know, you, you lost a position out of a mistake there. You didn't qualify high enough here. There are so many examples where you, you, you miss a penalty or, or two there. It's just, a, it's just a big issue, Rachel. But, you know, that's the championship. That's the game they play. And uh, Bono will be well aware of that. Yep, that's racing. And talking about racing, let's talk to our race winner, Kevin Siggy. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, now, we have said that for you, you dominated that race, which you did. Um, it looked a very calm race for yourself. What would you say, like, you know, what was, how do you feel that race went for you? Obviously, you did incredible, but did you feel it was calm? Did you feel it was quite a textbook race? Uh, yeah, I think definitely it was a it was a pretty calm race because um, it, the only hectic thing was probably turn one, but even then I was on the inside and I had pushed the pass, so I so I just used that and held my ground in turn one because there was literally nothing you could do around the outside with no grip there. So uh, afterwards, as soon as I saw that and as as soon as I figured out McGuire was um, on a two stopper and I knew if I did six laps I would keep the, keep him behind. So I mean my setup was just absolutely insane for for the race. So uh, I think for me it was kind of the easiest race, even easier than Daytona, if I would say so. Really? I mean, you again, you made it look really easy. Um, one point ahead of Bono House. Um, did you expect to end the season like this? Um, I was expecting it to be a little bit better, but because of the uh, the kilo thingy in the rules with the 10 kilos or 7 kilos, it's like, it's so, I don't know, for me it's super stupid, but um, I think they're just trying to kind of, um, I don't know, balance the talent, right? Uh, but I think in my opinion, I wasn't really the, the best of uh, out of everyone in this season because I was really doing pretty badly in qualifying a couple of times, and like I was, I was just so stressed with this with this car. I just didn't like it. So uh, I think for me, the only goal was to win the the team's title. I mean, whoever would win the the driver's title, I wouldn't I wouldn't really care. Uh, but in the end, I was I mean I was kind of lucky enough to uh, to get the right setup in place 30 minutes before quali, and uh, I literally just sent it and hoped for the best. Um, and you mentioned there that you weren't that happy with the car. Um, what do you mean by that? Uh, just in general, I, I don't feel comfortable in, uh, in open wheelers, especially when uh, this car doesn't have, uh, well, when you set it up for like low downforce tracks, I just have no confidence in qualifying. And since it's only like two shot qualifying, it's super hard for me to really nail the lap uh, as opposed to Jeffrey or Bono or Yernay, right? But um, I mean, in the end, luckily with this high downforce track and with the setup changes I did 30 minutes before quality, I, I really got into the rhythm and I felt super comfortable in, uh, in the car. So finally, the only, the only kind of track that I felt uh, best at was this, um, maybe even Daytona. But yeah, those were the two outliers for me and my whole season. Just every, every other track, it was just, uh, so, I mean, I was completely toasted at that point. <laughs> oh, you! To be honest, you nailed Quali today, and you obviously nailed this race, the final race of the Formula Pro Series. Absolutely um, incredible um, race for us to see. And you did mention there that you, um, you know, you struggled. You didn't necessarily like the ballast, um, but again, it obviously didn't affect your driving in this particular race. Uh, no, I didn't, but it did affect my teammate, which uh, which I kind of mm. do feel bad because the tank kills really really put him in a hard place, especially mentally and also the setup stuff. Like he couldn't he couldn't really use my setups or anything that I I proposed to to make it better. So it was just a tough race for him, and I think that uh, even even for Yerne, for example, it was also tough for him, which is kind of unfair. So I think these things have to change. These things have to be removed. It's like a, they've tried it in GT Pro and it was a complete flop. So I think they should remove it here as well, just to 
just because the car is actually the same finally now and finally we get to see who is the best individual driver instead of having to look at six different manufacturers so uh but yeah i mean it, it played into my hands uh even if i wasn't the best or anything but yeah i mean it, that's the jungle isn't it Oh, you did incredible. You really did. And you led by uh, quite a quite a pace. So congratulations, our winner of the Laguna Seca final round at the Formula Pro Series. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thanks. Appreciate it. Well, there we go. Our winner. Um, what, what did you think to, to what he had to say? Well, you know, I, I was interested in what you were saying about the ballast. Mm -hmm. um, basically, you know, as a driver, it's always going to be frustrating if you feel like you get punished for doing well. So I can completely understand his perspective there. Mm. Obviously, it's good for entertainment because it means it's unlikely for someone to run away with the championship. And obviously, we saw Simoncic leading lots of it, but struggling to kind of maintain that with the weight. So it mm. kept it close. But I do understand where he's coming from. You know, we've got the opportunity to see what these drivers can do on a level playing field and the, because there's not a difference in the car development. They are identical, right? So it's, it's an interesting conversation, and I'm sure the organizers will be having a discussion about it. But I have to say, it's just a great season for Kevin it all together and although he's frustrated about that he, he will be delighted with the result come tonight yeah totally agree well look let's have a little look back at the highlights yeah what a fantastic season finale it was with Kevin Siggy starting for pole position it was the race down towards the first corner that would see Bonner House getting to the outside trying to attack for the race leader bit of a lock up though for the Formula Pro champion of 2021 and he received a little bit of contact as well from Marcel Ginty because he tried to get on the power and promoted Adam Maguire up into second position as there was a bit of chaos in the background Damian Skovron receiving a bit of a bump and then there's the squeeze on the exit of the corner David Morocek getting into contact with this driver Danny Kish who would lose his front wing and uh, also squeeze off one of the net wreck Grand Prix cars and then just after that Damian Scovron will be sent off by Danny Kish who would give Danny Kish a 30 second post race time penalty. Jonas Simicic was trying to find his way past Bonner House as they head through the corkscrew but Marco Pejic was sat there waiting a bit of a moment as well from Adam Maguire who was right on the rear end of Kevin Siggy but this moment would drop him back three seconds and into the clutches of the train behind. Jonas Simicic though with the big send on Bonner House going down into the corkscrew it run him out a little bit wide into the barrier and he'd lose his front wing what a day it could have been for Yone Simicic we can see it all in slow motion such a shame for the Slovenian who came into the round as second in the championship a bit of a moment here for Marcel Cincic because he'd head through T4 and he would go for a big slide and a very close moment to a retirement as Jan Wojnitsa would come around the corner just about avoiding Marcel Cincic and also Marco Pejic and Colin Spork would also miss the ailing Hungarian who dropped back behind as well, Dan Brewer, who was trying to make uh, a bit of a charge up the order as Adam Maguire post pit stop was also on the charge. Payet was the first one that he tried to tick off up the inside with a beautiful move to the outside of T3. They just about make it way through with no contact between the two. It really was super from the Irishman that was charging them. Speaking of bad days, Erhan Jowski on his return to Formula Pro will have a bit of a slide into the final corner, losing his front wing at the worst place possible. And then later on in the race, he'd be out towards the barrier, losing his front and rear wing, and he would retire from the final race of the season. On his return to the Formula Pro Series, Danny Kish would also join him in that retirement list after a boom moment into T3, losing his front wheel and being unable to bring it back into the pit lane, which is a bit of a shame for Rocket Sim Sports, who look to head their way into uh, relegation as Kevin Siggy would depart the final corner to crown himself as champion of 2022 and crown himself a second victory as well and the championship as well for team redline after a super performance what an incredible drive it was that leaves us with these very provisional uh, championship standings kevin siggy winning it by a single point over bonner house jeffrey revelt in third dennis jordan in fourth and issues for yone simicic dropping down to fifth in the championships just ahead of alex c well marcel chinchik came into the round seventh in the championship and it's exactly where he finishes despite a, a decent result. Mohamed Patel and Adam Aguirre up to ninth in the standings with Michi Hoyer, Petr Belyak and Ibrahim Khan for the BS competition team. Colin Spork in 13th position for NetRex Grand Prix. Well, they were having some issues at the start of the season, but they really did respond. Uh, Davin Rocek as well, the series champion in 14th place, uh, which is a bit of a shame for the series champion of, uh, of Formula Challenge. And we'll have to wait and see if the series champion of Formula Challenge from this year can do better in Formula Pro next year if he's even in it. 
to enter the relegation races. There you can see the team standings, and of course that means confirmation not only of the champions, Team Red Line, with Oracle Red Bull Racing Esports picking up second and Burst in third. Uh, well, just before we get to that, well, actually, we'll run you down the rest of the results. You've got Mercedes AMG in fourth, RHG Esports in fifth, with BS Competition in sixth position. Wolves obviously standing out today with Adam McGuire in a great drive in seventh. Netrex eighth, and Baikal is in ninth. Williams just hanging on, and then we are going to get into the relegation races, which are going to include the unfortunate Rocket Sim Sport of Ferris Stanley and Danny Kish, and Team Fordzilla, Nuno Pinto and Gianmarco Fiducci. What an incredible three races we are going to have coming up for us in a, in a moment. Well, let's talk about the relegation races. Uh, three heats. Lewis, talk us through it. Yeah, so, wow, when we get to the relegation, we'll start ourselves off with a race at Imola. Then we'll go racing at Silverstone. And then, of course, uh, the final round that we'll be going to, which has been voted at by you at home. We'll be heading to Sebring in oh. Florida. And what a lovely race circuit it is. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love Sebring. You know, we talked about the bumps earlier, but there's so many good corners. Great overtaking opportunities as well. And there's going to be double points on the line for this third and final race at Sebring. We will, of course, cover the format for you shortly. And um, plenty of time to wrap our heads around it all. But it's going to be a frenetic finish to the night. There you can see some shots of Sebring. Tricky curbs, lots of bumps, lots of chaos to come. But the drivers do tend to like Sebring, I think. Mm. And I absolutely love the fact that um, everyone has voted for, for Sebring. I think that's a brilliant way uh, to end the relegation races. Um, it's going to be fantastic. So we've got, let's just um, go through. Oh, actually, we've got an explainer VT coming by. But just to let you know, there'll be five teams and ten drivers involved. So let's take a little look. Yes, indeed. We'll see the bottom two from Formula Pro and the top three from Formula Challenge going head to head as they battle their way for the 2023 places on the Formula Pro grid. The three races will be split up with 10 minutes on a random grid, 10 minutes on a reverse grid from the race on results, and then race three, 15 minutes long, which will be a grid from the points uh, added up, the points total from race one and race two, and double points will be added up for that final race. Each driver must use a different compound for each each of the races, so soft, medium and hard. If you use a compound more than once, then you'll be receiving a pretty hefty penalty. The top two teams are promoted to Formula Pro for 2023. And as you said, John, that means that three people, three teams, six people are going to be very unhappy. Absolutely, yeah. It's going to be interesting to see um, you know, who's going to make it, who's not. There you can see the teams. Philip Drace, who of course finished third in the championship, teaming up with the Formula Challenge champion, Christian Mikel. We've then got Risto Capit and Timotej Andonovsky for RHG. They're going to be definitely ones to watch in this one. Turk Hakkinen and Rory McDuff, two very strong performers in Formula Challenge. Turk Hakkinen getting through despite finishing fourth because Christine Mikel and Philip Dreis have decided to team up, which is very interesting indeed. And McDuff, of course, another strong driver himself in the championship. We've then got the, the teams we've seen tonight, or at least one of these teams we've seen tonight. Rocket Simsport, Ferris Stanley and Danny Kish. And then, of course, Fordzilla, Gianmarco Fiducci and Nuno Pinto. Just one thing as well to clarify, for the second race, the reverse grade is not uh, based on the result of the first race. It's the reverse of the starting order just so that it's fair so whoever starts on pole for the first race for through a random draw will be last on the grid for race two keeps it all exciting keeps it fair and it is going to be exciting i'm very sure of that I yeah i can't to expect. i literally can't wait i really can't i think we're going to see yeah not not just some brilliant racing, but I feel in my mind, do you know what words coming to my mind is chaotic, but I don't want to say that because, you know, it probably won't be, but I think people are going to have everything to, to fight for. I think it'll be chaotic. Okay, <laughs> I, was not I, was I, will, I will say it's going to be chaotic. I think the most chaotic part, and I think it's the best part that we could do with this. Anyone who's uh, joined us as well for the GT uh, Pro, GT Challenge uh, relegation promotion races that we've had uh, before would kind of know that these do get a little bit hectic. Whilst they are small grids, they're small races, they are designed to be a little bit more crazy. But one thing that uh, really adds to this is that tyre rule, John. You, mm. you've, you, uh, as drivers, you have to use the soft, you have to use the medium, and you have to use those horrible, horrible hards, which means you have to plan your way through. You have to think, right, I'm going to have to take softs in this, mediums in that. No, I want soft in the end, so I've got to go hard, medium, soft. What do I want to do? Well, exactly. And I think, you know, we talk about chaotic, Rachel. I think it's good chaotic, to be honest, yeah. because you were, you oh, know, yeah. we're also seeing drivers uh, using the hard tyre for probably the first time all season. There's been lots of medium and soft uh, strategies, medium, medium, soft, soft, medium, medium, whatever you want to call it. We've not seen the hard tyre used much because it's not a great race tyre, but they're going to have to use it for at least one of the three races. I think we will see a lot of teams opting for the soft compound in the final race because there's double points on offer. It's only 15 minutes the last race, the first two, of course, 10 minutes. 
but the soft tyre should last 15 minutes. So I think we'll see most of that at Sebring if the uh, if the drivers are thinking, unless they want to try something different. Maybe put the soft on the first race, try and pick up the points early, get themselves a better starting position for the third and final race. Well, with both of your experiences um, oh. commentating, would you say it makes more sense to start with the hard, get that over and done with, and then really attack with the, uh, the, the softer tyres? I think it depends where you start oh. uh, on the yeah. random uh, draw, because of course, if you do start uh, from the back of the grid, then mm. I'm like, right, I'm getting the hard tyre done. If, if, if I have the hard tyre in that, or if I had the 10th you know, place, for example, or even ninth, if you're on the hards and then there's chaos ahead of you, well, you gain positions from it. So you've actually gained points uh, on those hard tyres. Then in the next race, you might be starting towards the front on those medium tyres. I want to take advantage of that. I want to mm. start on those mediums, and then I've still got those softs. I think pretty much everyone has to save those softs that final race. Yeah. If you're not, you're going to be in big trouble. I, I'm, yeah, I'm fully with Lewis on that one, Rachel. I think from my experience, it depends on qualifying. If you're going to do a bad, if you're starting in a bad position, then you're going to have to start from the back. And obviously, you know, if you're starting from a good position, yeah, make the most of it. I, I would think it, all the drivers will probably be thinking exactly the same. They've got a lot of experience. So um, yeah, we'll see a variation depending on position in the first race. Yeah, well, look, very quickly. Uh, in the first race, it's around grid. The, the, the Heat 2 uh, is a reverse grid from the start of Heat 1, and Heat 3 is based on the sum of points of Heat 1 and 2. And yes, it will be quite chaotic, good chaotic. We're going to see a lot of energy in this relegation races. Um, who's your money on the first one? I know you can't really have favourites. I'm not saying you're going to have favourites, but who do you think is going to do well in this first round? I mean, again, I don't, I don't know what the, the, the full grid is, but I'll give you a prediction as to what I think the teams will be that are going to go through, Ooh. which I don't think, as much as uh, I know Fordzilla, they've been working very, very hard behind the scenes to try and get themselves. That's why they didn't take part in this race uh, at Formula Pro, because they kind of accepted that they were going to be in the relegation race. So they've had the same kind of uh, go through that mm. the Formula Challenge drivers have had, where they've been able to sort of get to grips with whatever circuit was being voted for. But I've got to say, I think from Formula Challenge, needracing.com with Christian Mikel and Philip Dreis. That is a scary lineup. And then uh, Predator R8G. You've got Risto Capit and you've got Timotej Andonovsky, two incredible drivers in that. I think those two teams are going to be very hard to beat. That said, Turka Hakan and the Roy McDuff are very good. I would say all three of the teams, no disrespect to the two teams from Formula Pro that are in here, but mm. the level of preparation, the level of speed from those two, they're in Formula Challenge for a reason, you know, they, they weren't in Formula Pro, mm. but those two, are, th those three are incredible teams. I think it's coming from them, and I think it's more likely Predator RHG uh, and NeedRacing.com. It's, it's funny you should say that. <laughs> I, <laughs> Sorry, Rory. If I was going to make the predictions, uh, I was actually thinking exactly the same two teams. Uh, basically, you know, NeedRacing have got two strong contenders there. They've decided to throw their eggs into one basket. They obviously feel like the two of them, as a pairing, have more of a chance of getting into Formula Pro than splitting them up uh, and teaming them up with someone else. So they're clearly very confident, and we've seen how quick those two have been. They just need to see how they'll adapt to the Formula Pro car, which they're going to be using tonight. And of course, R8G, um, okay, Risto Capit didn't win the championship at the end, but he very much could have. Andonovsky, hugely experienced. But I think, the th I think the thing that's crucial for those guys is that they are part of R8G, who have a very competitive Formula Pro team. They will have definitely be getting some pointers, probably some setup advice as well. So for that reason, I think R8G are going to be possibly the strongest heading into it. Um, but let's wait and see. Yeah, definitely. Let's wait and see. Very quickly, um, out of the three different circuits, which one, which circuit do you think will be the most exciting racing we will see? Sebring. I definitely, I, 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 I definitely think Sebring. Now, whilst uh, Imola and Silverstone are quite, they're tight circuits, yeah. you know, they're tight Grand Prix circuits, so fair enough. Sebring is something a bit different. It's a bit more open. You've got the passing down into T1. You've got a passing opportunity on the end of the enormous Ullman straight down towards sunset, the final corner on the uh, on the circuit. And then you've got Big Sense coming round, Big Bend into the hairpin. There's there's a lot of opportunities to pass. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, of all the circuits, that's the one I enjoy driving probably the most. Um, but I can't agree with you on everything. So I'm going to go with Silverstone because <laughs> yeah. you know the racing at Silverstone, we've seen it in, in recent years in real life racing and sim racing, mm. is always incredible. So many overtaking opportunities. That middle race is probably going to be a bit more chaotic as drivers make their final moves um, towards you know the, the final race, trying to get themselves as high up the grid as possible. In the last race, they'll have more to lose, I think, so they might be a little bit more careful. Race two is still all to play for, so we're going to see some chaos and some great chaos, as I keep saying. I hope so. 
Yeah, great chaos at Silverstone. Won't be the first time or the last time that sentence has been <laughs> said. Um, and Imola, what kind of track is that for people that, you know, may be watching this for the first time or are intrigued to see what uh, the relegation races are like? What is Imola like for the drivers? Well, it's a tight one. It's a difficult one. It's one that bites. It really bites. Uh, Tamborello, the first corner, you've got to watch out because you want to, basically, it kind of kinks over to the left. Uh, just as you want to kind of get onto the brakes, uh, commit yourself through what is a a very difficult tight chicane uh, and when you have those kind of bits when you've got uh, you know, Villeneuve as well you've got high commitment corners like Piratella it's insanely insanely difficult we can see our drivers now so in the top right you've got uh, Gianmarco Verducci and Nuno Pinto those are the two team Ford Zilla drivers you've got Rory McDuff on the right hand side in the middle his teammate is the one that's on the bottom on the right hand side that one being Turka Hakkinen right in the middle of the shot is Philip Dreis and Christian McHale for needracing.com you've got Danny Kish and Ferris Stanley in the top left. Those will be the two driving for Rocket Sin Sports. Risto Capit and Timotei Andonovsky, uh, of course, RHG drivers. Risto Capit having driven for RHG in 2021 uh, of Formula Pro and Timotei Andonovsky having done some good stuff in Formula Challenge. Of course, those two will be taking up the mantle for the Predator RHG team. Some really, really good drivers in there now. Well, I know it's all team stuff, John. Uh, we've always speaking of which team is going to come out on top. Who do you think is going to score the most points? Which driver is going to Ooh, score the most points? I like this. I I'm back in Risto, personally. Risto really? Kappa. You know, he was really strong in Formula Challenge, and he didn't quite get the the order, the result in the end that he that he could have, I think. Um, and I know how consistent he is. I know how hard he works as well, and how much he really wants this. Mm. Um, so, I, you know, I'm I'm saying if I'm putting money on, it, I'm probably going with Risto Kappa. He's very consistent as well. Um, there's, there's a lot of, of big talent in that field, though. So it's going to be interesting. Christian McHale. I, I think Christian McHale's going to do it. Formula Challenge champion. Yes, he did it by picking up the piece. Pieces, but I think, I just think that this, this kind of format, the craziness that happens, Christian McHale's very good at reading it. Yeah, he's very good at crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He'd be dealing with us quite well then. Yeah, it's very <laughs> true. Very yeah. true. It's going to be tough as well for the guys that have just jumped out of Laguna. Now, Imola is quite a similar style of circuit to Laguna in, in some ways. It's fast flowing corners, narrow, not much room for error, lots of curbs, uh, but sausage curbs you don't want to hit as well. But these guys are going to have to very quickly, you know, they've just, they've just been knackered probably, yeah. you know, doing a full race, or some of them have, at least the Rocket guys specifically, uh, and they've been fully focused on Laguna. They're going to have to just like recharge the batteries and go for three more races. That's not easy. No. no, and that's the thing. Where are they going to find that extra energy from? Or is it just pure adrenaline? I can't describe I think pure adrenaline is mm -hmm. really it. Can't really describe it, but uh, when you start a race, you just kind of get more involved with it. I can't really uh, describe more than that. We've all kind of had it uh, yeah. where, you, whatever reason, you know, you've not slept well the night before and mm -hmm. you're just kind of thinking, God, I'm so, so tired. You get to a touring car race in the evening, you've got three races ahead of you, and somehow, despite being absolutely knackered and at death's door about uh, <laughs> 20 minutes before the second those lights come on boom you are wide awake and ready to go yeah that that is true to a degree and um, i think you know <laughs> especially with triple headers like touring cars <laughs> and stuff like that you can make it work formula pro though is very intense to drive and 60 minutes is a long time it's a bit like doing a big stint in lmp but where everything's on the line at that very moment and in endurance racing you know you very much do enjoy the break um i would you know i have to say my worst ever sim racing performance came when i did a sprint race having just done uh or been a part of a 24-hour race where I was knackered and I did think I would find the adrenaline but I just couldn't actually bring myself to do it I was I was just drained and my eyes were tired and uh, so, so I would argue that yes you can find the adrenaline when you need to a lot of the time but it's not always easy if you are actually mentally and physically drained your worst drive wasn't Wednesday night then <laughs> I don't think it was all right. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Just ignore the last. You, you the didn't first you take a win. Fine. It's fine. Yeah. I'll, I'll allow it. Yeah. Handbags at dawn here. But you saw actually with um, Timothy, um, like stretching, having to like, um, he stood up from his chair. Like you've got to keep that like energy somehow, haven't you? You've got to kind of wake yourself up, like physically too. Yeah, I remember when uh, well, you get a bit of nervous energy around this. Yeah. Now, I'm sure that a lot of these drivers are fine with it, but I do remember taking my uh, first pole position. I, I remember beating you for that one as well. Uh, it, no. But uh, I do remember I had to leave the room. I was so uh, so nervous about it. I think a lot of these drivers, they're, they're very good at dealing with this kind of stuff. And that but pressure. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Like you say, they've got to get out of the, out of the rigs. Whilst these rigs, yeah, for the most part, are quite comfortable. Mm. Uh, Turk Hackenhurst definitely didn't used to be. It used to be just a wooden chair uh, when we did Le Mans <laughs> Virtual. But yeah, you've you got to get out. You've got to breathe. You've got to stretch. You, you've got to just kind of get back into the rhythm somehow and, yeah. and kind of keep your eyes focused on the, the movement because if you're uncomfortable, you're not quick. No, absolutely. You know, the guys need to take advantage of the break as well if they've just been in that race, um, get a drink, 
go outside for a minute, take some fresh air in. Yeah. I do think there is one advantage going for the drivers that have just been competing in Formula Pro, and that is that you know they've, they've just had the big defeat. They didn't make it into the safety zone. They, they, they ended up getting relegated, so they've had the big loss. Now it's time to, you know, well, we've got nothing to lose. Let's just see what happens. Mm. The guys in Formula Challenge have worked all season just to make it here, and everything could go wrong in turn one. So in some ways, you know, they're the ones who've, who've got themselves there and could lose it all, rather than have already been through the upset and then could suddenly find themselves okay again. Mm. And correct me if I'm wrong, when you have everything to to fight for, to drive for, you uh, you, you put it out of the bag normally. Yeah. You know, you you just go for it. Well, some do. Uh, yeah. you know, some, some crumble, some, like me. Some definitely do. I mean, I, I would crumble completely. I, can't cope. I'd say Marco Pejic did in uh, in four wheel But you're absolutely right. You know, some drivers. When you need to, you do just find that kind of that extra little bit, that extra mm. little tenth. Now, I'm sure a lot of these teams have been practicing as well on the circuits because whilst we've yeah. known uh, the first couple throughout the week, they've been able to at least get a few laps and get ready uh, for this. But the idea being, you know, especially with this final race, is that sure they would have thrown some stuff around on the uh, on, on, on a couple of tracks that we've mm -hmm. had you won't have had the same level of practice for this as you would do for a stand around a formula challenge or formula pro well i believe we are ready to see this in action this is heat one of the relegation race Well, we are ready to do battle in relegation as things are going to get very heated. Let's take a look at the grid then for the first race of the evening. Danny Kish and Philip Dreis on the front row of the group with Timotei Andonovsky and Gianmarco Fiducci in fourth place. Of course, this being a 10-car grid, we'll see Rory McDuff of PMK Sim Racing in fifth. Risto Capit in the triple eight from sixth place. Christian Mikel, the Formula Challenge champion on seventh. Ferris Stanley in eighth. The final two cars on the grid being Turka Hakkinen and Nuno Pinto. This one being the reverse grid draw, or the reverse grid, the random grid draw, of which we will reverse in the next race when we go racing at Silverstone. But Danny Kish with the whole shot, take a look at those tyres. They're looking pretty soft to me. Is that so soft? It might well be. And I, I guess if you're on pole position, that, that just gives those you that mediums. extra bit of confidence. Uh, drives on the mediums, which we expect most of the drivers from, you know, well, honestly, I expected it from first down to maybe about sixth to be on the mediums. Um, but yeah, uh, maybe he's taking it, taking a risk. And it's like we said, if you try something completely different, it might well pay off for you. So, so good luck to him. I might have been going pretty crazy there. Uh, but of course, for anyone who uh, hasn't really joined us through Formula Pro and Formula Challenge, the way the tyres work, white wall is soft, yellow wall is medium and those look like they're hards green walled tires those are hards which Risto Kappen is getting away straight away it might have been green wall tires on uh, on Danny Kish at the front they'll line up on their grid this is going to be a pretty intense race down towards Tamborello it is yeah it's a huge starting straight but actually they start quite far up it so it's not as long as you might think a run towards turn one now all the drivers at the front they're going to need to capitalize on this I'd actually quite like to be the back for this race because then you've got nothing to lose you can gain position and you know you're going to be starting near the front for the next one so Nuno Pinto I think will be quite happy back there in P10 well the relegation journey is about to begin Danny Kish on pole position the first of three races as they get ready to race their way maybe into Formula Pro. What can Danny Kish do? He's got Philip Dreis alongside in the front row, Andonovsky and Gianmarco Fiducci behind. We go racing for 10 minutes here at Imola in the first race. Great start there from Risto Cavani gets past Rory McDuff on the run down towards T1 as that is the move to the outside for NeedRacing.com. It's Philip Dreis trying to make it stick in way too deep though and that's a big moment from Danny Kish sweeping through to the race lead is Timotei Andonovsky. A big moment from Kish in the background. He's lost his front wing as a thing slotting through in the rear end. That is Turka Hakkinen trying to make it three wide in the race down towards Villeneuve. It's Rory McDuff in second. This is looking great though for RHG. Absolute nightmare for the lead two, especially Danny Kish and Rocket. You know, those guys starting from pole position need to make it count. I said it'd be good to start from the back because it takes away that pressure and instantly they are looking very much like they're going to struggle to get through. Also a terrible start from Gianmarco Fiducci uh, who dropped all the way back to the start. You can see he just didn't get off the line well at all on those hard tyres. Nuno Pinto on the other hand on the softs going all the way from 10th to P6. 
Yeah, essentially wasting those soft tyres. You can see how many are trying to get the hards out of the way straight away. There is Gianmarco Fiducci dropping back to ninth position. A big shame. Like I said, I, I, I called it as Roy McDuff. I will correct myself. It definitely was Gianmarco Fiducci who was directly ahead. As Here's the two needracing.com cars. Philip Dreis being allowed to pass by Christian Mikel. So the switch of position uh, sees Philip Dreis go back up into fourth position after being sent off a little bit by Danny Kish. Push to pass being used, though, by Risto Cap. It's seven tenths off the rear end of Rory McDuff as Timothy Andonovsky is taking control. Absolutely, and it's looking great for RHG at this very stage. Andonovsky out in the lead. We see side by side for Fiducci and the rocket car that doesn't have the damage, of course, that is Ferris Stanley, but they are now sitting ninth and tenth. It's not looking good for them. Really interesting seeing Nuno Pinto starting from last but using the soft tyre Lewis because he obviously thinks he's going to get all the way to the front here. It puts him in a really weak position later on so that I was shocked to see someone start from last being on soft. But there we go. As we see the replay now on board with Danny Kish over the kerb, he, he had, they were side by side. He couldn't leave the room because he hit the rumble strips and it almost got even worse for the other guys into the next section but uh, it was Kish who ended up paying for it and it looked like it was his mistake I've got to be honest a big shame uh, we're getting a word from race control there is no penalty for the T1 thing for Danny Kish uh, I think he's served a harsh enough penalty by uh, having to return to uh, pit lane and being very much in last position for Rockets since it's not looking so good at the moment as we look backwards from the hard tyre running Risto Capit and of course, the drivers behind, Philip Dreis and Christian McHale, these are the two that he was battling with the Formula Challenge Championship for. And I think they might well try and pass fairly soon. The hard tyres are on this car, and it is the mediums on the car behind. Absolutely. It's, it's not looking good for um, the, the two teams from Formula Pro here with Fiducci and Pinto 6th and 8th, Stanley and Kish 9 and 10. So it's going to be, uh, based on the first race, of course, a long way to go. It's going to be a battle of these Formula Challenge teams like we thought it might be. Now, Cap at sitting third position on hard tyres. This is so good for him because he's getting rid of that worst tyre. If he can just defend for another seven minutes, remember, it's only 10 minutes, these races, not many laps. If he can just hang on for even a top five position on those hard tyres, he will be looking very good indeed. McDuff, of course, in second place, also getting rid of that hard will be in dreamland right now in P2. I wonder if Need Racing, though, they, you know, they're sitting in a good position in terms of the team's points because both of them are up there in the top five. Uh, they might be quite happy to just sit there. Obviously, you know, Dreis will want to get past Capit with his tyre advantage, but Mikel on the hards, you know, I don't think they'll be too disappointed sitting fourth and fifth right now. It's a good place to be at this early stage. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, to be fair, I'm just going to say, if Rory McDuff and Risto Capit can get rid of their hard tyres with a second and third, what a super drive. And I'm going to say, based on what we're seeing here, they're definitely going hard, medium and soft. If you're starting this race on hards, you're doing the mediums in the next one. Turka Hakkinen runs a little bit wide, also on the hard compound tyre right on the rear end of Nuno Pinto, who's running the softs uh, in this one. And just a reminder to you, if you didn't catch our little explanation earlier on, there are three races in relegation and they have to use different tyres in each of them. Philip Dreis uh, getting uh, the push pass being used behind, rather, by Christian Mikel, his needracing.com teammate. Philip Dreis on the rear end of Risto Capit on those medium tyres want to get through six minutes left to go in this race plenty more opportunities as they'll race through Tamborella. I think it'll be about four more laps from this point there's plenty of time to get their way through but it is a tricky circuit to pass at it is a very tricky circuit to pass at yeah lots of as we said high speed corners which really does you know create dirty air these cars are pretty good it has to be said at following you know they can follow pretty closely around these corners lots of traction zones as well slow speed acceleration where the rears are going to kick out and you're basing yourself on mechanical grip where the tires will really come into their own and make that big difference we now go on board with the third place man Risto Capit he's got the accelerator fully pressed now as we head towards Aqua Minerale or as I like to call it mineral water corner heading back up the hill back on full throttle you can see there and now McDuff in P2 is going to be loving this because he's using up the hard tires as well but he's got the uh, obviously the uh, RHG car Risto Capit behind him also on the hards doing the defending for him using his tires to try and stay ahead of Philip Dreis. Now it's also worth mentioning of course push to pass 10 seconds uh, only in total in this 10 minute race so there's they've got to use it wisely we've seen some of the drivers using a little bit already um, but you really really have to think about when you use it it's essentially one or two shots and there we go Risto Capit on it right now he obviously feels this is the moment he's got off it quickly because he's got such a good slipstream so really smart driving by Capit he's going to move to the outside of Rory McDuff as he heads to towards the first corner. They're going to go side by side towards Tamborello. McDuff holding on the inside. McDuff later on the brakes than Caput, who pulls back in to be nice and safe. Although McDuff's gone a bit wide on the exit, and that's going to allow Caput around Whoa. the outside on the exit of the Tamborello chicane. That is incredible stuff from Risto. They're still side by side, Lewis. This is insane. Oh. Yeah, Kappa that's Rory McDuff. Rory McDuff has gone wide. This has opened the door, though, for Philip Dreis to come through. He drags through his needracing.com teammate on Rory McDuff as well as they depart Toza. And Risto Caput, who's gone up in a second position, might well be losing it. In 
immediately because look at Philip Dries as they come up towards Piratella. One goes through, two goes through. That is Christian Mikel also passed as his championship rival Nuno Pinto on the soft tyres coming through. That's a disaster for PMK Sim Racing. Absolute disaster because they're now down to sixth and seventh place and it was looking so good as well for McDuff. But that's what happens, you know, you get side by side, things can go wrong when everyone's so close. And look at just what it's done for Andonovsky as well, Lewis. He is home and dry here, five seconds clear. Uh, so whatever happens to cap it here in P4, it's still going to be a decent start for Predator R8G. Um, but yeah, just really, really good racing. Side by side, it's not so good racing into that turn because McDuff trying to go down the inside of Nuno Pinto, I believe. This is teammate. Oh, uh, maybe Hakkinen, sorry, yeah. Yeah, it's Turka Hakkinen trying to get down the inside of Nuno Pinto. It's Roy McDuff trying to get down the inside of his teammate in the PMK Sim Racing team uh, as they will tick off another lap. Nuno Pinto's under a lot of pressure because Turka Hakkinen's charging and Turka Hakkinen going to look to the inside, outside, which way is he going to go? He's on hard tyres trying to take on the soft tyre runner that Nuno Pinto is on at the moment. Gianmarco Viducci 2.7 seconds off of the rear end of this train. Roy McDuff's closing in his teammate, but these two, wow, they have teamed up an awful lot, whether it's for Hydro Esports, whether it was at Cetres Nita Velix, they also think they did a little bit of a stint at Singularity as well. These two get along very very well, and it's why when Turka Hakkinen got promoted up into that, uh, it, it got the invitation to come into this, who is the first person he's going to call? I didn't even need to ask. It was always going to be Rory McDuff if Turka Hakkinen got that opportunity, and that is exactly where it went. You did say that to me on the night of the final Formula Challenge race. You said that was how it was going to play out, and it did indeed. Um, but, you know, not the best start for them now. I mean, especially looking uh, at the, I mean, the top four. As we see, that was Pinto getting very sideways. I don't know if he's going to have saved that, is he? Yeah, it seems to be still going okay. That looked like a very big moment indeed for Nuno Pinto of course on those soft tyres he's made his way up from the back of the grid we now watch Risto Caput but yeah as you can see the important thing here the top four is just two teams it is the two that uh, we actually predicted might be the two that go all the way now there's a long way to go but it's RHG uh, Predator Esports first and fourth and second and third we have Need Racing looking like they've made the right decision to throw both eggs in one basket here in the first round as I say a long way to go still but looking very very good indeed for these two outfits yeah right now I mean obviously getting way ahead of ourselves but when it comes to the top two teams which is the bit that we're focused on right now as there might be a switch as Nuno Pinto's on the rear end of Risto Capit points as it goes is 64 points over to the Predator R8 G camp and it is 63 points going the way of needracing.com 46 to PMK Sim Racing so they will be losing out and then you can see as well with uh, where the Team 4 Dilla cars are and where Rocket Singles are well they're going to be Looking like they're going to be on the back foot for the next couple of races, but it is double points for that third and final race, so who knows? Yeah, exactly. Everything can change in that final race at Sebring, which is why, you know, we said you want to throw your soft tyres at that last race, because if, if people start spinning off, you know, and you end up finding yourself near the front, it's going to be hugely important. And that race will create the most uh, chaos, or great chaos, as we keep calling it, because drivers will have practiced a little bit less maybe than others because they weren't sure of what circuit it was going to be. As we see Nuno Pinto under a fair bit of pressure, actually, still from Turka Hakkinen. Now, sorry, just to check, Lewis, was Turka on the hards like his teammate McDuff? Were they both on hards? Yes, they were both yeah. on hards. Yeah. So they're both getting those out of the way early, which I think is a great strategy call. Yeah, that, that may come in very handy later on and important for them. If they're going to be picking up sixth and seventh in this race, of course, they want to make it better than that. Um, but Nuno Pinto's also wanting to make his position better on those softs against Risto on the untested and untried hards up to this stage in the season um, but not making it through yet 30 seconds to go this final will lap. be the last lap yes it will so it's a final opportunity for Nuno Pinto to try and get past Risto Capit who I don't know how much he wants to risk trying to hang on of course there's the look and there's Nuno Pinto trying to get to the inside oh wow that was going to be super super close but you got to watch out for Turka Hakkinen that move from Nuno Pinto might well have just cost him an awful lot of time as a head through Piratella because Turka Hakkinen's there and he'll bite at any opportunity he will indeed we've seen him all year he's been so so consistently quick right at the front and he takes advantage of opportunities as they come up for him and um, but he sits in sixth position right now he's actually got his teammate McDuff right behind him he's not going to try anything as we see now Nuno Pinto still in fifth position he's too far behind Caput to make a move it's actually the opposite it's actually Hakkinen who's all over the back of Pinto at the moment so positions could still change a couple of key moments in this race of course coming earlier on with the side-by-sides through the Tamburello but it looks like that's going to be it 
Yes, indeed. Final corner's ticked off. Timotej Andonovsky is going to race his way towards the line using the last of his push to pass as he heads his way for a victory for Predator R8G. He is on the medium tyres. Philip Dreis and Christian Mikel will come across the line for needracing.com in second and third. Nuno Pinto does not beat out Risto Capit. And so the top two teams after this race will be the Predator R8G team leading by a single point over needracing.com and around about a 15-point lead, I believe, back to PM. MK Sim Racing, a bit of a shame for Rocket Sim Sport. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, to be honest, both of those lead two teams will be happy that it was one other team that took up the other two spaces. Because I think, if, you know, if those two could communicate right now, if they're in, in conversation, they're going to want to almost work together to make sure that no one else catches them. I don't think these guys really care if they come first or second as a team in this event. It's all about coming in the top two. So if your other rival that's going to get through can take away points from whoever's in third, it's going to work in your favor. So I don't think either of those two teams will be disappointed by the fact that the other team is so close. Yeah. Absolutely. It, it doesn't matter. This is the whole thing is the same as uh, as what we were kind of talking about towards the end uh, of Formula Challenges. Danny Kish crosses the line in 10th. It doesn't matter really if you're first, second or third in that scenario. As long as you're in the top three, you move your way on. Obviously, you want to take the championship and same as in this. You want to win relegation. But if you're first or second, it doesn't matter. You get your spot on the 2023 grid. So the results provisionally for the first race here, Timotej Andonovsky, Philip Dreis, Christian Mikel, and Risto Capit, the top four. Of course, we're really talking about teams here, so it's looking very good for needracing.com and Predator RHG after the first race. Nuno Pinto on the soft tires, just fifth place for him before we get to Rory McDuff, uh, who was in sixth position, and it was Turka Hakkinen in seventh. Then Gianmarco Verducci before we get to the two. Rocket Sim Sports cars in ninth and 10th of Ferris Stanley and Danny Kish. Big disappointment for them, for Danny Kish straight away, and also a big waste of the soft tyre. Big waste of the soft tyre, big waste of the pole position as well yeah. um, for Danny Kish. So it was basically a complete disaster for him and for Rocket, to be honest. Uh, that, that result there, you know, they really needed to perform, and it, it went horribly for them. And in my opinion, that's probably them out of the mix already. Mm. How do you think Danny Kish is going to react to that? I mean, that was... Again, we said chaotic and it did reach expectations, but you know, to end up in 10th when you're starting at the front of the grid. That'd be big frustration, mm. but this it's kind of one of those things on an, on an evening like this, it will genuinely come down to the final race. And that means that even if Danny Kish heads into mm. that final race in 10th in the standings, he can still savour something for the team because it's double points in that third and final race, the 15 minute race that we'll have at Sebring. So I, I think you've got to take those moments and mm -hmm. think, right, that was rubbish. And we're going to be on the back foot a little bit for the next race. Yeah. Maybe get the hard tyres out of the way so you can be on the mediums for that 15-minute race and just take it. Yeah, forget about it and move on. You know, the double points does make that big difference. What if we have a situation where the teams in second and third are side by side in the last lap at Sebring? Maybe it comes down to a do or die move and they both end up in the wall. We've seen many people in the wall across the years at Sebring, very difficult overtaking spots, and they could just sneak in there with, you know, at the last moment with the double points. So it's not going to be over until the end, but it's not a good start, that is for sure. Yeah, very true. But Timotei from Predator R8G, who again is one of your favourites, um, do, uh, doing a Amazing, great start to the relegation races. Um, talk us through what to expect for race two with the reverse grid. Yeah, so it's the, to clarify again, uh, as I got it wrong, uh, thanks John. Just want to make right, sure everyone was aware. He just really <laughs> wants to just throw me under the bus on the broadcast, absolutely fine. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, it's the <laughs> reverse grid from what we've just seen, from the starting order of this race. So Danny Kish that started this race from, race from pole position, because it was a random draw, he'll start the, the race coming up from 10th place from the back of the grid because that's as you say makes it even makes it equal for everyone racing at Silverstone it's another circuit that's pretty hard to pass but I will say I think it's easier to pass than Imola absolutely and yeah. you know as, as I was saying earlier we've seen lots of great racing recently at Silverstone it seems to have come alive as a circuit especially with the changes in recent years uh, and it's always an exciting track on our factor we've seen Formula Pro race around Silverstone before of course and um, not this season but it's always an exciting venue so I think we will see some more action than we saw in Imola in terms of overtaking we didn't we didn't see a lack of action though we we saw lots of side-by-side -side into Tambrello. That's the two, the two main incidents in that race. Lap one, Tambrello between Kish and uh, Philip Dreis. And of course, uh, later on in the race, the Capit and McDuff incident as well. That's kind of what, what made that race what it was. Yeah, exactly. We saw a lot of passion. I think that's the best way to describe it from that first race. And obviously, we've got our second race uh, coming up. Uh, Lewis, I believe you're going to talk us through it. 
I certainly will talk us through <laughs> at least some highlights from the first race uh, that we just had. Danny Kish starting for pole position on those soft tyres. He was instantly under attack from the needracing.com car of Philip Drys. Bit of contact down into T1, though we tend it in a little bit too hard, using the sausage curve on the inside and guessing come through. Yes, Timotei Andonovsky straight through with Turka Hakan as well. A little bit of contact coming through the exit of Tamborello. And Danny Kish will be sent off into the barrier. We'll have to return to pit lane for some repairs. Gianmarco Viducci making his way past the second uh, of the Rockets as well. Carver and Ferris Stanley up into eighth position, getting rid of those hard tires with Gianmarco Vinucci as Risto Cavill was getting rid of his, but he wasn't settling for third position. He was trying to get himself up into second. A bit of a dive from Rory McDuff, getting in a little bit too deep, coming through Tamborello. Risto Capit would come through. Philip Dreis would try and come through. Also, as a side-by-side -side would continue up towards Toza. A bit of a moment off would go Rory McDuff, and then a big send to the inside. Needracing.com trying to get them way past Risto Capit, and that's what would happen up towards Pirate it wasn't just Rice though because Christian Mikel would book his ticket onto the podium in the first race of relegation. Risto Capit giving a lot of room heading through Piratella and dropping back to fourth, nearly fifth, as Nuno Pinto in the middle of all of that on the soft tyres, getting his soft tyres out of the way in the first race. PMK Sim Racing dropping down to sixth and seventh. Turka Hakkinen trying to make a move on Nuno Pinto on the last lap of the race. He'd be down the inside and uh, Turka Hakkinen was not able to get through. Timotei Andonovsky though would be out towards the line and he would win the first race of relegation, taking advantage of those medium tyres in sensational style. And that's exactly what you want to do. But a bit of drama for uh, for PMK Sim Racing. I think they might be a little bit disappointed because they were in a really, really good spot as we take a look at points uh, that I don't believe are correct because Turka Hakkinen uh, and Rory McDuff would not be up in P1, but I'm not 100% sure on that one. Either way, needracing.com and Predator RHG in second and third. Yeah, and we're hearing rumour there may be a potential penalty coming up, but we'll have to wait and see on that one, so we don't want to say anything at uh, this early stage. It did very much look at the initially like RHG uh, and, of course, the uh, lead racing team were going to be looking strong after that first round of the championship, so we'll have to wait and see on that one. But we will have a much clearer picture of how things are going to settle after this race at Silverstone. It's going to be a very exciting one indeed. Yeah, it really is. Um, and again, all down to the tyre strategy. Um, like we said earlier, each heat you have to use different different tyres. So we've obviously got the hards, the mediums and the softs. Um, and I would say the consensus says that race three is when they should utilise the soft. So who knows what people are going to use in race two? Well, I'd say with the six drivers that got rid of their hards in that race, they've got to commit. They've got yeah. to take the soft tyres uh, oh, the soft tires in the, in the final race. They've got to get rid of the mediums now. So mm -hmm. they've got the soft tyres for that final race. 15 minutes on soft tyres, not a problem. Uh, certainly not around Sebring. It's not the highest tyre wear circuit known to mankind. You've got uh, plenty of corners where you can let them cool down. But for me, I think we're going to see a lot of runners on the mediums uh, in this. Anyone that took the soft tyres in, uh, in that race, well... Uh, those two being uh, Nuno Pinto and Danny Kish, I'm pretty sure they'll be getting the hard tyres out of the way now. I think we'll see pretty much the entirety of the grid, all eight drivers that haven't taken the soft tyres yet, taking the softs in that third and final race. They've got to, surely. Yeah, I'd agree. I think it's crazy to, to take the soft tyre in the middle of the race, personally, but mm. I thought it was a bit crazy taking it in the first race, mm -hmm. if, I'm, if I'm in all uh, true, especially Pinto starting from last, because, you know, he's got all the traffic in front of him. You're not going to be able to use that tyre to your advantage. I can understand it a little bit with Kish. He ha put all his eggs in that race one basket, came out last, of course, so it did not work for him. Pinto's going to be on pole for this race now, though, so will he maybe take the medium just to try and get the points on the board? But I understand what you mean. If I were him, I would think I would take the hard and save the medium for the last race. Mm. But when you're on pole, maybe you've just got to try and win it. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know why I didn't take this off in the second race. No idea. Yeah. We'll find out. <laughs> and race three with hards just seems seems crazy to not utilise race three, like you said, with the with the extra points up for grabs. Yeah, it's double points in that third uh, and final race of relegation. So you don't want to be on a rubbish tyre uh, in that race. But we do have to speak uh, as well as to how that race three grid is going to be set. And that's why you might want to take advantage uh, of, of a softer compound. You know, you're getting the softer mediums out of the way uh, in race one and two. Because the way the grid's going to be set is on driver's points. Well, so we're talking of teams all the way through the uh, yeah. through the evening. It's driver's points. So the, the, the leader of the standings in that sense. So if it was right now, Timotei Andonovsky would be starting... That 
that final race from pole position because he's the one that's taken 36 points from race one. Yeah, exactly. It's a really interesting format. Um, you know, obviously this is all about the team stuff, but actually it's really good if you can get one of your drivers right up near the front of the grid, you can be a main player in that last race. You can maybe defend harder and hold them off so that your teammate who struggled further back might actually have a good chance of coming through. So I don't know, maybe it's better to have one driver really going for early to get the points on the board that'll help his other driver while defending at the front. There's so much to think about, Rachel. There, there always is with this, um, but it's a really exciting format and uh, yeah, still all to play for, as we know. Yeah, this is why I, no I couldn't be a strategist because it's just too much to cope with. It really, really is. I'd be, I'd be useless. And like you said, we um, were about to start with Silverstone. We're ending with Sebring. Silverstone, um, a lot easier, would you say, um, to, to overtake. It'll be a lot more more of an exciting race, more um, of, you know, maybe the, the back of the grid doing better than we expect. I'd say, you know, Im Imola was always going to be a difficult one mm -hmm. to overtake at. Silverson is not easy to overtake at, but there are opportunities mm. to do so. Uh, coming out on the hangar straight, coming down to Stowe, you've got a great overtaking opportunity there and down to the Vale Chicane. Uh, you've got the new complex that was built in 2010, where you've got uh, Village and John's favourite corner of all time, the Loop, uh, and then out towards Brooklyn's. Yeah. It's, it's a difficult circuit, but you can go racing there. And it's still 10 minutes as it was in the previous race, so I'm sure we're going to have plenty of action. Yeah, as always. Well, look, let's begin. This is race two with the relegations. And they'll start their formation lap in a beautiful sunny Silverstone as they'll head their way around through Abbey to start the formation lap. As you were saying, Nuno Pinto will be starting from pole position because he started from last in the previous race. The grid order set in this one as a reverse grid uh, of those that were starting in the previous race. So Nuno Pinto gets to start this one from pole position as we'll see our starting order. Pinto and Hakkinen with Ferris Stanley starting from third, looking to try and get something uh, from the evening for Rockets in Sports. Christian McHale from fourth uh, on the grid. We'll see Risto Kappa in the triple eight starting from fifth uh, with Rory McDuff, Gianmarco Vaducci and Timothy Andonovsky, the winner in the previous race, will roll off from eighth place. And they'll have to try and uh, march his way forward in this one. Philip Dreis and Danny Kish round out the order in some interesting liveried vehicles as we'll get ready for a second race here in relegation. Yeah, this is going to be a good one. You talked about the loop being my favourite corner. Uh, what I do think will you happen, I am going to deny that. I, I think it's my least favorite. We did loop. talk about this. I, I really don't like the loop. Not my favorite corner. However, I like it as a spectator because it causes drama. Hopefully some good drama. I do expect, though, Lewis, one of these cars is going to be facing the wrong way. Whether it's Village or the loop on lap one, I expect one of the two to be a crunch point. You know, it's a very tight corner, closes in, big braking zone. You see a lot of lunges there, and we're going to see a lot of aggressive drivers here making a point. So. I do think we are going to see a car facing the wrong way in the village or the loop on lap one. I hope I'm wrong. Well, Danny Kiss looked like he was smiling away. He'll be starting this race from 10th. And to be perfectly honest, has nothing to lose. And when you have races like that, well, you're going to attack <laughs> Jean-Marc Everdicci, not a hand on the wheel as he's going down the hangar straight. Of course, others, some drivers have different uh, approaches to getting into the rhythm of the race. And for Jean-Marc Everdicci, he looked a little bit stressed. Yeah, F Fair Stanley doesn't. I think the, the Rocket guys are just feeling like there's nothing to lose. As you say, they're going to go into this now, have a bit of fun and see what happens. I, I do think that, you know, it's not been a good start for them. It's not been a good day at all for them, really. They had a nightmare at Laguna Seca in Formula Pro. Um, as we see now, Nuno Pinto, of course, our pole sitter, lining up. Also started on soft tyres in the first race, so we know he's on hards or mediums. Mediums. And he's on mediums for this one, so he is going for the win, is Nuno Pinto. And he's got to try and make something stick on that front row with Turka Hakkinen for PMK Sim Racing. This needs to be now or never for the likes of Team Fordzilla and for Rocket Simsport. What can they do as we put 10 minutes back onto the clock and get ready to go racing here for the second race of relegation in Formula Pro and that pace down towards Abbey in the first corner as we are underway here at Silverstone. It was a decent launch from Nuno Pinto from pole position as he'll race his way and hang on to the race lead side by side in the background as they all go back in a single file. Almost a little bit of contact between uh, Gianmarco Verducci and Risto Capit in the background. You can see there almost everyone on the mediums. That's Raw uh, Turk 
Mac uh, sorry, Rory, Rory McDuff going a little bit wide in the background coming through Village. Yeah, absolutely, and I think everyone got through it cleanly, although we've seen a yellow in Sector 1 as Philip Dreis falls down to the back, so I do wonder if we did have a spinner. Looks like It looks like a rocket car right down the back as well, and there's Dreis, so yeah, two cars definitely lost out. Maybe we did see a spinner after all, but Pinto, the dream star, he's on the mediums, as is pretty much everyone behind him, just like you predicted, Lewis. Turk Hakkinen holding on to P2 as well, then you've got Mikel, Caput, Andonovsky, the winner, of course, in race one, and McDuff down in P6. So it looks like something happened between Kish and Dreis there uh, through the loop. Which is a bit of a shame for uh, Dreis, of course, because he's the team though, that was in second uh, with Christian Mikel as well. Uh, driving for the NeedRacing.com team, so it's not ideal for Philip Dreis to be losing out some points in this race. He needs to kind of get back on with it and see if he can find his way back onto the rear end of this train, but in 10 minutes, that is very, very tricky. Onto the hangar straight, then. This is the best overtaking opportunity. You can see that from Christian Mikel, who's using the push to pass. He's going to get to the outside of Turk Hakkinen, who's offending to the inside as they head into Stowe Corner. These two on the mediums, a little bit of contact between the two, and Christian Mikel just running out a little bit wide. And look who's on the rear end, of course. It's the Triple Eight. It's Risto Capit. Yeah, absolutely, and, and Predator RHG sitting very pretty once again, fourth and fifth in this race. Uh, but yeah, pushed a pass from Mikel down the straight, looked like he was going for it, Hakkinen wasn't letting him, got the push to pass a little bit himself as Christine takes lots of kerb through uh, the entry to Abbey, of course, now down towards Village. Very tricky slow corner, gets close to that sausage curb as you can, haul your way back to the right, on the brakes, in you go for the loop, get the rotation, don't worry about tyre wear, there's only 10 minutes to worry about, use all of the tyre that you can in these 10 minutes, and we're seeing Rory McDuff now, also on the mediums, of course, heading down the back straight behind Andonovsky, what's he going to do into Brooklands? Yeah, I don't think it's quite close enough to make a cent on Andonovsky. Oh, my goodness. These two uh, were teammates at Setres Need to Velix for a uh, short while before Andonovsky went off to join RHG. And there's a moment as well. Turk Hakkinen defending for second position. Like his life depends on it because Christian Mikel is using almost all of his push to pass. He's on the inside of cops. This is going to be a brave send from Christian Mikel on his old teammate as Turk Hakkinen runs wide and weaves a touch to say, please don't do that again. And Risto Kappi bites his way through, up in a third position as they head through Magnus Beckett and Chapel. They did, they did very well all to get through that in one piece, and what an opportunistic move from Capit to get up to P3. Mikel's got to regroup now, but I'm sure he's going to be back on it. Andonovsky defending with push to pass in P5. He's got McDuff behind him, who's also defending from Feducci. Fordzilla having a much better race this time round. Yeah, Gianmarco Feducci, medium tyres, I think, uh, on board his car as he's trying to get past Roy McDuff, who's also uh, on the mediums, and I say a little bit of a tight run in there, Rory McDuff uh, still able to hang on to sixth spot, but Gianmarco Vinucci just pulling Rory McDuff off of the rear end of Andonovsky, which will frustrate the uh, the Bostonites just a touch. And he needs to focus forwards, but he's going to have to keep his eyes on those mirrors and defend potentially down at the village, because you can see there just in the background, Gianmarco Vinucci was sending it. He did, but he didn't quite make it stick on the back of Rory McDuff, still in P7 is Vinucci, who'd be happy enough, though, with Pinto out in front. I think the key so far in this one is Dreis down in P10. You know, obviously, they had a great start in the first first race, obviously the result's all provisional we as well, go. but Fiducci going to the outside, we'll come back to that as he goes round McDuff, lots of power, but McDuff late on the brakes, they're going to be side by side, brilliant stuff, a little bit of wheel banging, but they both left each other ample room throughout the apex, I've got to say that's brilliant racing, and they're still side by side in the exit, but McDuff gets the power down and holds on to that P6, great stuff. Yeah, what a super effort that was from Gianmarco Fiducci, who's coming back at him again, I think Rory McDuff's running some pretty high wings around here at Silverstone, as they head through Cops, that was very close for Gianmarco Fiducci getting it done again. Risto Cap is closing up to the rear end of Turka Hakkinen and Nuno Pinto is running away with this at the moment. Now, normally, uh, yeah, I'd say he, he might be on the back foot, but he's on those medium tyres. He's on the same tyres as basically everyone else. He's just putting on a great display. Uh, and I will say for Nuno Pinto, because it's not me trying to jinx him a little bit, but when he was leading uh, around here in GT Pro in Season 3, he was leading by a comfortable margin and disconnected uh, from the race. So we'll keep our fingers crossed that doesn't happen again. Well, why I don't know have you said why that? I said that. I really don't know why you've said that, Lewis. <laughs> There's no such thing as the commentator's curse. <laughs> no, we'll find out anyway. So uh, I think Stanley and Dreis are the only two drivers on the hearts. Uh, we're going to see a replay though. This, is this lap one? Did I say someone was going to be facing the wrong way at the loop? Was I right? E Not quite. Yes, I was. Yes. I'll yes. take that one. Uh, but yeah, that's what happened to Dreis. Good to see that. Uh, not good for him, though. And, of course, not good for Need Racing after such a great start to the proceedings. Uh, that's going to be a big hit in terms of points with Fordzilla and Pinto out in front. And also not, you know, not a bad race for, for Hakkinen and McDuff as well, second and sixth. So, uh, yeah, it's going to close things up a little bit, that's for sure. Yeah, things are most certainly going to, uh, to tighten their way up, as we can see. 
Rory McDuff, who got off the rear end, or got off the rather the front end of Gianmarco Viducci, is he's going to try and get past Timotei Andonovsky. Oh, that's a much better drive off of Luffield going through Woodcote now. And Rory McDuff is going to try and challenge for the top five as they head down towards Cops, but he's not got the straight line speed. He's definitely running higher wings. You can see how far, much faster he was heading through Cops. Let's see what this is like in Magnus Beckers and Chapel and out onto the hangar straight, because if he can get that drive right, he might, might, might just be able to pass the Macedonian. Oh, big wiggle of oversteer from Rory McDuff midway through the Infos Maggots and Beckett section. That was great to see, but he did well to hold it. He's right on the back of Andonovsky, the race one winner. Okay, will he make a move heading into Stowe? It doesn't look like it. He can't quite get close, as you say. It's just, it's, it's all very setup dependent as well. And Fiducci down in P7, uh, getting close as well, so I mean, he's going to be able to capitalise very quickly if Andonovsky and McDuff get into each other, and that would really bring Fordzilla right back into it. Uh, as we were saying, by the way, there were two drivers that used their soft tyres in race one. That was Nuno Pinto and Danny Kish. There's one driver in this race that's using soft tyres, that one being Ferris Stanley. Everyone else is saving their soft tyres for the third and final race of relegation as Philip Dreis picks up a position going down uh, into Abbey. That one being, of course, on Ferris Stanley, so a bit of just a send there as Ferris Stanley is struggling away now the driver at the lead of this train being Timotei Andonovsky is on the hard tyres so he's struggling a little bit for grip but he's managing to keep Rory McDuff at bay for now he is indeed and doing a very very good job at it it's three cars head through Brooklands we're gonna see a little bit of a look not quite from Fiducci just the car positioning the body language made it look like it but he's pulled back in now try and get a good exit of course as we head now through Woodcote flat out easily this right-hander in these cars. It's no time at all before you make it to Cops, one of the fastest corners in the country. Absolutely epic to see these Formula Pro cars sparking their way through, using all of the exit curb down towards Maggots and Beckett's. McDuff right on the back of Andonovsky still, but there's still no way through, Lewis. Only two and a half minutes to go. He's going to have to make something work soon. Yeah, he's got to find, he's got to pick the lock, oh. essentially. And that Mistake. might be a good launch. That was a big moment from Timotei Andonovsky, and this could be the opportunity for Rory McDuff to try and do it. He's got to look to the inside, but the straight line speed of that Predator RHG is just about enough. Absolutely incredible. And I've got to say, at the moment, when it comes to the points, because I know do, oh, we'll talk about it just very quickly now, it'd be 120 points to uh, Predator RHG, and then there would be three teams separated by six points going into the final race. You can see how close Rory McDuff is over the rear end of Timotei Andonovsky as they head through Abbey. He's got to make a send surely here, coming down into Village. This is absolutely epic stuff. He doesn't do it though heading into village will he try and prioritize the loop they're going to head back to the right hand side but we might see a left hand dive no it doesn't come from McDuff he's pretty much inside the car of Andonovsky who is feeling the pressure but Lewis he set his car up for racing rather than qualifying as Andonovsky obviously there's no qualifying here he, he maybe doesn't have the fastest car over a full lap but if it helps him hold on to that position it's going to be very much worthwhile for Andonovsky of course on the hard tire as well really really smart thinking from the Predator R8, R8 driver yeah and uh, those two teams by the way three teams rather uh, it would be needracing.com on 109 points, Team Fordzilla on 104, uh, and then 103 points for PMK Sim Race, and that is battling for the final promotion spot. Rocket Sims was unfortunately with 70 points uh, in a great deal of strife, but also they're fighting for who's going to have pole position in that final race, which at the moment would be a lockout between Nuno Pinto and Timotei Andonovsky, who would both have 62 points to their name. So this is a very important position to hold for Timotei Andonovsky, as Rory McDuff is desperate to find the way through. Of course, he won't know that uh, at the moment. We're on the penultimate lap, the penultimate race down into Stowe Corner. But this is very important for Timotei Andonovsky to hang on the fifth position. It is, absolutely, you're right. Um, the, obviously, the, the big difference as well is that Pinto's used his soft tyres in the first race, but both of them will have ident identical results, a first and a fifth, if it stays this way. Um, in the last race, Pinto was charging forward. This time, it is Andonovsky hanging on for his life, but he's continuing to do so. 45 seconds left in the clock. That means we have started the final lap here. And is Rory McDuff going to make a move into Village? Will he pull to the right, no, he stays to the left, it's going to be the loop then as Fiducci gets locked up very sideways, and is McDuff going to go for it? Not quite, he's focusing on the exits yet again, but it's sideways for Andonovsky and through goes Rory McDuff into P5, that is crucial for the starting order of the next race, but will Andonovsky come back, Lewis? Will Fiducci come back into this as well as we head side by side, that was a super drive, the straight line speed is absolutely incredible and here comes Gianmarco Fiducci to the outside, it's three wide almost on the exit of Brooklyn it's Timotei Andonovsky trying to hang on the fifth position, he's just just desperately clinging on. Rory McDuff to the outside as they head through Luffield. Nuno Pinto, there's contact! And Rory McDuff has been sent off and nearly down into the pit relief as well. What has just happened there as we cut away on the exit of Luffield? Absolutely incredible. This is 
massive for Fordzilla. You know, they didn't look too good in the first race. They look like they might have been out of it as McDuff tries to recover ahead of Ferris Stanley. They go side by side through Cops using all of the road. But what a result this is going to be for Fordzilla. Pinto in the lead. Fiducci up to fifth. That is going to put them right in the mix. And Pinto is going to be right at the front of the grid as well. What a disaster for both McDuff and a race one winner, Andonovsky. Yeah, I, I don't even know where to keep up with all of this. This is absolutely insane. Well, Nuno Pinto is coming out of the final corner to win here at Silverstone as we look at the replay coming back towards all that. There is Nuno Pinto across the line ahead of Turka Hakkinen and Risto Kapit. Christian Mikel in fourth and Gianmarco Verducci in fifth place. We'll have to take a look at that drama in a few moments' time. But that is incredible. There is Timotej Andonovsky across the line with no front wing just ahead of Roy McDuff in eighth and ninth. Wow, calamitous scenes to end here at Silverstone. Absolutely. Chaos in the last lap. It all bubbled over. We said it might do in the second race. Slightly less on the line. They needed to make it work. We're going to see that replay now of this three-car accident. They were, it was brilliant racing for the first half of the lap, it has to be said. McDuff on the outside. You've got Fiducci in behind. Is Fiducci going to touch, touch Andonovsky? No, it's contact solely between Andonovsky and McDuff. Fiducci stayed back, let the two of them collide. They both went either way, and through went Fiducci. Difficult one to call. It's on power on the exit of that kind of corner. You get sideways. It's so easy to make contact. It is and I'm kind of one that would be a little bit harsher on that because some people would be like, oh, it's just an easy mistake to make. But I'd be like, yes, but whose responsibility was it to keep traction on the car? At which point you'd have to blame uh, Timotej Andonovsky. Of course, Race Control will take a look at that provisional race results for the race here at Silverstone, the second race uh, in, uh, in relegation. Nuno Pinto to take the victory ahead of Turka Hakkinen, grabbing a second position and another great result as well. He was seventh in the first race, second in this one, and Risto cap it Mr. Consistency himself in third position after a fourth place finish in the first race. Christian Mikel uh, finished in third in the first race, finishes fourth in this one, so those two will be locked on points uh, close as they were at the end of Formula Challenge. Gianmarco Fiducci will be in fifth position with Danny Kish taking up sixth place at the end of that race. Philip Dreis in seventh, then Timotej Andonovsky, then Rory McDuff and then Ferris Stanley. What a dramatic race. Absolutely. Uh, had chaos of the highest order, some great battling as well, and some controversy. I tell you what, race control are going to be incredibly busy in the interim here. You know, they're going to have their heads down looking at those incidents. And yeah, Rachel, I mean, what did you make of that? It all kicked off. It was good chaos, a bit of bad chaos at the end, but chaos nonetheless. Yeah, definitely chaos. And Pinto, what a dream start for him. I mean, he set the tone for what that race was and became, didn't he? Uh, Got to be said, it was a very impressive drive because I know everyone would be like, yeah, well, he started from pole position. Uh, you know, he was on the mediums, but everyone else was on the mediums as well. Realistically, yeah. all of the main rivals were on the mediums. It was a super drive from Nuno Pinto. And, uh, you know, as you were saying, John, this could be a turning point for Ford Dillon. Now, they're going into the third race, not so much in an advantageous position. Uh, Nuno Pinto has already used his soft tyres, of course, in race one. He's used his mediums there, so he's going to be on the hards, unfortunately, yeah. for the third race. But Gianmarco Fiducci has done hard, medium, soft. He's done the exact opposite, so he'll be taking softs uh, in that next race. So things might still work out for the team. They might. They might meet in the middle as well because Pinto will probably be going backwards and Fiducci is going forwards. These guys are very closely matched, so the difference between hards and soft tyres will make a big difference. We're going to see lots of soft tyre usage and Pinto is going to be looking in his mirror. But what it's done is it's given Fordzilla a fighting chance and a very good one at that. They maximised their points from that race. It wasn't looking great for them, as we say, after race one, but it's looking really good for them now. Not so great for Rocket, another disastrous race. Mm. Not so good for McDuff either. He's had the potential for so many more points than he's actually managed to pick up. So a real shame for him. Turk Hakan will be a bit frustrated, but he's been holding the fort for those guys. And Timote was doing such a great job holding on to fifth. What happened at the end there? Hard tyres. Uh, they are rubbish for a reason. It's yeah. why no one wants to use them. They are unpleasant, uh, those hard tyres. It's why we never really see, see them get used in Formula Challenge. We don't see them getting used in Formula Pro. They're a difficult uh, beast to, to get a hold of. They've done hundreds, if not you know, a couple of thousand laps on softs and mediums. Hard tyres, uh, as John was saying, they're not touched uh, until, uh, until you come to an event like this. I think like that kind of might have just caught him out a little bit on the exit. Again, I only saw the replay once. Uh, for me, it kind of feels like it might be on Andonovsky just losing the rear end and going into the side of McDuff. But either way, uh, it, it was a rough moment. Yeah, and, f and for me, you know, McDuff was as far to the outside as, we, as he could be. You know, we only saw a brief replay, so it's hard to give a mm. definite judgment. Um, but McDuff was trying to hang around the outside. He had more grip. He had better grip from his tyres, but he also seemed to have a higher downforce package, which meant he had you know, better traction out of the corner. He seemed to be all the way over to the left. Andonovsky just didn't have the space, uh, and that kick of oversteer 
here is all it's going to take. And unfortunately, there was the contact. Well done, Fiducci, though, for being able to back off and stay out of trouble and pick up um, what was a P5 result in the end. Take another replay again just to see what happened with Rory McDuff here. So going around the outside, McDuff, we're on board with Adonowski. Yeah, um, uh, for, for me, uh, I don't, there's not even a, a, a loss yeah. of traction. Yeah. Yeah. Adonowski just, just goes into the side. Yeah, he just understeered on the exit, and it was like he just misjudged how much room uh, McDuff was going to have. It's McDuff had the little bit of uh, an overlap as well on the exit, and it was, that was a bit of a strange one, actually. Adonowski, after such a strong race one, mm. just a bit of a misjudgment there on the exit, and uh, just trying so hard to hang on to the position, it all ended in tears. And that's what it takes. It just takes that very slight, like you say, misjudgment, just the smallest of things to completely transform your race uh, for good and obviously in Timothée's um, way for bad. Um, does that mean that a majority of the teams are going to be starting on soft yes. for this third and final race? Yes, I can, uh, I can tell you at least with some certainty that Risto Capit, Philip Dreis, Christian McHale, Rory McDuff, Timotej Andonovsky, Turka Hagen, God, I feel like I'm doing a school register here. I love this. Uh, Turka Hagen and Gianmarco Fiducci will <laughs> yeah. all be starting on the soft tyres. They've got rid of the mediums and hards in race one uh, and race two. So... They do get to use those softs in that all-important third race. But I do believe, at least from my points, now don't trust me on this, because uh, never trust a commentator's maths, but I do <laughs> believe that Nuno Pinto will start from pole position. I think so, ah. I think so, yeah. And it was looking so good for um, Predator RAG as well in that race until the very end. Because and, Andonovsky, not only does he lose those positions, we could be seeing a penalty. I don't want to speak on behalf of race control, but he did cause that incident and it mm. kind of ruined McDuff's day. So that's not going to help things for RAG. And what that means is it's an open circus. Anyone can win this. I still think that Rocket have got a lot of work to do. Um, <laughs> anyone other can than win Rocket, except Rocket. Anyone <laughs> else is in a good position. Edgevelli Johnson is watching, by he the is, way. Sorry, so Ed, we yeah. are going to get in trouble. We are, but... I I think that's the reality <laughs> of the situation, unfortunately. And I, I just think it's anyone's game other than that with these double points. Well, yeah, that's right. So that's what I was going to say. This uh, third relegation race, um, just talk us through it and the beauty of these double points now. Yeah, we go not from a 10-minute from a race. We move that up to a 15-minute race. So we get a little bit extra uh, when it comes to the racing. We get a little bit extra at stake as well with it being double points rather than it being 36 points for a race win. Of course, it is 30, uh, so 32. Don't just accommodate oh, wow. maths. 72 maths. and yeah. 66, of course. 33 well points for finishing in second normally. So it's 66, 30 points for finishing in third. That obviously gets doubled up to 60. It means it's worth two race wins, of course. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's the most important race win to take of the evening. If you haven't won yet, won yet if you're not Timotei Andonovsky and you're not Nuno Pinto, well, now's your time. Absolutely. Anything can happen. And, you so know, with double race win, you have two bad races, you make it up with one good race now. Um, and obviously, you know, we'll get an idea for the championship based on the grid, of course, because it is the individual driver standings that will make up the grid. And once again, another reminder it is the team standings at the end of the day that determines who goes up to Formula Pro and who doesn't, quite simply, who will have to fight their way back in through Formula Challenge. Well, let's have a look and a little recap at that last race. What drama it was at Silverstone, because of course the second race of relegation means we enter Crazy Town. It was a good start from Nuno Pinto from pole position on the medium tyres. Behind that, it was anything but. It was an issue for Philip Dreis going around the outside, getting squeezed to the inside with Gianmarco Fiducci. Very Stanley in the middle of that, pushing Philip Dreis down to 10th and last on the hard tyres. Instantly on the defence, trying to hang on was Terka Hacken and as Christian McHale would try and get around the outside. A little bit of contact between the two as Risto Caput was knocking at the door just on the uh, rear end of that scene. Danny Kish with an easy move on his teammate Ferris Stanley to get himself up into eighth position, uh, just trying to march their way forward in some degree. And then Philip Dreis was the next one to pass Ferris Stanley down into Abbey with a pretty easy move. This was some drama late on, though. A bit of a moment as Andonovsky was trying to defend from Rory McDuff. McDuff would go around the outside, and as the understeer would kick in, Andonovsky would go into the side of Rory McDuff, and Gianmarco Verducci would have the seas parted and he would move his way up in the fifth position. McDuff in a very awkward spot. Nuno Pinto, though, would come across the line to finally win at Silverstone, just ahead of Turka Hakkinen and Risto Capit with a podium. Christian McHale taking fourth position at the end of all of that, meaning that Risto Capit and uh, 
uh, Christian Mikel. Well, they were battling for the championship in Formula Challenge a week ago. This time at the moment, they are separated by Neil Poir. Zero points between the two of them. It is incredibly tight, at least down the order, but it should be Nuno Pinto holding the top of the standings, heading into that all-important third and final decisive race here in the relegations. Just one more race, and you can see that there. Nuno Pinto will start this race. This will be the grid order. Nuno Pinto on pole position with Christian Macau, Risto Capit, and Philip Drive. Looking very very good for needracing.com, by the way. Turka Hakan and Gianmarco Verducci, Rory McDuff, Danny Kish, and Ferris Stanley. Look at the issues there for Timotei Andonovsky. So we were saying that he might have been penalised from the previous race. He was, uh, and he moves down to uh, to just 18 points. Is that the, is, that's down to ninth spot. Yeah, not looking good at not all. Not sure what that was for. Uh, yeah, we, we, were, we were hearing that the first race result might have been uh, changed somewhat. We didn't know quite what for. But it's a it's a 30 second penalty by the sounds of it for Andonovsky, and obviously the disaster in the second race um, has, has made it a massive problem with another 10 second penalty. So 34 points for Andonovsky. RHG not looking so good all of a sudden. It's looking great for Fordzilla. It's still looking decent enough for Need Racing. Uh, my permutation pen, Lewis, is running out of ink. Yes, indeed. Need Racing then will hold the top of the standings into the final race with 119 points. Fordzilla will uh, move up into second position, which should be very important because considering uh, how they've uh, how they've been uh, through Formula Pro, the struggles they've had, 112 points sees them in second, third place for PMK, and uh, you know they could be looking very good in this third race. But with RHG, with those issues for Timotei Andonovsky, with penalties in both races, is, by the way, uh, not trying to sound like his dad, but he needs to clean up his act just a little bit here for the third <laughs> and final race. Well, I mean, one lap before the end, I didn't realise Andonovsky was going to get penalised for the first race. We obviously missed what happened there. Um, but it was looking great for him. It was looking great for RHG, and all of a sudden, he go, mm. it all goes wrong in one lap, and suddenly it's looking like a disaster for them. But double points, they've had the pace all evening, so there's no reason why they can't claw their way back into the top two. Yeah, they must be absolutely gutted. Um, and do we know what happened in race one, why he was penalised? I was about to ask the question. Hopefully, at some point, we'll hear in our ear as to, <laughs> uh, to what actually happened there. Because I don't know. Because for me, uh, apparently, he ran out of fuel <gasps> post-race. They've got to do the full in-lap. Because uh, I was going to say, through the race, he actually didn't have any real issues. He got the lead no. basically out of Tamborello. And then a fuel miscalculation. Now, I don't know anyone else who runs out of fuel. I definitely wouldn't do it ever. Uh, but still. Uh, so whose fault is that? That is surely... His, 100% his. Would you his. say, yeah? Yeah, well, Absolutely. I mean, it depends. If he's got an engineer for RHG who's told him exactly how much fuel, yeah. they could blame it on the engineer. But it's always down to the driver. At the end of the day, it's they always down to the, the driver. They choose the fuel. Uh, and they, you know, obviously Capit got it right. Andonovsky didn't. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a mistake. It's a very costly mistake because he was so dominant. It didn't yeah. need to be that close. Yeah, and especially now when you come into the third and final race for double points. And just to let um, everyone know who's, who's watching or might have just uh, joined in, tuned in, uh, the best two teams in the final standings will get promoted to the Formula Pro next year. 2023 so that is uh, what the relegation races are all about and this third and final race is at Sebring which is the track that you guys are most excited about yeah absolutely it's uh, from a track map it's either a stapler or a sewing machine but to the track ah, itself your track it map. is fantastic we're not <laughs> going to speak about track maps and I'm no, not showing don't. mine on camera it I don't know which too, one was which there it's too embarrassing because yeah, it's it just uh, yeah it's uh, thankfully we don't see Indianapolis either because mum was a bit squashed yeah. but uh, alas it's <laughs> It's a great racetrack. So many good overtaking opportunities. You've got the likes of Collier. You've got Tau if you're very brave. Uh, you've got the hairpin after Big Bend. You've got turn three, question mark, even though it's definitely turn two. And you've got turn one and then sunset. Yeah, I mean, you're spot on. It's a great racetrack. Turn one is a very fast, high-speed left-hander. I talk about the bumps all the time. I know it is one of the bumpiest corners. And one of the kind of most unique turn ones you will see on the calendar. It's not a hairpin. It's not slow. Um, but it's just so wide, and there's so much that can happen, many different lines you can take. There's also a nasty concrete wall on the inside, which could cause a lot of problems for drivers. So very different, obviously heading left, but it's still a right-hand uh, clockwise circuit as well. So the big overtaking opportunities, as Lewis said, you know, out of Big Bend um, down towards, I believe it is... Oh, what corners. I've lost my bad map, Lewis. <laughs> the hairpin at the end of the Honestly, big straight. That, that one. Yeah. Map. No, not that one. I mean, that's also a good one. Um, um, it's just turn seven. Yeah, it's turn just, seven. Just, yeah, the great name. Hairpin. Yeah, fantastic. Turn seven. Great overtaking opportunity as well. And a tricky exit. We often see a lot of contact in GT racing around there. Mm. What will we see in Formula Pro?
And what um, our, our viewers haven't realised is you guys were talking about your, your, your circuit drawings just like this off camera earlier. Both of you competing against each other with who could draw the best circuit. None of them won. Uh, well, let's begin. This is race three right. of the relegation races. Bye, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll get rid of her and we'll focus on the action because I think we're in for a barnstorming final. Of course, this grid set from points that we've, uh, we've built through the previous two races. Nuno Pinto will start from pole position, but he'll be starting that on the hard tyre. Absolutely, and that is, you know, that is going to be difficult. That is a hugely important factor. Just to make it clear as well, it's a seven-point gap between Need and uh, Fordzilla, of course, in the top two in the standings. It is the team standings that matter at the end of the day, with PMK third, 16 points back, RHE 25 points back. But with double points, it's six-point swings between positions right at the top of the grid, and then three, uh, four-point swings further down. So that's big swings, and it means that we're going to see uh, a lot of chaos. We see now the starting grid. Yeah, you can see Nuno Pinto, Christian McKay. Count Risto Capit, Philip Dreis, first, second, third, fourth. Turka Hakkinen, Gianmarco Fiducci, Roy McDuff, and Danny Kish, uh, fifth through eighth. And then the final row of the grid, we'll see Ferris Stanley and Timotej Andonovsky uh, in last, who actually does now drop back into last position. He was in ninth position, which I'm sure will irritate uh, our race control. To know it, what is he doing? Good question. It looks like he's just trying to warm his tyres, <laughs> making some moves. <laughs> Christian. If there is one person who should not try and irritate race control right now, Timothy Andonovsky after two penalties, please do not. I think he's just trying to get railed up, trying to get himself in the mood for this. I mean, we've seen how quick he is. We know how well he defended in that race at Silverstone, so there's every chance that he can come through the grid. Um, obviously, you know, we, we talked about it, Pinto on the hard tyres is going to be super, super tough. Most of the drivers, though, on the soft. There is Pinto, he's looking very relaxed. And honestly, Lewis, after the season he's had, it is great to see him at the front of this grid, because it's not been an easy one for him in Formula Pro. He was probably the guy we expected not to be at the front here. And look at him, most points in the first two races. Yes, indeed. Well, we're getting ready, because we're racing on American soil for a rolling start. Because, of course, we have to have it. It's double points, it's the final race of relegation. It's racing action once again as we head towards Turn 1. It's Nuno Pinto in control with Christian McKell alongside Timotej Andonovsky. You're already trying to make it three wide as we head down towards the first corner. The Macedonian on the attack and the Rocket Sismore car. They make contact with each other. Goodbye to Danny Kish. Goodbye to Ferris Stanley. Hello to Nuno Pinto who's at the top of the grid with Christian McKell. Rocket Sismore's are done for the day, are done for the season. And Nuno Pinto's hanging on. He is indeed. It was great defending by Pinto into turn one. Rocket imploding at turn one and it kind of just sums up their evening to be quite honest. Mikel looking down the outside, look at the bumps in the braking zone as we head into the incredible name to turn seven on the way out. More bumps, a very twisty section, but another such chance for overtaking oh, manoeuvres. We have an RG car wide. off. Was that three wide between Risto Kaffir, Philip Dreis and Christian Mikel as they head through Fangio and up towards Collier. It is going to be a move though from Philip Dreis who's got to the inside. Christian Mikel we're looking at at the moment who's in fourth position. They're trying to hook their spots. That was a big moment though from Philip Dreis. He's just ahead. This is getting dicey action in the middle. Christian Mikel behind Philip Dreis, uh, behind Risto Kaffir rather. And in the background, Timotej Andonovsky has got past both the BMK uh, sim racing cars of Turk Hakkinen and Rory McDuff with a pretty big send down into Tower. Yeah, disaster really for PMK. Okay, not as much of a disaster as it was for Rocket, but they're down in seventh and eighth right now, so they have got it all to do with Andonovsky in sixth. Fiducci uh, holding well in fifth for Fordzilla, and Pinto is pulled out a gap on those hard tyres. That is incredible to see. 1.3 seconds clear. I did not expect to see this, but Dreis and Capit battling for second. They've got to work together for a minute to catch up with Pinto. I do think, though, Lewis, it will be pretty quick that we see these uh, second and third place cars catching up with Nuno. Yeah, I still think at the moment the uh, advice, I mean, for me at the moment, needracing.com are looking almost locked on for a position in Formula Pro. They're in a good spot in the championship, holding uh, the lead rather here in Formula Pro. They're on soft tyres and you can see this. Nuno Pinto, he has got a very long 13 minutes ahead. He's on the hard tyres with a sea of softs running second through eighth. Dreis, Capit, Mikel, Fiducci, Andonovsky, Mikel, uh, McDuff rather, uh, and Turka Hakkinen all will be lining up to have their piece of Nuno Pinto. Just to give another bit of perspective here, Fordzilla 18 points.
point ahead of RHG at the moment. And it looks like, uh, given how this race is unfolding so far, that is going to be the battle for second. So 18 points it is. Pinto in first, Capit in third. But Pinto's on the hard tyres, Capit's on the soft. So that could switch. Ooh. If it does switch, you're going to see bigger gaps between those two. And suddenly that point swing is going to be nothing. So it could also come down to Fiducci versus Andonovsky. It was deep from Philip Dreis there going into Collier. They come out of tower and up towards Bishop. Absolutely pinned at this point as they come down towards the final couple of corners in sector, or rather the first couple of corners in sector three, the final sector of the track. Bit of a moment there from Nuno Pinto coming through Lamont. They'll use all the way out over to the left-hand side as we punch it onto the Ullman straight. And this is where issues fly. It is such a long straight. Nuno Pinto hopefully is running some pretty low wings. They've still got 10 seconds to push the pass. And this is the moment. Christian Mikel's looking to the inside. This is going to be a bit of a wide moment there from Nuno Pinto, who still manages to hang on. Super stuff. Now if Risto Cabot tries to make it side by side now, it might just give Nuno Pinto a bit more of a launch, racing up towards turn one again. Philip Dreis filling the mirrors of the Portuguese driver that's holding on to the race lead right now. T1 ticked off, T2 ticked off into the breaking zone of the third corner of the circuit. It's lots of half moves for Dreis. We saw an attempted move there in the background. That was Andonovski on Fiducci, which could still be crucial to this race. Pinto doesn't seem to have the straight line speed, Lewis, and this could be another example of that because Dreis has got a better exit. We're going to see him power around the outside. I don't think Pinto has set his car up for straight line. I think he set up for corners with hard tyres earlier on the brakes than Dreis, who gets it done. Great move around the outside. Nothing Pinto could have done, and he slots into P2. This is all super, super important. Well, Philip Dreis is now looking for his second win of the evening after taking the first one post-race after the penalty for the driver that's attacking Gianmarco Vidicci. It's Timothy Andonovsky. There's Risto Capit. He's sending it on Nuno Pinto straight away, and he doesn't make it stick. That means it's going to be advantage to Philip Dreis is going to run away because Christian Mikel is also knocking the door. He's nearly been squeezed off, coming down into tower, back out towards Bishop. This could be the moment of the race, though, because Risto Capit needs to get through. If he has any aspirations to win in this race, he's got to do it now, but he doesn't send it. He holds back coming through T14. Yeah, every single corner right now, he is losing time to Philip Dreis, and he needs those points. It's six points for every single position you gain. We think he'll get Pinto. It's a matter of when, not if. The question is, how far back will Pinto drop? And if Capit can get up with Dreis, that is six extra points he really needs. He's going to look to the inside, just like Dreis did the last lap. Can't make it stick. Pinto holds on with the hard tyres. Capit goes for the exit, gets a good drive, a bit of oversteer, but manages to hold it all together as they head now down towards turn one. And this is really, really helping oh. Dreis. Will Capit make a move? He's going to look for it, though, into T1. He's going to send it into T1. He's going to complete it into T1. The Triple Eight's done it. But here comes Christian Mikel straight down into the third corner, into that breaking zone. Christian Mikel has got himself up in the third position as well. So Nuno Pinto is going backwards at the moment. This is going to be difficult for them in the championship. What has happened, though, to Timotej Andonovsky down to eight? Exactly that, Lewis. He's dropped back. We didn't see why. That is huge as well, because he was battling with Fiducci. I wonder if there was any contact there. We don't want to speculate. We haven't seen it. But he's down to eight. And that is, again, really, really important, because now the, the momentum shifting. Capit's getting up. He's only half a second off the lead. Pinto is dropping like a stone. He's going to let Fiducci by now on the softs, and he will continue to drop down this field. It's just the fact of the matter when you're on hards and everyone else is on softs, you don't have the pace. I think that was a mistake. Oh, Antonovsky's gone. Andonovsky is out of the race, you're absolutely right. And so I think that might actually mean that Fordzilla are actually going to hold their position. I can't guarantee that on points, but I think because it's a double points race, I'm going to say that Team Fordzilla, and I don't know how, but what a super end of the season they've had. We'll see on board with Timotej Andonovsky. This is the reason for the retirement, so he drops it coming out towards Big Ben. And the end of a frustrating evening for the Macedonian. I honestly don't understand, though. He's, he's, he's retired, but keep going. Well, just keep yeah, going and try and pick up the points because you know you never know what could happen here. We could see a Fordzilla retirement. You lose a wheel, you're forced to retire. That did not look like he was forced to retire. It looked like he lost the front wing. I'm very surprised. Unless there was an engine issue we didn't know about, I'm surprised that he pulled out. Uh, by the way, the reason why I was saying it was a mistake uh, for Nuno Pinto to let Gianmarco Fiducci behind because he could have been a rear gunner. But unfortunately, Rory McDuff's going to fight his way through. And what I mean by a rear gunner is he could sit there, give Nuno Pinto a bit of room and use his soft tyres to keep these two behind. Alas, they've switched, so it is what it is. Uh, Gianmarco Fiducci is going to try and close in on the podium battle with Philip Dreis, Risto Capit and Christian McKell and prove why he should be back on the Formula Pro grid in 2023. There's Risto Capit, uh, who's just over the rear end of Philip Dreis as we'll take a look at a couple of replays from the start as you can see that incident between the two uh, Rocket Sinswalls cars don't hit your teammate not in a race like this and that'll be big big drama as we'll see it on board 
with Danny Kish. Don't just do it. Yeah, I mean, nothing Kish could have done, really. He, was, he leave, seemed to be leaving some space first. Stanley maybe didn't know he was there. It was a bizarre one, really. They just kind of side by side and drove into each other. Really, really unfortunate. And it, unfortunate, as we've been saying, kind of sums up their night and, and, in a way, sums up their season. They've actually been quite consistent, despite the lack of pace. Uh, tonight, they haven't been. They've been consistently inconsistent, and uh, they've paid the price, Lewis. Yeah, three retirements then from the race. Ferris Stanley, Danny Kish on lap one. Timotej Adonofsky, I'm still not sure as to the issue which has dropped him, what originally dropped him out of fifth position and down towards eighth. And then he had, obviously, his moment where he dropped it. I agree with you, probably should just stay in the race and try and at least give some uh, hope to the Predator RAG team. But alas, I think their time uh, uh, eyeing up a position in Formula Pro, I think it's done, which I'm kind of OK with because I definitely wouldn't be able to pick them apart from the regular <laughs> RAG team because it's the same Lurie. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But um, yeah, and, and Pinto has dropped, as we expected, on those hards all the way from first to last of the runners. He's dropping back like a stone. So, you know, the early excitement, he wasn't able to hold it. And it, RAG could have been there. They really could have. I mean, look at Risto. He's right on the back of Drives. Andonovsky just had to keep himself out of trouble. He was looking good for P4, Lewis, and that would have been uh, pretty much slam dunk. They would have made it through. So even in this last race, it still could have been there for Predator RAG. Antonovsky's talk about his, you know hero to zero. It's it's been a disaster. Yeah, uh, like I said, well, I mean, when it comes to the evening so far, Antonovsky with the 30-second time penalty in race one, the 20-second time penalty I think it was in race two, and now with this retirement or 10 seconds, sorry, uh, and and now this retirement, I mean, it has been a bad evening for Timotei Antonovsky and the Predator RHG Esports team, who were maybe looking to be realistically the absolute favourites uh, to move their way through. There was a reason why NeedRacing.com, by the way, uh, gave up because they they realistically they could have had uh, two teams in this. They could have had uh, Philip Dreis and a teammate that he invited, and they could have had Christian Mikel and a teammate that he invited. They elected to not do that, to give up their second spot and to team up, and we are seeing why. The consistency they've got is incredible, but it might not be enough to win this race because Philip Dreis has to worry about Risto Cabot getting down the inside. Now, if I'm Philip Dreis, I'm not fighting it. You can go, son, because you're not my problem. And that is exactly why he didn't fight it, because if he really tried to squeeze Risto there and Risto had that moment, we could have seen Dreis in the wall, DNF big, big difference in points. So, uh, yeah, Dreis, no reason to fight it. They will happily sit there and take second and third, I'm sure, um, and will be fully deserving of their Formula Pro spot should they get it. I don't know if the teammates will swap positions. Cap it, doing everything he can, but it's out of his control now because of the issues for Andonovsky, and it's just a case of Forzilla making sure they keep an eye, of course, on PMK. Now, PMK were only nine points behind them. Uh, we're going to see a replay, actually, before we do any more. And it's McDuff oh, crashing into the back, and that's not going to help PMK whatsoever. I wonder if that is what put Andonovsky at the back originally. Yes, that definitely was. It would have given some diffuser damage as well. Uh, it was that, uh, that was a pretty big hit on the rear end of Andonovsky. And it's a penalty, isn't it? That, that's a slam dunk. That is a slam dunk penalty to Rory McDuff. I think it'll be a 10-second time. But again, do not want to speak on behalf of Race Control. I am just speaking of what we've had uh, before. <laughs> Boom! Oh, I'm so good at this. Rory McDuff with a 10-second time penalty. Oh, I, this I is why we're pros. I can assure you he didn't even get told that by our director, <laughs> which is which is rare, but it's true. Yeah, no, again, that was about as much of a slam dunk penalty as I've ever seen, so for Rory McDuff and for PMK, that will drop Roy McDuff at the moment uh, back to last. By the end of the race, it might only drop him to sixth uh, place. So it might not be that bad, but I think it's not going to be enough to keep them with any chance of getting into... Uh, yeah, it's into not. It's not. And, and what they were doing was keeping the pressure on Fiducci, you know, trying to force a mistake. Yeah. It could have still happened. Now with that penalty, I mean, Fiducci won't know about McDuff's penalty, but McDuff probably will. Uh, and Turk has just not quite been at it in this particular race. Um, as we ride on board with Christy and Mikel. So at the moment, let's just be clear, four minutes to go, it's looking very likely that unless we see some major drama, needracing.com with Christy Mikel and Philip Dreis will be promoted into Formula Pro in 2023 alongside the Fordzilla team who remain in Formula Pro. And that, of course, at the moment is Nuno Pinto and Gianmarco Fiducci, who didn't actually take part, Laguna yep. Lewis, and it's proving right potentially cool. to be a great call because they were too far behind. Amazing call. I think that is a very bold call. Now, whilst they were on the lower end uh, of the points and it was very unlikely they would hold their position. It is a bold call to go, actually, there might be some drama, but we're not going to bank on that. We're going to bank on us and we're going to step aside and we're going to do our own thing. I think it is a great call for them because look at Rocket since well now, whether you could say uh, that the Fiducci and Pitta were faster than Stanley and Kish, doesn't really matter. 
Stanley and Kish did Formula Pro. They did that race, they came to this even more in the back foot. Meanwhile, Pinto and Feducci were already trying to get ahead of it. Yeah, they went into Obviously that race. Closer. Yeah, absolutely. And, they, you know, Forzilla went into that race with a fresh mindset. You know, this was tonight was about the relegation battle with Rocket. You know, they went into it thinking they had a chance. They did have a chance, 100%. but it went wrong. So, so the mindset is suddenly it's gone wrong. It's a disaster. And I did say they could try and bounce back from that, but they just looked tired out there. The, the, the cars just, you know, that, that last incident really summed it up. That was a team that had realized that it was not going to be their night. And it just, it was a really tired, lazy incident we saw yeah. in T1, um, which is a real shame. I mean, it's been an exhaust. These cars are hard to drive, just to clarify. And um, bearing in mind, I mean, we started this broadcast three hours ago. Uh, I think it was, it was about 10 Yeah, just over three yeah, hours so, uh, We started this broadcast a very, very long time ago. And whilst we started this broadcast a long time ago, they have been driving even longer than that. They will be on the server hour, two hours before the race starts to get their final laps in. They've been doing laps of rages coming into this. Then you run through a race, then you've got to get used to the other circuits, then you've got to get... It's a long night. So those kind of mistakes, they happen. They do, and especially, you know, Sebring was, was not uh, locked in until you guys voted for it. So thank you very much to all of you who've taken part in the vote, both across the Traction YouTube channel and the Traction Twitter account. Um, uh, yeah, but these guys wouldn't have prepared quite as much potentially for Sebring as they might have for Imola and Silverstone, which we've known about for a good week now. So uh, into turn one, it just, yeah, it just didn't work out for them. Uh, it is definitely working out for these guys. We keep talking about it, but they have been sensational. You did call it before the race start. You said need racing, we're going to be a strong pairing and it's proven to be the right decision absolutely for both of them to team up together and do you know do you think we'll see those two carry this over to formula pro i think they'd be a great team in formula pro based on what we've seen in formula challenge this year 100 percent. i think they are a very strong team and i also think that this might be that extra boost of confidence that team fordzilla needed because they're proving that you know they they can uh, race i mean nuno pinto with the, that medium tire run beat out risto capi beat out everyone on the same kind of tire super stuff jean marco Verducci is showing the driver that he is I think this is a, a great chance for Fordzilla to really bounce back and take on 2023. And I know that you know, Feducci's said to me a couple of times this season that he's really, really struggled with mentality and stuff in, uh, in, in Formula Pro because it is hard to be uh, giving you everything and still being a second off, still being towards the back. But he's got potential, he's got pace, he's got the chance. and. You need a race like this sometimes to make it stick. A look at that from Nuno Pinto into the pit lane, whilst Rory McDuff uh, and Turka Hakkinen might well switch over, which means that Turka Hakkinen uh, is actually going to gain a position anyway on Rory McDuff, uh, which, if I was Rory McDuff, I know he probably doesn't know that he's got a 10-second time penalty, but let Turka Hakkinen go. Yeah, yeah, an experienced driver like Rory will probably know if there's a penalty coming for that incident, really. Really um, should do. You know, some drivers in the adrenaline might not think about it, they might need to see a replay, but he should know. And in my opinion, I was just thinking that through Sunset Bend, it would make sense for McDuff to let Hakkinen go. But I guess the race feels kind of run now anyway. Um, but yeah, you know, McDuff will have time penalty. Pinto's probably just pitted for new softs anyway. So uh, we'll have to wait and see. I think we're on the last lap though, Lewis. So Risto Capit will be looking like taking the win, but he's not going to be taking overall glory for Predator RHE, unfortunately. And it's going to be Philip Dreis and Christine McKell looking great in second and third. Wow, Risto Capit, what a day. I mean, he's going to come out of the final corner. He's going to come across the line and the Triple Eight is going to win at Sebring. But what a deflating win it's going to be, because I don't think it's going to be enough for Predator RHG. Needracing.com come over in second and third, and Ford to, uh, with a fourth and a seventh. That should be enough. McDuff and Hakkinen in fifth and sixth for the PMK Sim Racing team. For Risto Capit, I want to go and give the man a hug. I mean, what a disappointing end to Formula Challenge. He lost the Formula Challenge series on in, in the final race, courtesy of a, a, of a fairly innocent but silly mistake. And now he loses the chance to get back into Formula Pro through no fault of his own. Absolutely. I mean, look at his results. He's come third, third and first in those three relegation races, Lewis. So three podiums out of three. When you consider you've got to pick a hard tyre, you've got reverse grids, uh, you've got all sorts of chaos going on. That is phenomenal. And then to not that to not be enough um, because of, unfortunately, some, ish, some mistakes from a teammate, whether that's fuel in the car or driving errors after good performances, absolutely gutting for him um, but you know he races for RHG it's a great organization he will have his chance yeah. to prove himself and what he's done there is he's put himself on a platform he is ready to take on Formula Pro once again and be right at the top 
Absolutely. Uh, again, uh, still, that was a super performance from Risto Capit to beat out Philip Dreis and Christian Macau as we can look at provisional results from the race. Risto Capit, Philip Dreis and Christian Macau rounding out the podium with Gianmarco Verducci. Rory McDuff, who will be given a 10-second time penalty, he'll drop behind uh, Terka Hakkinen. So Terka Hakkinen will get it moved up inside the top five. Rory McDuff uh, down to sixth position. Nuno Pinto will stay in seventh uh, for Team Fordzilla after the pit stop late on. Timotej Andonovsky with a retirement and then Ferris Stanley and Danny Kish out at the very first corner with what could only be described as quite a face palm. I think it would have been done at such a speed that it's going to lose a mark. Uh, leave a mark. Uh, Risto Capit, though, I, again, super disappointed. I'm going to hold off, by the way, because I don't, you know, guaranteeing that I think I'm, I'm pretty sure Fordzilla are going through. Needracing.com, absolutely sure. And as John was saying, what a team they're going to be uh, in Formula Pro next year should everything hold. I mean, that was great racing. We saw absolutely fantastic racing, like you say, from needracing.com and obviously Fordzilla. I just feel so, so sorry for Risto Capit. Yeah. I mean, I, what, what more could he have done? Yeah, nothing really. I no. mean, he, to pick up third, third and first in those races, given the circumstances, as I said, with the reverse grid, there's nothing more he could have done. You know, it, it came down to Andonovsky's mistakes, unfortunately. And it's, it's a shame because Andonovsky will be devastated yeah. too. Um, you know, they race for the same organisation. It's a very strong organisation. He'll bounce back. Of course, they both will. But Risto's put in so much effort throughout the season to fall just short of the championship when he arguably, you know, he, he was just as quick all season as the others and to fall short on this as well. Mm. Devastating. I don't want to highlight the major negatives, but of course, Risto Capit, when it, I know this is a team thing, but when it comes to the drivers, Risto Capit will top the points. He'll essentially himself will win relegation, yeah. but obviously won't get put through. Timotej Andonovsky will be last in all of that. So uh, we do have some Predator RHG bread on this relegation sandwich. Wow. When you put it like that, that is, you know, you've got to be a real team player to in a way be able to get over that and Risto Cabot is though yeah yeah he'll, he'll why yeah. I'm not a driver no R <laughs> Risto Risto will Maybe be not. understanding he, he's you know he's a really mature driver and um, very grateful very always very gracious in defeat or victory um, and he's got the right attitude so he will definitely yeah. bounce back and I wouldn't be surprised if we saw him in Formula Pro anyway you know RHG are there they've got a team there he's just proving himself once again that he deserves a slot on the roster of course formally racing in Formula Pro anyway um, but yeah he's, he's been doing all the right things mm. so I'm sure it'll work out fine for him and what a great story with Forzilla Again, provisional. Looks like they're going to survive. You know, we spoke to the Fordzilla team manager recently who was just so excited to be on the grid and enjoying, you know, the growing world of esports. He was looking at it in a much more long-term view. It wasn't looking good for them, Lewis. With a race to go, we were sure they were, they were set to go down. And, and look at how it's turned out for them. It's looking really good. I'm, I'm baffled, if I'm honest. I, I think <laughs> they've done an unbelievable job. I, again, we came into this, and I was completely honest at the start. I thought that this was the, the, the promotion was going to go between one of the three teams that have, have kind of joined us from Formula Challenge. I thought that was where it was going to go. Mm. I thought that the two that have dropped down from Formula Pro, they've dropped down for a reason. I know Fordzilla have a lot of speed, so does Rocket. But they've showed something very, very special here, and they've managed to potentially book their place back up into Formula Pro. I think that's a beautiful story. It really, really is um, to see them bounce back next year. Let's take a quick look at those highlights. Nuno Pinto would start from pole position alongside the racing.com car of uh, Christian Mikel. Philip Dreis uh, also alongside in there. There was drama, though, at the first corner. Not for any of our frontrunners, though. It was at the back as Rockets in Sports would eliminate themselves from the relegation race. Ferris Stanley and Danny Kish with a mistake from Ferris Stanley into T1. Rory McDuff would be into the rear end of Timotej Andonovsky and receive a 10-second time penalty and a little bit of damage as well. That would go to the rear end of Timotej Andonovsky, who uh, would struggle to keep control of the car as the race would go on. Philip Dreis was trying to take over the race lead from Nuno Pinto, who was struggling on the hard tyres. Everyone else behind uh, on the softs, all charging up to the rear end of the race lead. Risto Capit was the next one to get past a Nuno Pinto coming down into Collier with a bit of a send and up and over the curve. He wasn't able to get through on this occasion courtesy of losing the rear grip and that is what gave Philip Dreis a very comfortable lead by the time that Risto Capit got through at D1. It was a good second, second and a half that uh, Philip Dreis was leading. Christian McHale would come straight through and follow Risto Capit on that charge. A bit of a mistake from Timotej Andonovsky would remove Predator RHG Esports' chances of continuing on into Formula Pro. Risto Capit would come out of the final 
final corner after taking the race lead to take victory and to take the top of the standings, at least from the driver's side of things uh, in the relegation races. But from the team side of things, it was disappointment. And there are the driver's standings. Risto Capit on top on 132 points. Philip Dreising, Christian McHale for needracing.com in second and third. Great stuff as well from Turka Hakkinen. Just one point ahead of Nuno Pinto. Gianmarco Hiducci, fifth and sixth. Nuno, uh, sorry, Rory McDuff uh, in seventh position. Then Danny Kish, Ferris Stanley and Timotej Andonovsky with 34 points. 98 behind his teammate. And on the team side of things, this has been uh, quite a run for, uh, for needracing.com, hasn't it, John? It has indeed. You know, fully deserving of it. Delighted for them. They've put in the effort throughout the season in Formula Challenge, and they've got it together in the relegation battle. And I just want to say as well, you know, we saw Andonovsky retire after breaking his front wing. If he'd have kept on going, fixed his front wing, finished that race, maybe behind Nuno Pinto, his teammate cap at one. And, and Fiducci was down in fourth or fifth, we might well have seen them actually end up in second place. So it could come down to that decision if it was a decision in his hands. But as you can see, that's not the way it played out. And Team Fordzilla made it through. Gianmarco Fiducci and the star of the show for me a lot, in that, especially in that second race at Silverstone, Nuno Pinto picking up second place and going in alongside needracing.com. And uh, yeah, what a season of action, Lewis. What a season both in Formula Pro and Formula Challenge. It has been incredible. It's been a brilliant run, uh, like you say. It, it, it's a bit, a bit weird, though, to think that that's it. We're no. done racing for the year. That's so sad. I can't believe how it, it feels like it's just gone like that. Um, I just want to say, I agree. Nuno um, Pinto has been absolutely fantastic. He really has. And I, I'm rather excited to see Fordzilla next year and what they can accomplish and achieve. I think it's going to be very exciting for them. And they've got a very good approach to Formula Pro. They really have. And it's all about the longevity, not about the immediate win. But... Yes, that is it. Um, have you guys enjoyed the Formula Pro Series 2022? Oh, it's been an incredible run uh, to see Kevin Siggy winning the championship yeah. by just a single point over Bonner House. That was, uh, I mean, it feels like ages ago since that. We've had three like, races since then. <laughs> I mean, it's been a great season. Uh, different winners, four different winners uh, over the season. Uh, a far cry from what we had back in 2021, where Bonner House decided to win all six of them and make it almost boring. Uh, <laughs> it was a great season. Absolutely loved it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look at it, last season it was complete domination from one driver. This season, we go into the last race, seven different drivers can win the championship. It, ridiculous. And drivers are even saying that, you know, it's too close. It needs to be, you know, split more than that. So uh, it's been absolutely awesome, Rachel. I have loved covering it. I'm delighted to be on, on comms for that. And uh, yeah, just hope, looking forward to what we've got next season as well. Yeah. Totally agree. Uh, but we've got a little bit of a surprise. Uh, Needracing.com's Philip Dreis is on the uh, on the line. Congratulations. How are you? Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, great. Uh, feels great. Yeah. I mean, it's been a very challenging three different heats. But that final heat uh, for double points that was that was pretty dramatic. I mean, how did you keep your your cool, your calm? Well, yeah, we try to manage it as best as possible. Um, I think we went, we were a bit lucky with the start in the first two laps. Um, at the point, we, um, I could pass um, Pinto, I think, on hearts. So he has uh, like a hard shop on hearts on the front. Um, yeah, it was basically perfect for us. Uh, we had no pressure. And uh, when Carpet came pushing, uh, we just decided, yeah, let's let, let him pass and uh, yeah, take the points. And how does it feel to be part of Formula Pro next year? It's absolutely awesome. I definitely wasn't expecting that going into the Formula Challenge season. And now it's the uh, yeah, best possible outcome, I guess. <laughs> I was about to say it's a brilliant way to have the season. It's crazy that it's only August. But <laughs> what an amazing way to see in your, your summertime, knowing already that you're going to be part of Formula Pro next year. Absolutely. And it's also awesome. Like Christian just joined us into the team. And now we were like, that successful in the relegation races. It's yeah, it's looking good for us right now. See, that's very true. You two clearly race very well together. How long yeah. have you been racing together for? Yeah, we, we managed or we started actually with the Formula Challenge season and oh, wow. yeah, decided in the end to, to merge teams, basically. Yeah. Well, that's brilliant. Well, look, um, congratulations. It's brilliant. And I also love to see that you are clearly very happy. And it's excellent Absolutely. to see. Um, what a, a long three heats. You did fantastic. <laughs> Need racing. We can't wait to see next year in the Formula Pro. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. 
Wow, I loved his smile. <laughs> that was brilliant happy. to see. Yeah, really happy. And, you know, I think as well, we forget kind of how much this does mean to to these racers and to be part of like, the Formula Pro next year. It's it's a great way to begin your summer break, I'm assuming. If they have a break, probably not. Uh, that's not what happens in sim racing, unfortunately. No. It's always what's the uh, head, what's does. the next championship to, uh, to take on. Obviously, sometimes you do need to take a little bit of a break yeah. and a breather yourselves. But, I mean... It's it's great for them to already book their place into uh, into Formula Pro and uh, into a championship which you know based on this season we had a, a great prize pool and now you get to be a part of it. How cool is that? Absolutely, and it's all there for the taking. You know they, those guys clearly know how to work well together. They can develop good setups and they've got the race experience and challenge. Why can't they go on and do well in Formula Pro? There's no pressure on them. They just need to go out there, have a bit of fun. We have seen new teams come in and struggle a little bit to be right at the top of the pace because it's so competitive. But there's no reason why those guys can't do well. And I am very much looking forward to seeing how they get on next season i mean they did pretty well with the pressure that was on them today because there was pressure as much as they say you know oh i don't i didn't feel that that in the third race there was and they did great so i've got a lot of hope for them for next year but i think that's it i think that's all we've got got time for you guys have been brilliant i don't know how you chat for so long although lewis your math skills is pretty appalling um, i'm embarrassed for you we all are uh, but both of you thank you so much uh, for making me feel very welcome. And you guys, thank you so much for watching us here for the Formula Pro Series 2022. Formula Pro Series will be back, obviously, next year in 2023. Uh, so have a wonderful evening. Thank you again, and we'll see you very soon.